Shoemaker had uh, mentioned to Dave that he may not be here today. Uh, he may still show up. We'll see. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure else is. Hopefully, we've got a fairly full day in front of you. As as you saw from the information from Dave, we've got it cut into a couple of different pieces. It's unfortunate that uh, Bob Knight was not able to uh, join us. He had it all set up and everything else until they had a uh, family health emergency that has <coughs> been going. So uh, we do have Paul Lewis coming in this afternoon on as short a time frame as we could put him to uh, do some facilitation and mediation of uh, the second part of the session. So we'll, uh, we'll welcome him when he gets here and we'll move from there. I'll apologize to everybody ahead of time, both staff and to uh, Council, I've got a uh, herniated disc in my back that has oh. never healed itself from last summer, and seven hours on a plane yesterday has pretty much inflamed it. So at times today, I may get up, move around, and do something, or sit other places and come back. It's not no, no disrespect for anybody who may be presenting at the moment, but it's, I'm going to move. Uh, Dave, do you want to take us through any opening comments? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Hopefully you've all had a chance to take a peek at the agenda um, that's in the packet. Um, but we're going to go through um, a number of different uh, activities this morning. I'm going to pull up the Here we go. So we'll um, first thing that we'll do is really a refresher and kind of um, it's actually pretty educational for me, and I hope it will be for you. Uh, go over some procedural motion highlights, just kind of a refresher on some different things in Robert's rules. Um, and Ann McFarland, who's with uh, Jurassic Parliament, was very gracious, just for, for no cost, uh, gave me a little bit of email type consult on this, so I was really appreciative of that. Um, there's some resources in the packet that she actually provided that will be for your reference. After we do that, um, our department heads will uh, give us updates, uh, which uh, you all indicated was one of the highlights for you at, the, at these sessions, to get the, get the uh, updates on the work plans and things that are happening, give you a chance to ask questions about those things, just so that you have a feel for everything that's going on um, as we uh, work hard this year. We have a break scheduled in there. Uh, we can kind of play that by ear, see how that goes. Continue with those updates. Uh, then we'll have some lunch. Uh, we have a short lunch, just a quick uh, lunch so that we can get nourished. And then we'll come back and Jen will give us the year-end uh, closure report for 2014. Let us know how we did compared to what we budgeted, uh, compared to how we've done in the prior year. And then also uh, give us an updated financial projection, our long-term projection, I think goes out to 2020 this year. Uh, and then we have a session that Paul will facilitate. Uh, we're calling it Strategic Initiative Prioritization. Um, and he will go through that when he's here. I won't get into a lot of the details, but uh, the goal of that is hopefully to get um, some good interaction uh, amongst the council uh, and some prioritization across competing goals uh, in a constrained resource environment will just be helpful for the whole team as we look at different things. Uh, and then that's it. If we have any public at that time, we'll, uh, we'd like to hear from them, any comments they have about the session, and then we'll wrap it up. We're scheduled to go through four. Um, you know, we play that by ear as we move through the day. Uh, I want to thank Rose for setting everything up. Um, this is, uh, you know, we're experimenting, trying it in here today, even though this is our familiar territory. Uh, hopefully this will be comfortable and we'll see how it goes um, in terms of the venue. Uh, and to all the team members here for working hard to get this information together for you guys. So with that, um, we can jump into uh, this educational piece. And I have everything that we need up on the screen so that we can walk through it that way. Dave, before you get there, uh Everybody should feel uh, free. There are certainly food beverages across the way in the break room. Um, is a need to certainly wander out that way. One of the things that I asked Rose to do was to make sure that we didn't have a buffet set up here in the council chambers themselves. But you're welcome to bring stuff back and forth. But it's all located over there and all set out.
So the, um, this isn't a, an entire Roberts Rules 101, but the topics we're going to look at actually on a handout that's in your packet that you can have for your reference later, she calls it uh, Intermediate Jurassic Parliament. So uh, these are a little bit um, uh, not the routine things. However, from time to time, the council has um, worked through uh, these sorts of procedural motions. One is um, that I actually added in here, it, it won't take long to get through, and that's when uh, there's been maybe lengthy deliberation and someone um, in the group is wanting to get a vote going. Um, there's a real common misconception that I had not been aware of that I even had, so we'll get to that. Another one is uh, when something's on the table, uh, there's a motion, and uh, there's an idea or a thought from part of the council or a majority of the council to uh, delay consideration of that motion before even voting. You could call it kill the motion or delay consideration. So there's some uh, nuances with that that I think are important. And then what happens when something's already been voted on or it was delayed uh, by one of the mechanisms above there? How does that come back? And I think we've, we've had some challenges with that and, and a little bit of struggle with that. There's some nuances with that that are important to review. Um, so the first one, real quickly to get through this, uh, there's deliberation going on and somebody wants to force a vote. And for like my entire professional career, my understanding has been someone says, almost just right wherever they're at, right? You don't need to be recognized. Uh, you know, you sort of politely wait for a pause in the conversation and go, I call the question. And all de it's, and that's it. Debate stops. It's not debatable. It's not amendable. And boom, uh, you vote on the question on the table. Well, the fact is, in Roberts, that is not the case. Um, it is, a, it, it is uh, a significant thing to limit debate. And in fact, Roberts requires, and our rules do not say otherwise, Roberts requires a two-thirds vote to stop the debate. So uh, we have not, this has only come up a couple times. It, it rarely comes up. But I saw this on our chart. I thought I'd bring it up just as a good reminder for us. The effect of that motion to call for the question is that it requires immediate, an immediate vote at whatever's on the table. It does require a second. It is not debatable. It's not amendable, and it requires a two-thirds vote. I just threw that little text up there. I'm not going to go through it, but I thought it was a nice narrative because it basically reassures all of us, all of us that we've just been under the same misconception that just about everyone in the world is, apparently, that you just call the question and, and off you go. So just something to keep in mind if um, you're thinking well, you want to debate. I do that. I think I have done it. On, uh, it's, I, it's, I removed the previous question is what the traditional way to refer right. the, to do that. I've known that since I was in the student senate in college. Right. <laughs> and then look for a second. I didn't put it in here, but it could also be by unanimous consent. This one particularly can be. So if somebody, if somebody um, does that or the chair does that and nobody objects, it, you, know, you don't have to vote and see the two thirds because I guess unanimous consent. Is well, when there's no further, further discussion, you just proceed to a vote. Right. So anyway, pretty simple and straightforward, uh, but I was a little bit surprised just based on my previous understanding. Uh, so to get into um, this <coughs> category, which is to delay consideration or to kill a motion before voting, there's three ways to do it. These are the very specific ways. <coughs> one is to postpone it to a certain time. The other one is to table it. And the, and the third is to postpone indefinitely, and they are all distinct and unique. This one is um, very straightforward, postpone to a certain time. The effect of this motion is it just delays consideration to something very specific in the future. You've done this uh, fairly, reg not regularly, but pretty often when you want to give some additional time. It uh, needs a second. It can be debated. Talk about, well, what day will it be that we... Uh, do it. It's amendable, so if you want to change the date, you don't have to withdraw your motion, you can change the date, and it just requires a majority vote. Very straightforward, but it is one way to delay consideration, uh, to a, and that goes to a specific time. Now here's one where um, this was very helpful for me. Uh, we used this, 
this term table a lot. I want to table the item. It means something very, very specific. So the effect of a motion to table is that it temporarily delays consideration of a motion. And the, the definition of temporarily in this case is that it must be taken from the table. And in the next category, I'll talk about how you take something from the table. It must be taken from the table at the same meeting or at the next meeting. If not, the motion dies. However, you need to understand that if it dies because it's not taken from the table that night or at the next meeting, then just come up again at a future meeting subsequent to those, and it's just like it's a brand new motion. So it's a temporary, unspecific delay. Uh, to table something requires a second. It's not debatable, not amendable and uh, it requires just a majority vote. So once that motion is made, you vote on it right away, knowing that it's only temporary. There's some great literature um, on her website that talks about when you should really use this or not, and they assert that it's really not when you want to kill something before it's voted. It's really more for, you know, something else is pressing and we need to just kind of wait, but we don't really know how long we need to wait. And that's why you see that language about um, that meeting or the next meeting is when you pull it back. However, it's not out of order if your intent is to stop something from being voted on. It is not out of order to make this motion, but it's not apparently not the spirit of it. So that's what tabling does. There's another one. It's called postpone indefinitely. This one kills the motion for the current meeting. That's the limit of its effect. So you're done with that for the night. It can't be brought back, postponed indefinitely. So unlike tabling, where you could, it could be brought up that night, uh, it's just killed for that meeting. It, but you can just bring that motion up at a future meeting just like it's new. To do this requires a second. It is debatable in this case, uh, but it's not amendable and it just requires a majority. So keep those in mind, the distinction between tabling and postponing indefinitely. And uh, this, this um, in your packet, I'll just show you, this handout is in there. It's a nice chart. You don't need to look at it today, but it's in your packet, and, and it's a guide that we can all use to help us with that. Um, so that's postpone indefinitely. So those are the three ways to stop something from happening on a particular motion. Um, now, this one has come up from time to time, and uh, we've been a little bit challenged on this. So how do you get something back if it was already voted on or delayed? There's three ways to do that. One is to take it from the table, and that correlates directly to when you tabled it. There's another one called reconsider. And then there's another one, which is actually two, but it's grouped together in Roberts, and it's to rescind or amend something that was previously considered. So we'll go over those. To take something from the table, its effect, as you can imagine, is simply to bring a tabled item back up. So remember, the tabled item is tabled for the same meeting in the next meeting. So this is only in order if the motion was specifically tabled. And it's only relevant at the same or the next meeting. It does require a second. And this one, like the tabling motion, is not debatable or amendable. And it just requires a simple majority to do it. So if somebody uh, wants to table an item uh, and, you ha and you didn't get to it during um, uh, amendments to the agenda, and it's a simple thing, you just want to move something around, I guess procedurally and formally, this is a way to do it. I move to table it, it gets tabled, and then later on you move to bring it back up. Maybe there's more members there, whatever it was that you were thinking in terms of doing that. But it was going to happen, you know, the same night or the next meeting. So that's the taking from the table. Uh, reconsidering something, its effect is to bring back something that's already been decided, and it, it's something that can be done. Uh, Roberts requires that it be made by someone who voted in the majority. So it's a serious thing to bring back for reconsideration something that you've already decided. So someone who voted in the majority has to bring it back. 
Roberts also says that it has to, it can't happen whenever, it has to happen fairly timely. So it must be brought up at the same meeting under Roberts. Your rules allow it to be brought up at the next meeting. So um, pretty constrained in terms of who can move it and when that motion can be made. It does require a second and interestingly the motion to reconsider is is debatable and if the motion you're wanting to re if the action that you're reconsidering was debatable so if it was a substantive motion on a resolution or something like that uh, you could debate whether or not to reconsider it and in fact your debate on whether to reconsider can get into the merits of the underlying action as part of your discussion about why to reconsider it or not, but you'd have to do two. It's not amendable, and it's just a majority. Uh, you'd do two things. I didn't put that here, but first vote would be, yeah, we're going to reconsider it, and then, then it's back. It's just back like it was fresh again, and it's up for reconsideration. And just as a note, under Roberts, um, a motion that is defeated may ordinarily be introduced again at a future meeting or session. So if you really want to, if you had a motion, I uh, got a second, got debated, and it didn't pass, and you want to try again, you can do that. It doesn't, you don't, you're not constrained from never doing it again. So reconsider really seems to be more effective in a, a situation where there was an affirmative action of some kind taken. Now, I would, I would suggest that at some point a defeated motion, unless there's new facts or something, you know, it's kind of like beating your head on the wall at some point. But If something has been passed, can you reconsider that? Yes. A motion has been passed? A motion in has In the been affirmative, it can be. Yes. So I'll just pick an example out of the blue, a recent example, the oil train resolution. Just for example, you pass the oil train resolution. Um, if you voted for that oil train resolution and then for whatever reason had a change of mind or maybe had a change of mind at that meeting or at the next meeting you could move to reconsider okay now using that same scenario I was not at that meeting does that mean I don't have a reconsideration on it you were not you would not be someone who could make the motion because Are you, you sure about that I, I, don't, I, I Roberts I, Robert says you must have voted in the majority and if you were not there you did not vote yeah but <clears throat> it might change the actual um, you know <clears throat> if someone was absent and their vote might have been decisive it seems to me that it kind of defeats the purpose of reconsideration. And that's if, you know, we have a different makeup of the body, the will of the body. I don't know. Maybe that's something we got to consider for our specific. Yeah. It's my understanding. Goals. It's my understanding you had to have voted in the majority in order, because this is one that um, in the narratives around all this stuff is not to be taken lightly, you know, reconsidering your action. And uh, you have to have voted in the majority. But you could change it. Jennifer? Yeah, um, I would say that in this situation, probably a motion to c repeal or rescind, rescind. rescind a motion or a, uh, a resolution would probably be. And that's on the next slide when we get to that, and that's a good point. If if you have no standing for a reconsideration, then there may be something else you can do. I would like to just make clear, I would have voted for the resolution had I been here. I, I would, so that was right. not. I just, I just threw that one up I as know. an example. I, but I wanted to make it clear I, that I, I, I knew supported. you would have, Joyce. Huh? <laughs> I knew you would have. Okay. <laughs> Your point's well taken, though, in, in light of healthy discussions and appropriate uh, deliberations by the entire body. I'm certainly on things that have weight to them as well. Michelle? So a month, a month later, it's not the meeting after or two months later, can that, can oil trains be brought up again? Not under reconsideration. Not as a reconsideration. So is what rule would allow you to address it again, I guess? Rescind. Rescind, Rescind. or amend something okay. previously considered, which okay. is the next slide. Next slide. So, okay. so um, maybe it's a good time uh, <coughs> to turn to that one. Just the last comment is, just kind of imagine in your mind, 
you're at the meeting where the action was taking, taken, it's active on the table and you're debating it. If this motion passes to reconsider it, you're right back at that moment, just doing it again, mm -hmm. as if you had never taken your action. And that's probably why the rule is that way, because it's the same group of people normally at the meeting, although people could leave and things like that or, or arrive. Right. Um, that's probably why the way it is, because it contemplates it's the same group of people. There's no change in the makeup of the people making the decision, whereas our rules allow um, the following meeting, we can do a reconsideration. Right. Right. And some of the, some of the nuances that small groups like this, because these rules uh, apply to <coughs> seven member bodies, seven voters, uh, to thousands of voters in large societies and associations. Well, there actually is a, there actually is a provision of Roberts that says that you can, adult, you can do things informally in small groups. You don't need to go through all this, right. which I love to use. Well, I was thinking no matter, in no matter what situation as the legislative body, you wouldn't want to necessarily, uh, Roberts regardless, paint yourself into a corner to where you can't go back the next meeting, seven meetings later, two years later, if new information comes to light that basically says, gosh, had we known that, we wouldn't have done that, that's so bad, right. and not have a mechanism to be able to rescind or at least discuss and pre-debate what your action was previously. Right. And one thing to keep in mind as well, and there's just the one more slide to go over on this topic um, before we move to the next one, is no one is telling you that you have to follow Roberts except yourselves. You've said so in your rules, and your rules say that you can set, suspend your rules. So if, we're, if something needs to happen procedurally and we just can't find a way in Roberts to make it happen, uh, you can lay aside your rules for the moment and say, hey, we're going to allow this to take place. And if a majority of you are comfortable with that, you can do that. So there's always a way to, to do something. Doesn't suspend take two-thirds? Um, uh, I don't believe so. Not in your rules. It doesn't say that. So to get to the, the other question, so what could we do? So rescinding or amending something previously considered uh, it has the effect of making a previous action null, it's getting rid of it, that would be the rescind part of this one, or changing it, doing something different, like adding, adding something to an oil train resolution, for example, or taking something out. Anybody can move this. So if you were absent, this is where you could go. You could make this motion. It does require a second. And like the previous one, it's debatable and amendable. Now, what's interesting here is, um, and this gets nuanced, um, it requires a majority vote to do it if there was notice. And what notice is, and I get into all that here, it means at the prior meeting that somebody said, next meeting, I'm going to make a motion to rescind or amend the such and such that we did. So people know about it, and they have a chance to make sure they're here so they can be part of this vote. And in that case, it's only a majority. But if no such notice is given, it requires a two-thirds vote. Or a majority of the entire membership. This was written more with large groups in mind, I think. So if you think about it for yourselves, um, when, you're, when you're generally all here, um, a majority of your entire membership is four votes. So the bottom line is, at any time, if you want to rescind or amend something previously considered, four of you can do that, and anyone can make the motion. But you'd have to have four of you to vote affirmatively for the rescission or the amendment. Uh, if you have less folks here than it would, and there was no notice, it would be two-thirds of those gathered. So today, for example, it would be four as well, just four-sixths of you. So anyway, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, our commitment is that as a staff, um, we'll make sure we always have this available, <clears throat> excuse me, so that, because I'll probably not remember this myself precisely, and we'll just have these uh, tools available for us. And that is it for um, Roberts. Any other questions on that? So, riveting. <laughs> Thank you. All right, jump right into the Public Works Department update uh, work plans and initiatives starting on the
capital side or the engineering side, we do have multiple projects within the water utility. First and foremost is the siting of a reservoir within zone three, which feeds the northwestern portion of the city, specifically the Woodburn Hill, uh, Lookout Ridge, Granite Highlands area. Uh, we continue negotiations with property owner in that specific area for siting a reservoir as well as a couple of booster stations. Uh, really the, the emphasis and uh, crux of that project is redundancy. Right now we have one reservoir and one transmission main uh, that feeds that whole west side of the city. And so um, the intent of creating a second reservoir siting and booster stations uh, is to be able to not have interrupted service since we have had interrupted service up there a couple times since it's come into the grid. We're also working on some seismic analysis, specifically Reservoir 1A and B. Those are the oldest reservoirs within our uh, infrastructure. Those are just north of the cemetery um, and south of W Street on 32nd. So we're looking at the footings and um, anchoring bolts and everything, uh, specifically at 1A and 1B. Um, that's really the hub to our water system, uh, especially on the east side. Um, we store close to two and a half million gallons of water there before it's boosted and uh, transmitted across the uh, distribution system. So we'll be doing that analysis and at the same time um, doing some paint repair on the exterior of both of those facilities. Excuse me, where are those again? Reservoir 1A and B on 32nd Street, uh, north of the cemetery, between R and W Street on the east side. Those are late 70s and early 80s construction uh, welded steel. So we have some uh, retrofitting that we need to do there specifically for seismic. Last, yeah. The old one, that new? Yeah. I had conversations with Magna Vista. Uh, LLC water system, small private system in the northeastern portion of the city. Um, I think I'll just point out real quick. Uh, right up in this area, there's a travel up 49th Street before we get into city limits. Right in this specific area is a private water system within our water service area. I reached out to them last summer, did a formal presentation before their board, uh, just gaining uh, interest um, in looking at the feasibility of bringing that system within the public water system. Uh, there is a grant opportunity through the Department of Health, uh, specifically with small private water systems to be able to be incorporated into Class A systems. Department of Health is fairly bullish on that, uh, just to be able to reduce the amount of satellite systems, specifically in Clark County. Do they have to adhere to the same standards that we do <coughs> as a city? Do those little water systems have to have the same standards? There's different tiers depending on how many connections they have. Okay. I'm not certain exactly how many connections they have, but there's class A, class B, okay. and then uh, even smaller systems okay. th throughout that are uh, administered by the county. Okay. They're administered by the county then? Right now, yes. They certainly aren't done to the degree that ours are. We test on a daily basis. Yeah, exactly. They certainly are testing on a daily basis. Yeah, I think they have one wellhead that's uh, fairly high production for the amount of services that they have, but it's not a complex public water system as ours is. Trevor, remind us how many residences are on that service? I think Magna Vista has 30 to 35 service connections. And if we ever, and maybe this is too early in the process, if we ever figured out what the uh, ultimate build out of that area would be if all of the properties up there were You've got some large properties that they were Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of vacant land as far as infill up in that specific area. So prior to the transmission improvements uh, and bringing pressure zone number four to the east side across Camp and Creek, we, we were unable to serve that area. That went into service about a year and a half ago. So we have the appropriate pressure in that specific area, not only for potable use, but for fire flow as well. But at some point that could put a significant relatively significant number of new users onto the system all at one time. Yes. 
Yeah, we've never really looked at done um, that kind of calculation. There may be some stuff at through the vacant buildable lands model that we uh, could look at. There's some some environmental constraints up there as well, so it's not as yeah, it's not as easy just to look at it and say it's X acres and then you get this. So, but we we could we could definitely look at that and see what you know what the possibility would be. But again, any of those developments would be connecting into our any of those new developments would be automatically required to connect into our system. Councilman, I want to be in the discussion that obviously as you add more users to the system, it creates another stabilization of the rates and the more people we're selling the water to, mm -hmm. the better the rate system can become for everybody. So. Any other questions on Magna Vista or the northeastern portion of the public water system? Okay. J Street water line, we had a few touches on this in uh, 2014. It was really a hybrid approach to package up the specific project before CDBG and Clark County. Uh, we were originally successful in securing CDBG funds for the surface improvements, the sidewalk improvements. Um, since then, the census tracts have been released and this specific area was not eligible when we were notified that uh, we were not eligible, we did a face-to-face -face survey and walked the whole corridor uh, trying to engage with as many owners, tenants, whatever it may be uh, for that specific area. Uh, we were not able to meet the HUD requirements uh, as far as the um, salary, if you will, or compensation for uh, families or households in that specific area. And so we are looking at alternatives. Uh, you'll see in the parentheses there, we, we will be discussing that this afternoon in regards to um, capital improvements and specifically sidewalks. Uh, we are planning on moving forward with the engineering, the design engineering for the water line improvements along that specific corridor from 32nd to 34th, which also includes uh, fire flow as well, since there's no hydrants on that, that two block stretch currently. Wastewater treatment plant. Sladen is moving right along. Um, they've been very fortunate, and so have we, with the mild winter and light spring uh, thus far. They've gotten quite a bit of the excavation work taken care of. Uh, part of lagoon number one filled with engineered backfill where the decant facility will be constructed. They fully excavated for the oxidation ditch, um, which is a two, mi two million gallon uh, concrete structure, if you will. So they're moving right along on schedule. We have weekly meetings with uh, not only the general on the job, Sladen Construction Group from the state in Oregon, but also with Brown and Caldwell with the construction management uh, piece and uh, working with them closely. So it's, it's going quite well. Today, uh, we have had some minor revisions uh, with bringing in um, supernatant, if you will, infiltration inflow from the lagoons to be able to treat that water as they moved quite a bit of soil. But uh, we're on the back side of that now and the treatment process is going quite well. We recently had a request for proposals to update our general sewer plan, start that process in 2015 and uh, project closure hopefully in uh, spring, summer of 2016. We had five firms um, submit for consideration uh, we met as a uh, public works team, reviewed each proposal. Uh, we do have a preferred consultant at this time um, that we're reaching out to. Uh, Wallace Engineering came in as a preferred consultant. The four others were very competitive. We had a pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, review team uh, in looking at that general sewer plan proposal. And so we're looking to uh, negotiate a contract with them over the next several weeks. Parks, the Columbia River Trail project, design and permitting. Design would be in this calendar year and construction uh, within a 24 month window. We're still chasing that project. Um, I've had conversations with the port and met with them uh, in regards to their waterfront project, as well as the other holdings that they have on South A Street, trying to coordinate uh, timing wise and construction to be able to, to construct that specific project. Uh, ultimately having connectivity from Steamboat Landing uh, all the way to the, the waterfront or to the marina uh, at the port. 
So this is the piece of the project from Steamboat Landing to South A Street? Yes, and there's some private holdings along there. Right. A couple of those parcels, I believe, are up for sale currently. And so we're, uh, we're still working that. Um, I know our preliminary <coughs> estimates are pretty high, just having core review and being within the um, review as far as the floodway. And so we're looking at different ways to frame that, but it does look like a significant chunk to be able to accomplish that trail connectivity from South A to, to Steamboat Landing. Just are, to build it. Just to build it. Are there grants available for this? Yes, we'll be chasing those grants both locally and federally. That was the same level. question I had. Uh, so the port's not paying for this uh, then? It's not port property. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, so Steamboat Landing's right here. So the port's doing all of the waterfront improvements along their, their current holdings up into the transition to South A and then from South A Street to get to Steamboat Landing. There's a small stretch in here. No. It's about a mile, right mile away. and a half. Is that a mile, mile and a half? Is that part of the trail? Um, about, our portion of the trail is much shorter than that. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. It's within a couple, three hundred yards, I believe. Oh, okay. For connectivity. No, that's it all. Good. Yeah. yeah. Is the um is part of well part of the trail have to be elevated? Or because it's just kind of a steep drop. It seems like on the side of Highway 14. There's a lot of riprap down there. At some point, there was some discussion on the first walkthroughs that it may be something where there may have to be some piles put in there or a boardwalk or something of that yeah. type just because of the topography that's there mm -hmm. and what DNR may allow you to do or not do along the shoreline. But, and that's that's really the chunk we're talking about. The, the biggest portion of what we would be responsible for, if you will, to put the whole thing together because it's on public streets uh, would be on South A or on A Street itself. Um, it's just figuring out it's dollars. Yeah. You know, there may be some easements we need to purchase alongside there, and it'd be, as Dave has mentioned before, it'd be similar to uh, where you park in the, the area down there around beaches and where it comes back to a city street and goes down and then comes back to the water. It'd be similar to that. The area becomes uh, interesting. Is it Mr. Is it Holt? This gentleman that's the last property owner there that's had the contentions going with the Schmidt family. Hines, I Hines. 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 From Mr. Hines' property to where Steamboat is itself, just because of what's there and the riprap and the topography, and it's just difficult. And when you have to make it to ADA standards, it's yes. more difficult. All, right. All weather service. And Paul, did you have a question? Um, mostly that. What I, I thought it was going to have to be cantilevered out over the bank. <clears throat> no. um, so, would this be considered? A uh, trail part of our park system or a sidewalk? Park system. Well, both. It's trail. Both. Yeah, yeah, both. Kind of both. Yeah. Okay. Parts of I was park. just trying to figure out where the money would might come from. Which which pile? <laughs> <laughs> Could be multi pile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, can the money come from the parks? Because the parks do have they have money there. You can build trails with PIF if the trail's on your facilities plan, and you can build uh, PED facilities with TIF if the PED facility, pedestrian facility, is on your transportation plan. I believe that that's, yeah. yep. So I think both of those funding sources would be appropriate as well as just any general fund <coughs> grants. And that section is on both of those, correct? The, definitely on the parks trail system, I'm not sure on in the transportation part. I know that we had some discussion about it late in the game and then when, um, because we, it, when we were updating the transportation plan, uh, but then because we have to update it again at the end of the year, we said, all right, that's something that we're going to put in place and make sure we get it on there. So okay. I, I don't think it's there now on the transportation side. But you've got a marker in there. So yes. Right. Okay. Paul? Would you build a trail strong enough that you could move a police car down it if you needed to no. or Just an ambulance or anything like that bike pad mm -hmm. be wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be vehicular access short of being able to get down there for maintenance with like a, a quad or gator or something like that right. but it'd be, it'd it'd be faster access down there with <coughs> if we needed to i'm sorry 
you're thinking about getting an ambulance down there faster than going down to where the turnaround is for the roundabouts and coming back? No, I wasn't thinking of that so much as, as that it just made sense to me that you would have I mean, for instance, when we talked about running a pedestrian bridge across the Washuga River in order to carry a, a sewer line, part of the plan was to make it strong enough that you could run a police car over it so that you could patrol that or respond to an emergency as necessary. We didn't end up building that bridge but and, and went through the river instead of over it. But uh, it, it just struck me that given the relative isolation of some of that, um, how do you get an ambulance there? Down off of A Street or off of the uh, off of the steamboat side itself and access on foot. I don't think we're ever going to go through and find enough money to overbuild that enough in order to do that. We also have quads at the police department that can access those while a patrol car can. We've got bicycles that can access it, but a patrol car can. I think you're going to be, I think we will find ourselves somewhat constrained uh, with what the Department of Transportation will allow us to do next to the highway and what DNR will allow you to do on the shoreline as well. I think if you go into that side, that just pushes it into the millions of dollars. The only thing that I was going to say is that the development agreement that we have with the Schmids only gives us a, a, a certain amount of property and it meanders. It's, it's stated that it would meander through those trees that are there. So, I mean, there's a physical constraint as well that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. sure. Is there a ballpark figure not including acquisitions or even either or? The in speaking with our city engineer, I know the initial estimate, which was very high level, was north of a million dollars. How much? North of a million. <clears throat> one and, to one point two. And only a tiny fraction of that is the acquisition costs. Tiny fraction. All the rest of it's construction, design and construction. And so for this afternoon in the session, there's a parks thing up there, and I put one and a half to two. <clears throat> Even though Rob has said about <coughs> one and a half or one point two. Just that project just makes me see dollar signs because it's going to be tricky with the waterfront stuff and what they're going to let us do or not do. It's going to be tricky. And the only thing that I, I guess I'll say in, in, in working with the port and that group of citizens that are involved with the port, uh, as that trail gets moving forward on the port side, I see a lot of those folks coming to our door to, you know, want to push that that, that project forward. So I think that will really start heating up. The town's trails folks will also yes. be involved. Yeah, and they are and involved so the that side. Gorge. You've got a lot of, I guess, to what to us would be non-traditional uh, partners that will likely come into play to try and see that done. It's a big project, though, for a very, very short distance. It's going to be named, are there some discussion about this, but the Washougal Riverfront Trail, is that river? Washougal Waterfront Trail is yeah. what, yeah, and, and you've seen, yeah, that's the, there, there's some debate going on online about that right now, but. Really? I don't think we've had any <laughs> formal discussions at all about any name to anything out there, so. I think that on the port side, the port portion of it is what is, they're naming it right now. What do they want to name it? Washougal Waterfront Trail. That's what, but they, you said there's debate, is there, what are the other suggestions? Oh, uh, well, there was just debate about, um, from other residents on the, because it's the port of Camas, Washougal, so maybe there should be a name that is inclusionary oh. with that. Of Camas, oh, and, okay. Uh, <coughs> Washougal comes first. Why don't you name it Steve or Bob or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> so, there, uh, it will be an item of discussion at the ports meeting on Tuesday. Um, I've heard at the parks meeting and at the council meetings talk about the ADA accessibility to steamboat landing, and I, I think like three hundred thousand was mentioned at one of those. Is that money in competition with this bike path? It, it is. So that all of those monies, no matter where you have them, in those buckets are in competition with themselves. Okay. 
And, and I think that's part of what the discussion will be today as you begin to talk about those, prioritize those at least for the time being, not knowing where dollars are going to come from the other side. And then is it an accurate statement to say that that was grandfathered, but we're, I've been told that it's, it's becoming that we need to make a decision on that or do something about that, or can that get pushed out? The, You're talking uh, about the compliance, the regulatory compliance. Yeah. yeah. So Title IX of the ADA requires that uh, communities make all of their facilities accessible to the disabled, and it requires a transition plan. And so it doesn't give you a drop dead date by which you must be accessible, but you have to have a plan. And that then becomes the ADA is enforceable through litigation, third party litigation. Mm -hmm. It's they don't have like inspectors that go out and cite you like we would. So if somebody sues us because we're not accessible, an affirmative defense is that we have a transition plan that's got some grounding in reality in terms of timing and funding. So that requirement went into effect. I think Bush 1 signed that. So, you know, we're getting 25 years into it. So we, we need to do it. There's, there's a cottage industry of private practice lawyers that make their living get collecting attorney's fees in litigation on the ADA. And so that's, that's, how the, that's how it gets enforced, basically. Right. Now, I can tell you after spending the last two days in D.C., pushing wheelchair all over that city that we're not behind a whole lot of other folks out there that have a whole lot more money than us that aren't even coming close to complying to it. And, and that access again was just to the do, uh, to the to the lookout. Just to the, old, the observation. Yeah, the observation deck. Yeah. And uh, can I ask a question? <laughs> what was that determined that it was that that was in compliance with ADA and then therefore we didn't need to? No, we need to bring it into compliance. We, but need, we don't have the dollars yet to do that it. That was okay. Thanks. And so, could you do a ten-year plan where every year you're socking away a certain amount of money for I think it, you can or do anything that you see fit to do as long as it passes a reasonable test, really? I don't know you, you can't where just, we'd be at with our plan. We have a transition plan. Yeah. You, bottom line is, you can't ignore it. Yeah. And. That one is property that we already have with facilities that we already have that is out of compliance versus this, mm -hmm. that would be a whole nother new thing. Um, certainly if we build it, you build it to compliance, but you, it wouldn't be unreasonable for you to have folks in the community saying, hey, what are you doing building new stuff when you haven't even fixed the other stuff that we can't get to? Those debates you can have all around town. They can be packaged as well as far as construction of the trail and bringing that facility up to ADA requirements. Those, uh, Dave and Trevor, remind me though, on that type of a project would not have any ranking at all with conservation futures because it's not buying land to preserve it or anything else. It would actually be building a trail. That wouldn't qualify under the county's conservation futures place, would it? I haven't asked that specific question, but I mean, intuitively, it seems to not fit the mission, but it's possible that Parks it could. Open space. Right. The, the mission of those funds is to grab stuff and conserve it, not necessarily develop it. But we could find, we could ask, there may be a way to do it. Because there's some acquisition that's part of that. Yeah. And we did vet it with block grant staff, and it was deemed ineligible. Ineligible. Ineligible for CDBG. Right. Right. Not, we didn't have the conversation with conservation yeah. managers which was challenging for us to get that because uh, generally speaking, for example, when we did the uh, accessibility improvements here in City Hall and at the community center, we were eligible for CDBG because uh, that constituency is universally eligible, notwithstanding income, as seniors are as well. So we were a little confused but about why this one was ineligible, but Pete really knows his stuff, so it's not for whatever reason. That part of the trail, I think, is important to downtown Washougal because the whole impact of the trail coming in and connecting our downtown with what's happening out of the port is important. It's important to our core city. So I think that's a strong consideration for us. Yeah, for the right things moving forward on tourism, it's integral. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
other questions for Trevor on that piece of ground and that part of the project? Starting the process for conceptual design for Schmid. Uh, we have not secured that parcel yet. Uh, in looking at the purchase and sales, the no further action has not been delivered. I know that they have been doing some exploratory on site as far as the uh, mitigation plan. So we have conversations with the limited partnership regularly but it has not been fully delivered but we are ready to start conceptual design when the parcel secured so we are moving forward with that and just so council knows you'll likely see here sooner than later an extension coming forward on that sale agreement just because they haven't been able to receive that yet the department of uh, ecology yeah. so it's not something we want to stop the process everybody's still fully uh, fully confident that all of the property will be delivered to us clean and certified and everything else is just taking a little bit longer than what they thought. So they're going to be asking for an extension. Moving forward and reflected in the 2015 budget, the Hartwood Park improvements, um, that's additional parking and playground structure. Uh, in the stormwater utility, we do have uh, the W Street and Sunset View culvert, uh, which really starts up um, about 40, 39th to 42nd on W Street and that full drainage or basin downwards towards the Sunset View culvert that's close to the Washougal School District. So we're looking at summer construction for that project, uh, which is uh, definitely needed. Haven't had as much impact this year with uh, less rain, but uh, that culvert does flow full and over towards camping regularly. Streets, we're still moving forward with the 32nd and Evergreen reconstruct of that intersection. I've had conversations recently with our city engineer. We're getting down to a couple of acquisitions that are pending. So we may be looking at extending the construction window and going back before regional transportation uh, to be able to se secure those parcels and uh, slide the construction window a little bit, but we're still tracking on, on that project and working that with RTC staff with Mr. Ransom and Mr. Robbins. Jump to Guard Trail, uh, we was just discussing this this morning in regards to the school district uh, bond package that was passed and coordinating with them on the Jump to Guard Trail to make sure when that does go to construction um, that we don't get into a situation where we have to demo this improvement for them to be able to construct their improvements with that package. So I'll be reaching out to their operations staff Mr. Steinbrenner making sure to coordinate that. Uh, and again, that connects from the Jump to Guard uh, School District site to the north and kind of northwest towards Sunset View Road and ties into the Sunset Ridge subdivision with a safe crossing across Sunset View to be able to get to the north side of Sunset View. Uh, there's been conversations around the 27th Street flyover or overpass. Um, the recent discussion in Olympia. I don't know if you want to give a brief overview on that. Dave, uh, where we're at. Well, the Senate uh, passed a transportation package that includes revenue and a number of projects. Uh, in our community, uh, there's seven and a half million dollars for that specific project that is earmarked. The project is more expensive than that, could be as much as 16 million. That's a conservative engineer's estimate. Um, and there's some con uh, some contingency in there uh, just because of some unknowns. We would hope to dial it in less than that. Um, so it's incomplete funding, but it is funding nonetheless, significant funding. Uh, however, the House has yet to take up um, seriously any, uh, I know that behind the scenes they are, but uh, the Transportation Committee in the House hasn't doesn't have a bill out yet. There's not. Uh, any hearing schedule so we'll have to see we're going to try to get 12 million is what we're trying to get for that project well, is the West Slough Bridge on the project right? yes West Slough Bridge is on it's about 22 million and uh, another relevant project for us is uh, also on the state route is uh, 14 between the 205 and 164th widening there so those are two choke points for uh, uh, 
regular traffic and freight mobility. So both of those projects will help those choke points and those are helpful for us. So there's some concern as an entire family in Southwest Washington that the proportionality of projects on the list in the Senate package is less than maybe our share of payment in a gas tax scenario. So that's an ongoing conversation that the region should see more of this. And in fact, that led to a couple no votes uh, from neighboring district um, in that delegation in the Senate uh, because of concerns about the proportionality. Uh, so. Well, within that region, our legislative district, I think, did pretty well compared to the others around. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the 18th, you know, there's a, a, a rail overpass in Ridgefield. Uh, there's a Brady Road project in Amos, something up, to, yep. And then there's uh, in Battleground. So um, we'll take it, and we really appreciate Senator Rivers and the chair of the committee, uh, Senator King, for being aware of our needs and for promoting our needs. But it's not, a, it's not we're getting there. You know, um, <laughs> I want to take a minute and really point out the work of staff and of Mr. Halverson in this whole process. I started talking two years ago that just like the widening of Highway 14 that's been done so far, at some point, even though the numbers of our entire project out there, if you call it the $130, $133 million mega project, is so large that it's a non-starter to some people, at some point we had to put our hand in the air and start talking about the project and telling our story and trying to get some of this. We've gone from six months ago having absolutely zero allocated to the city of Washougal to being where we are now. Mm -hmm. And that is not an insignificant move. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a number of meetings with our delegation. We've done a number of meetings with Senator King and he's been extremely uh, open and willing to have those discussions. And even on his list that he started with last fall, we weren't anywhere near a list. And now we're significantly in the list. So to some degree, we're trying to play it down a little bit because we're kind of a newcomer to the table, if you would, that uh, if this thing passes in any significant way in the way that it's written now, we come out looking awfully well in a very, very short period of time with folks around the state that are just screaming at this region because of the amount that we went from being kind of sort of considered to for to now being included in a bill for. So my hat off to, to staff and again to Lloyd for continuing to have those discussions. And I'm and I apologize to council, this is one of those areas that we don't necessarily bring you in probably enough on. Um, but the amount of uh, behind the scenes discussions and continually touching those individuals and telling our story and telling our story, I think it's literally what's gotten us here. So a big thank you to the staff on that. Michelle? So I read your email, and just from my perspective being new and historically, um, you said that this really took foot in 2005. Um, and yeah. I was just wondering, who, who was pushing it? You said that the council and the administration and... It may have been before 05. I, the only record I can find <coughs> in our, on our server is our transportation plan from 05. Trevor, I don't know if we had a transportation plan before 05. No, uh, previous okay. director Scott Sawyer worked with Parsons Brinkerhoff and okay. uh, crafted the first transportation right. plan. So there. we've we've obviously there have been transportation improvements done in this community uh, well before 2005. So we were planning for them, but a fully compliant GMA savvy compliant <coughs> transportation facilities plan was first adopted in 2005. So the impetus to develop a transportation plan was that. That was done in 05. And so in that first formal, fully recognized transportation plan, this project was identified as, if not the highest priority, right up there in priorities as very important because it, a second crossing over the railroad tracks has been really, really important. And then it also is a connectivity up the hill. Uh, so the council was required to adopt a transportation facilities plan so it would be the council that adopted that but I believe the professional engineers and um, city engineer and consultants in the staff and then our partners maybe WashDOT and others helped us at that time determine what the prior how 
how it would happen and so cost considerations and unfortunately existing development considerations pointed to this project being the preferred alternative and then that's just maintained over the last 10 years and we've been chasing after it so connectivity up the hill for for who the residents or for the anticipated both 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 for the residents but uh, for the UGB up there okay right you're required to um, required to the GMA requires you to plan for the future so the transportation plan is a 20-year plan that looks out to the future and then it gets carved up into these six-year six-year looks that we call um, TIPS, Transportation Improvement Programs. And then the crossing being needed for backups, you said, onto 14. And I was curious about how often do backups actually happen on 14? Daily. 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 Every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, anywhere between 3 and 5.30 when there's a rail car coming across, you're onto 14. Okay just because of the number of people coming back home that use that route. And even just locally, even if 14 wasn't there, just for local emergency services to have another way across the railroad tracks is beneficial as the community grows over there. But so we, our emergency services are right over in here, right? The yeah. fire and, yeah. and they're right at the current. They're right there, which is great if they're actually dispatching off of the station. Sometimes they dispatch uh, while they're already rolling so it just depends on what's going on it's good to have another one if something were to happen to that one sort of that emergency management planning hat you think of things that are, are horrific and that you would never hope would never happen but if something happened to that one then we wouldn't have one so having a second one is ideal I think Richfield doesn't even have one at all right which is a problem so no but on the south side they really don't have a whole lot down there that right. Yeah. Yeah. Although they did have a fatality for a marine for a pet, that, right. And Camus has one crossing as of now. Is that right? Or Camus? Well, they have uh, call it one and a half formal ones. They've got their overpass that comes in onto Dallas Street, and then kind of sort of they share a crossing with us on Second Street. Although interesting enough, when those enhancements were done for the railroad crossing, I don't believe Camus joined us in paying for those. I believe the city paid fully for those. Did we not? Yeah, well, she will bear the cost as far as the quiet zone, but we partnered with Camus, and some of it had to be cited within their city limits. Yeah, they've, got, six they've got other ones that are just outside their western end or may actually be in there that are private, just like we have some on the east side that are private uh, access points going across that they just aren't even in the mix. Well, it doesn't burden them as much. Yeah. Tracks don't burden them as much as it burdens us. No, and even less today. They were finally able to get their quiet zone pretty much done, finished, and approved. Uh, the mill was a huge portion of that because they had to underground a couple of tunnels through the mill process uh, just to make sure that there's no traffic inside the mill. The, I don't know if you've gone on their rail tracks through there, but it actually cuts right through the mill. And that's the reason it has to start slowing down because it takes two jogs inside there. Um, but they had to mitigate the traffic of all of their equipment that traditionally has gone back and forth over those tracks all the time and they did that by building a pair of tunnels that go underneath from inside the mill to inside the mill so there is no more traffic going across the railroad tracks which allowed Burlington Northern uh, to quit blowing whistles in the downtown areas that went through there. Mm -hmm. So they had some other again private funds that have been taken care of between Burlington Northern and the mill. I don't think the city ended up paying any of those because none of it was on public land. Thank you. You're welcome. Community Center. We were recently notified by the county that the Community Center application for consideration uh, received the highest score. Our ask was right at 150,000, I think just south of that. Um, so it's pending at this point, but we do anticipate $150,000 of support via the Community Development Block Grant. Again, we scored quite well on the social service side. We didn't submit on the infrastructure side. Uh, we also have a consideration in regards to an appropriation, I believe, from Pike's office. Uh, we won't know final determination on that uh, until close of session, but when we ran through the scenarios of doing the improvements at the community center, the 
the core deliverable was the kitchen upgrades to be compliant with health standards. Um, so securing the 150,000 when it comes to fruition through block grant gives us some more opportunities to um, move towards the more complex scenarios of roofing, siding, the HVAC units. Um, so we'll continue to chase that and uh, expedite the process. I have asked uh, David and Trevor to start moving forward with uh, design and bid processes for that um, anticipation and so far confidence is high that the 300000 that Representative Pike has requested in the supplemental capital projects uh, bill will hopefully be looked on favorably. So between that and CDBG we're now at 450000 if we count that 300000 in there. Um, there is one caveat and I won't be shy about letting council know at this point if we do end up running shy of dollars needed for that project. Um, you can expect that I'll be back to council to ask for consideration of using some reserves to stopgap that so that we can do that project, do it in total, and not touch the building more than once as we do that uh, that project and get that part of the building where it needs to be. Paul? What's the total project estimate if you could do pretty much everything that you want to do? Uh, we had discussions around that with our preliminary estimates with the architect. We felt like there was a pretty uh, heavy contingency that was built in. I think the numbers we were working with were 750 to 800, uh, short of doing some value uh, engineering or architecture on that. But we felt, at least from a staff perspective, that there was quite a bit of contingency built in. Right. And some of the unknowns around uh, siding, dry rot, a few of the complexities that we dealt with when we opened up um, the main campus here, the main building on campus, City Hall. So we, we feel like we can deliver under that. We would really program. hope this is a, no more than six, six and a half. I, I don't know. You never know. The building's got some age, but with 300 from the legislature and 150, basically it's 147 or whatever it is, 150 from CDBG, and then what you appropriated uh, as a council in our building facilities fund. And then with um, uh, our friends at Meals on Wheels people uh, for appliances and equipment and anything else that they're able to generate through their process, um, we feel really confident that we can deliver the project this, you know, this year. And this is, we've been waiting. You know, we said, hey, let's wait and see if we can get all this money. And uh, so far, we're one for one. And uh, Representative Pike, and Vic have told us their number one capital project is this one. And then when we were up just recently, Senator Rivers told us, right after she told someone else that, that our project was the number one project for her in terms of locally in the capital, not the transportation budget, but in the capital budget. So our delegation is really, really recognizes the need and is very supportive of this, which is, we're very appreciative of that. And we've got uh, Senator King on one of his visits down here, we took him through it, and he was also uh, going to stress to Senator Honeybird, whose committee this would go through, uh, the importance of this project, especially for the Meals on Wheels, especially specifically for the Meals on Wheels uh, operation itself. So um, I, I think our confidence is high that those are there. If you add all those pieces together, we're bumping between 600 and 650,000 if all of those come through at the anticipated levels. Um, yeah. Can you remind me again of what our appropriation was in the budget for was it around the 90 city gen? portion? Is it, I thought it was around 80, but I could be. I think it was 80 or 90. 80 or 90. We had the project as a whole at 600. Right. But our, we, and then our portion. The scenarios we ran, I think just delivering the kitchen in that estimate <laughs> that we out was, I think, right around 80 or 90. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Health department requirements. Mm -hmm. Want to move on while you're looking, Jen? For okay. Okay. So just real quick on the grant highlights, specifically for projects, the operations center fueling facility, and working with Department of Ecology. That's a $400,000 project, $300,000, which is funded with grants from Ecology. 
uh, the TIB Evergreen Sidewalk Project. This is Evergreen and, and 34th Street, uh, close to where Smead's Tavern is, or actually directly abuts that specific parcel. That's a $140,000 project, 111 is grant from TIB. The congestion mitigation air quality, uh, feasibility for the traveler information sign. This is really a, a pre-warning feasibility study. Uh, if we did experience a closure at 32nd Street, we'd have signage west downstream of River Road. People would be informed that there's a closure at 32nd Street and have the ability to take the Washougal River Road exit and use the separated grade to get to East Street. So we're working with DOT on that uh, currently. And that's again a feasibility study. Uh, 40,000, 40, which is uh, grant funded, and 7,000 is the local match. And safe routes to school administered by uh, DOT, 34th Street. This is connection, uh, directly, direct correlation between the J Street improvements um, as well as the TIB improvements at the intersection to the south that are proposed. And that is a $520,000 project. Uh, 470000 is from grants, so a $50,000 local match to be able to do some safe routes improvements there uh, with the high school and gauze with, in close proximity. Tell me about the traveler information sign. What's, what exactly? So it's a, it's a pre-warning. So in looking at the feasibility, <coughs> we would do all the downstream impacts as well. So when we have enhanced... Um, I guess vehicle trips utilizing River Road when there's a closure on 32nd Street. Because of a train. Yeah, we need to find out exactly what those downstream impacts are, specifically at E and River Road. They have more cars using that separated grade, as well as from where they go from there, either east, west, or so north. So you're driving on 14 heading east, and you'll, you'll get a, a warning that 30 seconds is going to be closed by the time because of the trains coming through, or is it just closed generally? Could be for any reason. Well, it can be utilized for, for multiple, I guess, pre-warning uh, opportunities. I've seen them where they're very similar to notification boards for like inclement weather. Right. We'll right. let you know, chain up area, times, dates, tune your radio, whatever it might be. The real core, the, the core interest in this is to be able to give people pre-warning instead of queuing out on 32nd Street during a rail right. closure to right. be able to take River Road. But, basically needing to study the downstream impacts of doing so. So that's really the feasibility portion of it. This is something that RTC has spent some time on, not only ours, but several others. And what's being talked about, if you go across the 205 bridge, just after you get into Oregon over the next couple of miles, there are new reader boards there. Uh -huh. That's exactly what we're talking about. I mean, so it says like travel time to those, those signs or or, to... or it can say there's an accident here okay they're they're general reader boards you can put anything up or there. congestion on 32nd and sometimes I get to 32nd not taking the right overpass I get to it and I say oh man I go down <coughs> to Gibson Road and come yeah. back yeah. that's where this was born out of is your mayor going across there too many times and seeing too many people pulling U-turns out there on the highway because now I can see what's happening. I'm going back the other direction. So I went to staff and said, is there a way? Go down Are to there Gibson any Road and come back that way. Keep going. Go down to Gibson Road and come back that way. Yeah, some people don't do that, though, and this is both, one, to relieve the congestion down there, but two, to relieve the, uh, the safety involved in those vehicles making those U-turns on the highway, which is mm -hmm. a little bit boring there. Joyce? Who? puts the information up? Is it the police department that puts the information up? What, what my suggestion was, if it's helpful and it's able to be done, is for it to be, in the case of rail traffic, it would literally be triggered by uh, a sensor that the railroad would have out there, either on eastbound or westbound trains, either one, in order to give you enough warning before you get over the top of the, that rise. Well, did somebody sensor. type that in? No, it would automatically be triggered. No, oh, okay. Something's coming through here. And again, it's just a warning. Use it as you will, but there's a large regional data system that includes basically all of the Portland Metro, all of the Vancouver Metro, up into part of Collins County. That is part of this. This is this much of the project that we're talking about, and there will be lots of reader boards and and a major computer system with 
most of which exists and most of the sensors exist. What's, what hasn't happened before is the integration into a system and then electronic signage to convey that information to, to drivers. And that, that's planned over the next few years, less than three. There'd be major implementation of that throughout the, the whole metro area. And the whole, the whole justification behind the project is the congestion mitigation air quality is really fancy for cars not sitting there and idling. So instead of sitting on either DOT's facility or 32nd Street during the closure, they're moving and utilizing River Road, just identifying exactly what those downstream impacts are. And again, these funds don't pay for the signage. That's this right, just, just a piece of the study to see what happens and if it were to be installed. And right. Thank you to staff for pointing out we've got to go through that process. Now all those cars decide they're going to dump onto River Road. What does that do to Main and River Road? What does that do to E Street and River Road? Da, 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 and how do we affect those? Me, what the heck? If there's just more vehicles going down through downtown and following Main Street, I think you've got some uh, store owners that would think that, that was just fine. More opportunity for folks to stop. Hopefully at some point, though, we should probably, uh, Trevor Paul's comments are well taken, we should look at that integrated system, because I don't know necessarily that we want this to be part of that system. It, it's, on, it's on the RTC list as being part of the system. This particular <laughs> location for an information <coughs> sign. What's that? This has gone to RTC for the grant funding, correct? Yes. Yeah, they recommended actually exploring further the, the air quality opportunity to get it basically paid for by the feds. But this isn't one that's meant to be, anybody can change this. I don't believe so, unless there's additional capacity that's built into it that DOT would like to leverage um, or another uh, agency or partner. But our specific ask was for the impacts of a rail, rail. closure. Yeah. So there might be another opportunity for them to be able to leverage this specific facility. I just don't know but, that we want anybody to be able to hijack it for that if our yeah. reason for putting it in and paying for it is to relieve the congestion onto the highway and onto 32nd Street. Yeah, I, I can follow up with that. I work with Rob and RTC staff. Good. Our portion was roughly 90000 Oh, oh, 90,000. Oh, okay. I did a quick question because we're talking about the potential closure of, of the crossing. Do we know if um, 24th is used more than 20th as far as? Anecdotally, yes. As far as tube counts, yeah. I, I just know when there's a closure and you're in the operations facility, or you're in the operations area of 24th, people immediately go west, depending on which way the train's going, mm -hmm. to try to catch that crossing or 20th or just backtrack and just take River Road, separated mm -hmm. grade. Okay, I was just so. wondering, if it, before we move forward with anything like this, it might be important to do a traffic count at the, the two crossing. Yeah, we get regular traffic counts. I just haven't looked at those recently. Oh, okay. So we need to look at them. Okay. But 32nd is utilized much more heavily than any other at grade crossing oh, yeah, for sure. that we have. So far internally, our discussions have been if we vacate a crossing, it would likely be 24th because there's just so much less impact on 24th than there is on any other crossing yeah. as far as the number of people that are going to be accessing it yeah. and the psychological yeah. and or real impacts that you would have to uh, property owners and business owners in the downtown core taking out a crossing that gets directly into the downtown core. How does 24th affect Hathaway? Doesn't affect Hathaway at all. Well. I, I travel on 20th because I deliver food uh, to a Meals on Wheels client there. It's it's bad. If you allow park, street parking on 20th, <laughs> just trying to get around vehicles and then to the other side of the little uh, well, yellow delineators. Uh, yeah. delineators, just, I mean, it's just, it's bad. So, um, no, no disagreement. That's why we've looked uh, continually for ways to upgrade 20th to the same degree that every other street was done. Why they were done in the order they were, given the traffic that's on them, I've never understood. Mm -hmm. Unless all of that plan was put in place before the school district vacated Columbia School. At that point, Hathaway and all those areas were integral to each other because the classes went back and forth, mm -hmm. and at least the students went back and forth. Um, since then, though, it, 
it absolutely makes no sense to me that, especially given the fact that if you ever looked at closures, I think most people would tell you that 24th would disappear before 20th did, that they were funded in separate or not funded in the case of 20th. That one needs to be upgraded. That's going to be expensive. 20th? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's just, there's not enough room oh, to no, move traffic course. there. And what's, what will end up happening, I think, in the, in the upgrades to that, to get it to the standard, uh, for example, the 24th is, mm -hmm. we're going to be buying buildings on two sides to the south side of the railroad tracks. Okay. And taking those out. Well, or that's more than two buildings because it's got to be widened alone. It sure does. Okay. Continue to work on the public works business plan. Um, that is a takeaway from the strategic plan that was developed over the last two years, identifying priorities within each division within public works, uh, and jumping forward a little bit has emphasis around the performance management piece as well. Uh, we are working with um, a couple of finalists right now as far as potential interns to to help with the performance management piece uh, to be a pilot, if you will, within public works. And then the intention, I believe, is citywide uh, integration or implementation. As you saw at our last couple, uh, well, two meetings ago, the rollout of YourGov uh, to be able to report uh, issues or concerns via tablet or smartphone and working with Cartograph, which is our uh, computer maintenance management software as far as infrastructure tracking uh, and finding out exactly when uh, structures depreciate out, when maintenance is conducted, and when infrastructure needs to be scheduled for maintenance. We also had a touch in regards to the automated metering infrastructure. We are teeing that up for your consideration uh, within the next uh, couple meetings um, to look at that project again. We are looking at some different scenarios um, in trying to deliver that project uh, in the most efficient and effective manner. Um, I did have uh, some simple payback and return on investment questions in working with our consultant on that specific project. So looking to get uh, resolution on that and then bringing it back forward to council consideration. So that's Public Works in a nutshell for 2015. I think I went a little bit over my 20 minutes, so I apologize. <laughs> You're two thirds of the budget, so. Yeah. I uh -huh. actually have 28 minutes, but. Okay. I said 20. No. <laughs> <laughs> Plus or minus. Questions yeah. for Trevor? Additional questions on any of the information he has presented or on any other items that maybe he didn't go through that you've got any questions on? Chief, I think you're up. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry. Maybe premature on this, but have we looked at what we would need to do with infrastructure to service the potential annexation? Uh, with Bird Hill area? Yes. I've had conversations with Director Knipe as well as our city engineer. Uh, we've actually had one on one meetings <coughs> with parcel owners that were inquiring about capacity and what we have portion of the zone six improvements at the top of the public works presentation we talked about siting a reservoir and constructing a reservoir that really poises us to be able to serve the immediate city limits but rolling over Woodburn Hill to the north to I think southeast 16th Street that really poises us to be able to serve that with water and uh, sewer we also have uh, identified strategies uh, inside the general sewer plan to be able to, to serve that. Yeah, wastewater was the one that I was more worried yeah. about. It seems it's to me really the water was enhanced. at a high level. It's really uh, a rollout of multiple pump stations or lift stations to be able to bring that back to current infrastructure the way it sits right now with the topography. For but we, sewer we have enough wastewater infrastructure on the south side of the hill to be able to handle what we lift into it. Yeah, so ultimately everything is going to make its way over to lift station four. We've rebuilt lift station four and the force main across the Washougal River Road when we opened excavated that, I believe, four years ago. So ultimately everything on the north and west side of the river makes its way through 
pump station four. That's also part of task and deliverable within our general sewer plan. RFP that was recently put out and Wallace is the preferred consultant at this time to be able to look at that, that basin specifically to see if there's upgrades that do need to take place. Do we have any redundancy up there for that at all? We, as far as uh, getting wastewater across the river, we have a second conduit that's been put in place and capped that hasn't been utilized thus far. So it was a 50 year horizon in opening up the river because you don't open up the river and open excavate the river every day. After you, it takes you seven years to permit it. So there is a separate conduit in there that's not being utilized as for future capacity. And then how about, how about transportation streets? So I believe there's, yeah, it's really the Woodburn Hill sub area plan around transportation. So when that was annexed in and developed, there was anticipation of circulation to the north and to the west back to Crown Road. Um, that was inside uh, the UGB, but not within city limits at the time. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, you're working with Lancaster. And th th there's stubs out from the south that you know of uh, 20, 27th to the north is within uh, our plan as well. Generally, all the infrastructure in there will be, you know, done at the time of development, and then, and, and I think that's kind of the bigger question that we we started on when we were talking about annexation. That when we kind of tabled that and the employment center portion of it, that you know that whole area and in, in taking a, a better look at it, um, we may look at that time and saying we you know we need some you know it's pretty obvious looking at it, we'll, we'll want some more north south. We'll need to get it up there, and, and how will it go really east west? Um, but at a transportation planning standpoint, we're really looking at the major infrastructure uh, around it. The circulation portions will come at the time of development. Thank you. There may be some need as well uh, to look at the 32nd Street side, uh, specifically down where uh, the new Schmidt Park would be. I believe one of the considerations in there, Dave, did we leave it in the agreement or not, is they sell off the property on the east side for development. Was there not a lift station that needed to be down in the proximity of the park on one side or the other of 32nd? Uh, potentially on the, the west side, the parcel in question, right. as far as the Stiles Basin. So there's uh, potential for upsizing that or putting some redundancy in there for future as well, both up the hill from there and in addition what's coming across uh, Stiles, the river and through. Yeah, Stiles Road Interceptor. It's been diverted a little bit within our sewer CIP. Everything off of 32nd Street to the north towards Styles and uh, Forest View, Mount Norway. Any other questions for Trevor? Okay, we're going to do a little deviation on the agenda. Uh, Chief's got a little bit to go through. Uh, Jeanette's got a little bit less, so Chief, we're going to let you off the hook for a moment. I could have condensed it. And, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so we're going to go to uh, Human Resources next, and then we'll take our break and come back to uh, Chief Mitchell. Jeanette. Great, thank you. Um, so the um, first item is the classification and compensation policies. So our uh, current policies in both these areas are um, very general um, in nature. Um, so I've been working on a um, revision uh, for both these um, aspects. The classification policy itself, so there'll be two separate policies, uh, one to um, address the um, classification piece and the other to uh, address the pay administration piece. Um, the classification side will um, speak to um, the philosophy, guiding principles, roles, and responsibilities. Um, the classification for new positions or positions that could be impacted by um, a reorganization within the city. On the um, pay administration side, um, this particular policy uh, will address um, situations such as um, um, how we, from a pay administration perspective, how we position ourselves um, relative to um, comparable organizations. Um, also, how to handle pay adjustments as a result of that market analysis um, that, uh, that we bring back. And both these policies are in a draft format um, right now. I've been um, discussing them with Dave. Um, the goal is to bring um, both of them forward in a workshop probably within the next couple of months and then hopefully certainly by mid-year 
um, we will have both these um, policies in place and certainly could inform um, our discussions as we get into collective bargaining this year. Were you going to maybe uh, run them through with the Finance Committee? Before Absolutely. Shot. Yeah, I felt um, a good benefit um, in meeting with the um, Finance Committee on uh, one of the other items that I'll go through here in terms of cost savings. So absolutely run it through that first and then bring it uh, to council workshop and on to, um, you know, obviously, you know, a formal presentation. Okay, thank you on that. Um, the second item, the uh, Well City Award. Um, so as you know, and I bring forward every year during budget discussions, um, we have a benefit of a 5% discount on our Regents Medical Insurance for getting the Well City Award. Um, it's not trivial. 5%? Um, 5%. I thought it was 2. 2%. 2%, sorry. My number's going to be, yeah, 2%, <laughs> sorry. Um, so that's about $12,000, $14,000 a year. What's a decimal between friends? Yeah, right, right. I wish it was five. Maybe, maybe you could do something about that part. Wow. Um, so that's about twelve or fourteen thousand dollars. So it's not a trivial, as I said, not a trivial amount of money. Um, the um, the bar um, does continue to get raised on that. Um, there's one particular item that we need to achieve in getting um, fifty percent of our employees and spouses. Uh, to complete the health questionnaire, and um, so we need to make sure we continue to do that, as well as any other changes that may come forward to to, to achieve that. Fifty percent of them that are covered under that under the Regents program. plan, right? Under the Regents plan, that's the the benefit. Um, it's just on the Regents side of the medical, and, and doesn't apply to Kaiser. Even though Kaiser does have a health questionnaire, um, it's uh, th that it's cost savings is just for Regents. Yeah. Good news is last year, through uh, efforts of multiple folks at the department head and below level, uh, we got those. We hit 50 percent earlier than you've hit it in a long time. So. Yeah, well, the last two years since the stipulation's been put in place, we did not hit that even with a real big push. So we put an even more greater push um, forward, and employees have come forth and, and helped us with that. And we've achieved that 50% goal. And then we also get a small grant from AWC when we achieve that. So that goes into the budget as well for uh, for our well programs. So anyway. Okay, so um, that's it on the uh, Well City Award. Um, in terms of the um, cost savings suggestion program, um, as you know, I brought that forward starting with the Finance Committee. Um, and then um, a workshop in February. Um, so I'm slated to bring that back in a formal capacity next Monday, the 23rd, um, for your consideration. Um, so just to um, reiterate, um, this is a program that will go through rigorous review. Um, the goal is to engage employees um, to bring ideas forward um, that we can realize cost savings. Um, the benefit to the city, of course, is that we will be able to uh, receive the benefit of those savings, but employees will also um, receive the benefit of um, a percentage share, if you will, um, of the net savings for the first year of the program. Is that, <coughs> we run that, are other cities doing that? Yeah, very few though. Um, I, I, I think probably to date the, the, the mo most robust program is actually at the state level and that's what the statute sp uh, speaks to specifically. But in getting legal advice, um, certainly we can leverage that, but there are very few cities. They've done it and w from my research, many are kind of inactive today. So I'm hoping that we can generate that momentum and, and have sure. a good active program. There's, stat, there's a statute that authorizes this. Absolutely, uh, yeah. The yeah. county's had one in place for two years, two years, three years, Clark County. Yeah. Okay, the next item is the safety committee. Um, we have um, robust safety committees that exist within our public works and uh, police departments. Um, while we've been doing um, Safety related things at City Hall, like for instance, um, we do, we've done the CPR and uh, first aid training um, a couple of times. Um, we really need to formalize the safety committee for City Hall personnel. Um, I've got a draft policy, if you will, um, in place. It's just kind of finalizing that and getting um, a group of employees together and meeting on a regular basis, really to look at any issues and concerns that exist at City Hall and, and then following through and addressing those. Um, last item on the list is um, contract uh, negotiations. Um, as you know, um, we are still waiting uh, for our decision on the police contract. Um, hopefully, we will hear on that by the end of April. 
um, and that will um, inform the duration of our uh, con our next contract. Um, if it turns out that it's um, it's uh, two years uh, that's approved by the arbitrator, um, we will have both contracts um, open for discussion this year. As the, therefore, both contracts will expire at the end of this year. And that's it for me. Unless there's any questions, yeah. Well, I just wanted to, of course, Well City is near and dear to my heart. If there's anything that council can do or that I can do to assist you, especially in the health questionnaire stuff, any good ideas would be much appreciated. And then the on safety committee, where are we at on AEDs? Well, every, we have every building, every, every, mm -hmm. every portion of the complexes are right. covered. We did that right, and we had that tra ago. we had training on that too, along with our CPR and first aid training. Is there? Do the police cars carry them, or we've carried them for years? Yes. I'm sorry. We've carried them for years. Yes. And and of course, fire, of course. Is, is there any reason that public works would need to carry them? We do have one at the operations center, just not in rolling no, stock. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Out of Fund 125, uh, for some council members that uh, don't know or don't recall, out of Fund 125, I believe in 2011, uh, we had Chief Schumacher go through and purchase additional ones so that every, every building complex that the city has has one. And we purchased them for the school district for any of the school properties that we're lacking them, or in the case of the high school, so there's one in the main high school and at the football field in that complex. I believe the only one that we didn't cover, and we probably need to uh, check with them to see, uh, is Jeff Card because it's outside of the uh, city limits, and there was some question whether we could actually purchase them for that uh, that purpose out there. They do have an AED. Yeah. Because yes, <coughs> all the little signs as they. So as we were going through and re-identifying all those dollars that had been spent, what we have left to spend and all of that kind of stuff, we had those dollars out there. Those were some that could clearly be spent for that. So we went ahead and covered every one of those at that point so that we boosted the number significantly. Uh, Jeanette, question for you on the safety committee. Yeah. So are you talking about a separate safety committee that is just City Hall? Yeah, just for City Hall personnel, yeah. Hopefully we can find a way to do that with the same committee. I know certainly in the in the private sector, mm -hmm. I mean, even massive construction companies have a safety committee that takes into account whether they've got construction projects going in Portland and Seattle and their mm -hmm. main office in Boise and yada, yada, yada without having to, to stir up a lot more meeting time. Yeah, this is what we committed to in our bargaining agreement. Yeah. And, oh. They and, asked us to do it. Yeah. And, and, the other, and the other good reason for doing it, the other good reason for doing it is that um, the issues, uh, and we've talked about that, um, the issues that um, public works are, face, that police face, are very different than, than, than what we face at City Hall, so. No, understood. Yeah. Okay. We agreed to it, we agreed to it. I, mm -hmm. I managed to forget that one. <laughs> I would think that building officials would be the ones that you would worry about the most in terms of safety. If my understanding is correct, it's probably more the frontline folks, their safety is what was a factor of consideration. Just, yeah, just any, any um, individuals that work in publicly accessible areas yeah. of our facilities, safety is a concern. And, Understood. Um, and we've done some things. We have, uh, Panic buttons. We used to have just one panic button. Now we have multiple panic buttons. Um, we believe enhanced service through a different provider. As we dug deep, we were uh, dissatisfied with the previous provider. Um, communities do all different sorts of things. It's this balancing act between being open and accessible and available to your right. constituents and uh, ensuring that people we care about who are our colleagues and everyone who's here are safe and so you know we don't want to build a fortress where you have to crawl through barbed wire to pay your utility bill 
on the other hand, we care about people and we want to make sure they're okay and they're, they're safe. So this is about, this is what this is, is about. And um, we'll see what, you know, comes, comes from it. Uh, there may be some thoughts around physical enhancements to safety. We'll just have to see. And then just a reminder on uh, negotiations, arbitration, uh, council at some point, obviously we may uh, need to come back to you in regards to budgeting since the, whatever the arbitration determination is for the police union is retroactive back to the start of 2014. Correct. So yeah. we've got the budgets in place uh, as we've gone from year to year, but they're operating basically without a contract at this point and have been since the end of last year or so, or the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. So we may need to do some adjustments depending on how well we fare in that. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Jeanette? Okay, if not, we're going to take a break until 11 a.m. Probably been by far the, the biggest project that we've had going on for the last couple of years. And uh, for those that may not know what region is, it's a uh, regional records management system that will replace our current system that we're using right now, which is called EPR. Portland is the host city for this, and there's a, a multiple agencies in Oregon and pretty much all of the agencies in Southwest Washington that are, that are coming onto this system. And in the beginning, Portland has been very tight about controlling how they wanted to do things, and understandably so. But the original plan called for two uh, training facilities in Clark County. And early on, we realized if you're trying to funnel every commissioned police officer in Clark County through uh, two training facilities, one being with Vancouver and one with the Sheriff's Office, that it was going to be very difficult for us to do that without creating uh, schedule issues and a whole lot of overtime. So we really petitioned hard with Portland. There again, we're very reluctant to let us do that. Uh, even though uh, uh, Officer uh, Aikens, Sergeant Aikens, is a what's called a super trainer, that is, he trains trainers that they felt like, yeah, we just didn't want to let control. But finally, uh, several months ago, they allowed us to uh, open up our own training facility. That, and the bottom line for us is it conservatively saved us at least twenty-five thousand dollars in overtime costs. Allows us to schedule on our time and not every doing this whole 40-hour training on overtime. That being the case, we opened that up uh, to other agencies, uh, CAMAS, <coughs> Adelran, the Center, Ridgefield, to come in and use our facility. Now, each department has their own trainer, so we don't not required to teach all the classes, but we all help out. Um, uh, Doug Norcross with CAMAS has, has been helping that out quite a bit. So not only, again, has it saved us money, but it's allowed Battleground and Camas to come in and train basically on their training days and save them some money as well. We also, um, let's see, uh, let's see the, the 3rd of April, we're going to be hosting administrative class, so the chiefs from Camas and Battleground will be in. There's, there's probably maybe a four or five hour class for the administrators, since we really probably won't be actively using the reporting mechanism, but to go in and approve reports and pull up certain data, we have to go through a piece of that as well. It's also going to require us to do a complete evidence, a full evidence audit, which we anticipate we're planning three days for this. And it's kind of come along at a good time because we're making some changes in the office as far as who wants to take over those evidence responsibilities. So uh, Donna, uh, our new hire, will be taking that over uh, after this audit on, uh, at the end of the month. <clears throat> so Chief, prior to that, are you going to try and trim down the amount of evidence you've got in there that you can get rid of? Or that's part of it. That's part of it. And we've been, it's been an ongoing process. When we would just had uh, Kelly in there working, it was basically all we could do, just answer phones and approve reports. <laughs> so now that we've back up the staffing, uh, Kelly's been able to spend some time in culling out some of that material there as well to get us ready for this point. But I assume now that uh, during this audit we'll really have it trimmed down. So everything that's under the old system will now go into the region system. 
So now do you want to give the council the unabridged version of uh, Thad's competency and the fact that Portland didn't think that little itty bitty Washigal could host a training facility? Yeah, yeah basically, it you know, just to be, uh, you know, polite, I think they kind of felt uh, people were incompetent and they love Thad now. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, Captain Brooks with uh, Portland, I saw him a couple weeks ago at a luncheon. And he goes, oh, we'd love to hire Thad. It's like, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, no. Uh, so it, it's been, uh, uh, the one thing out of this is it's, it's, it's drawn a lot of the local law enforcement agencies together and you meet and, and network with people you probably normally wouldn't get to meet with. But, uh, so it's just a month away from today. Kudos to whoever decided to do this on a Tuesday morning rather than a Monday morning. <laughs> Yes. Well, again, that was Portland. So. <clears throat> okay, um, the other issue that we had, not issue, but... Is there chief one? Oh, I'm sorry. I just had a question. So they're just utilizing your computers when they come for their training then? They bring their own trainer? No, uh, we, yes. We set up a computer lab. If you uh, were to go into the office and look in our training room, it's pretty much a computer lab now. Mm -hmm. And again, I have to give credit to uh, our IT department because they helped set up this up and everything where other departments uh, the other two uh, training sites have had uh, problems getting up and running ours has been pretty much flawless so do camas and battlefield and ridgefield they just don't have computers to do the training on or uh, well they can't um it's not they don't have the computers uh they have to meet certain requirements and whatnot but uh portland only really wanted control over the training mm. and uh yeah certainly that their own trainers could probably do that, but that's not what they wanted. They wanted it strictly three labs now. Okay. So everybody in Clark County has to go through one of those three labs for training. And uh, so we have what looks like a classroom in there, and it's all set up, all the software is there, everything is ready to go, and uh, it's a lot of work. <clears throat> yes? Yeah, so how long does it take to go through training? It's a 40 hour uh, oh, so let's for, for officers. Yeah. So it's, we've, it, it depends. The battleground is running 11 hour shifts. So they're doing like three 11. We were able to condense it down a little bit, but you can only condense down so much. It's, it's really detailed. Um, hmm. It takes anywhere between six months to a year before you're really fully comfortable working in it. And you feel like, okay, this I can do this as quickly now as what I was working on the old system. Mm -hmm. um, but, yes. Do we charge for this, the use of the facility, or no, no, no? Thank you. Um, a chief Richardson at Battleground had offered to, you know, pay overtime for our trainers if need be, but we all really help each other out. Um, so when they do something for us, let's say an IA, there's a lot of man hours and time that they put into us. They don't charge us for, we don't charge them for those sort of things. So, but it's, it's, it's helped bring the departments together. Uh, there's some other things that we'll be working on that I'll get to a little bit later that. Um, and it's really not comparable to range time. No, no. So Chief, on April 14th, uh, where, if any, are the downfalls of going active on this system. It's not, similar, <coughs> probably not dissimilar to the last changeover we did at Cressa where the system failed for whatever number of months in dispatching in regards to your records retaining and if something was gonna go wrong, what's it gonna be? Probably some of the different interfaces and they know some of the little interfaces, let's say maybe with a sector, which is the uh, ticket system we use that's used in the cars. Some of those, those interfaces they're still currently working on, but the main guts of the program they feel is they're confident with that. And it gets into nothing to do with dispatching, answering calls, any of that. This is the backup behind the scenes, the records retention, the evidence retention, the flow of information among departments. Correct. So we'll be able to look at any cases that that's any any region member. Uh, we can pull up and look at their reports. We'll be able to tell if some that we are dealing here with uh, in Washougal has had history in 
Portland or Tigard or Oregon City. Um, and it's strictly the records management and evidence piece only. So normal dispatching has, will go on just like it has been. Um, radio replacement, as you recall, a couple of months ago we had to go through and purchase new portable and mobile radios. Uh, those uh, that equipment has arrived. The mobile radios have been issued to the officers who are currently using those. <clears throat> we probably won't switch over to the new uh, P25 system until sometime next year, but all the radios are out. The mobile radios, the ones that are installed in the cars, it's going to take a little bit longer. Under this purchase agreement, uh, Cressa chose Day Wireless to do the installs, so they will be out uh, uh, replacing and program, programming the radios that are in the cars themselves. And we expect that's probably going to take place sometime in the next couple of months. Did we find any use for the old ones in other city vehicles or crews to be able to utilize those? Is there any value to doing that? You know, we kind of looked at that. Uh, I don't know what the system would be to kind of monitor that 800 piece. Uh, I, I'll double check in. Look Are you thinking I think public Commander, works to public works vehicles or to your Yeah, I think Commander Cook office. and uh, Will Street okay. Manager <laughs> talked about it at the end of our leadership meeting, but I don't think it's been further explored. No. We'll take a look at it. Okay. Because we have no other trading value or anything else for those units, do we? Uh, very little. Years ago, Rod Morris and I took a FEMA training on emergency management. One of the things that came up for most of the people in Clark County was, good Lord, if we lose our cellular system or something happens to Cresso, we have absolutely no way to talk to each other. And that there was even some talk about passing out citizens band radios to public works so that in an emergency when they don't have their normal communications towers that they could talk to each other. I would just suggest that that's worth thinking about. We do have some, I think they're UHF radios that we can communicate with in, that, in the event that that happens. We've kept those. Uh, that was what we used on what we called our old city frequency, where we would speak car to car. Mm -hmm. Those are still in the cars, and we have one, um, like a dispatching center in the office. So we could communicate with internally, and I believe FIRE still has those. I'm sorry? Uh, I think FIRE still is using some of the, the UHF radios as well. What we probably would need is maybe a few handhelds, so when you're out of, out of your car, you should be able to communicate, and those are fairly inexpensive. You don't need repeaters for those? I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> uh, a couple of audits coming up this year. Uh, WCIA is going to do an audit on the police department, and I think uh, Public Works as well. It's scheduled for uh, August or late August. Some of the things that they're looking at for <clears throat> the police department would be things that are kind of in the media right now with use of force, um, canine training, internal investigations, those sort of things. So because we're, uh, uh, we belong to Lexapol and, and Lexapol keeps current with uh, all of the policies, we should be in pretty good standings. I've started going through all of those and we'll probably meet up with Jeanette here in another month or so and kind of review this to make sure we're all on board with that. And that audit's just for policies and procedures, not necessarily into experience or... No, that no, that's stuff. just, they want to make sure that, let's say, for a use of force, that we have a use of force policy, that they, they talk about um, uh, less than lethal type uh, devices that we have and how the training and how they're used. So it's basically kind of an uh, uh, in-depth look into your policies in those specific areas. Uh, access audit, audit uh, that's coming up next week, and, and access is uh, basically a, it's a computer terminal that's inside of our office that connects to a bank of other resources that's governed by the State Patrol. 
So when we run someone, uh, do background checks, those sort of things, uh, that's, <coughs> bless you. that's uh, under the access audit, and there are certain policies and procedures that, that we have to do when we use that, so that's what they're going to come in and make sure that we're following the proper procedures for that. Uh, mention the front office reorganization. Uh, the biggest thing that we decided to do within the last few weeks is to alter our opening time from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that first hour is when Kelly and Don are trying to process reports and get things done. So to have uh, the public not in at that time and they're allowed to get all the reports out to the prosecutor's office and just seemed to make sense. So far it hasn't caused any problems. Honestly, we haven't had that many people that come in that time in the morning, but sometimes they do. Uh, so there's a change there. And again, um, just some of the changes with uh, Kelly giving up uh, evidence to Donna and Donna taking that over, the timing of that has, has worked out well for us. Uh, canine. We, Ranger's still doing uh, very well. He's a, this dog is awesome. Uh, he's any of the training. He seems to be far and above uh, the other dogs, and I think a lot of that has to do with Officer Day, who's his handler, who just has a passion for this. We did receive uh, another donation from Kathy Markham of about three thousand dollars this month. We've also uh, from a. A drug case back, I think, in 2010, we're, we're trying to get some money from that. It could be up to about $10,000. We won't know for sure on that. But these things take <coughs> quite a bit of time on these <coughs> seizures. So hopefully uh, we'll see that sometime this year. Uh, you, Kyle, you, go ahead. Do you have any feel for how many times Ranger's been deployed since he got his final certification? Is it once a week? At least once a week, Five if not more than that. And, and the way we're still trying to get our hands around how the whole county canine team operates, it's basically they're all, they all carry a pager and they all come on at different times. So it's, and we all back each other up. But he's, Ranger's pretty busy. He, he's a, played at least on the average two or three times a week, if not more. And no negative incidents? No. Since he's come on. No, he's, uh, some of the problems that they've had with some of the dogs, the rangers, in rangers class, when they all went through the retraining, or uh, all, everybody pretty much got new dogs between Battleground and uh, the county, was uh, the bite work and having the dogs bite on when they're supposed to. Some of the dogs weren't biting. Uh, that's not been the case with Ranger. <laughs> rewards. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's obviously something that you use as a last resort, but uh, there were instances where the dogs were just looking at the suspect and like, are you supposed to bite him? Uh, Academy update. Uh, our new hire, uh, Francis Reagan's doing well. He's due to graduate on the 28th of May. He'll undergo a 12-week FTO process, so we anticipate that he will be on the road, ready to go, right about the end of summer. I'm sorry? Right about the end of summer. So staffing-wise, are you, other than Francis being up at the academy, are you back to full yes. bodies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Department goals. Um, we really want it to be underway on the accreditation piece right now. That's still a, a big goal for us, the WASPIC accreditation. Unfortunately, none of us knew how much time region was going to take up. And it's, it's, it's been such a huge project and required so much staff time to make that happen that we've had to push back a little bit on the accreditation. It's our goal to start that process in the summer. So, uh, and again, that's a year-long process. Uh, we can bring um, Lee Map in to have him take a look at where we're at right now, 
They can do basic, a basic audit on us and tell us where we need to improve or change. We have an idea and we're trying to update as we go along and, and change policies or improve policies or do things that we know that we need to do in preparation for this. But once we notify WASPIC of our intent to go with accreditation, then we have a year to complete that. So it's a year-long process uh, with having both admin uh, assistants in place now, we'll probably tie up one of them, spending quite a bit of time on that for us. Chief, is there any value? Uh, can we approach somebody like Mike Evans to come in and potentially do that work for us? Mike's retired now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and still young. Yeah. And did all the county's work. We could. Uh, I don't anticipate that there's a. Our, our policies being that, we're, again, we're a Lexapol and Lexapol and Waspic, they kind of mirror as far as policies go. It, uh, you know, we could look into that. I don't know what that cost might be for him to do something like that. I was wondering about somebody or somebody similar to that that's retired that has been in that world with the departments they were with that you know know the process everything else rather than just doing it on our own I don't know either I don't know if it's a ten thousand dollar bill I don't know if it's a fifty thousand yeah bill. we um, kind of anticipate it's going to tie up either a sergeant or a commander cook for several months and an admin person yeah, yeah. and an admin so the, the benefit of doing this is you're following professional standards. It reduces our liability a little bit. It's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's labor intensive, and it's just something we couldn't accomplish. One of the benefits of doing it is when you do it yourself, the experience that you gain in yes. doing it is important. That's part of it. The process is part of it, too, but potentially there's back-end work that could yeah. be helpful. We, like we did reach out to Camus, and they uh, did help us and are willing to help us as well. So it's they're yeah. accredited. Mm -hmm. well, I'm trying to get my head around what is this? What does it? What do you have to do? Basically, there are certain standards that you have to meet. Uh, let's say, for example, an easy one would be. Uh, you have to have in your files show everybody has gone through, all the officers have gone through uh, the police academy. And then you have to have a policy that says all of your officers have to go, have gone through the police academy. Uh, performance evaluations that says you have to do annual performance evaluations. And then you have to have a policy that says you're going to do annual performance <laughs> evaluations. And then they'll pull one and look at that. So it's, it's things of that nature. Stuff you're already doing, it's documenting yeah. mm -hmm. in the appropriate formats right. to be a, meet their standard. Do they have kind of standards for procedures? For example, would they have a standard that they would want you to use for the use of non-lethal force or something like that? Yes. And they would want your, your policy to be in line with, with their standard? Correct. Or yeah. one of their standards. Or, or, yes. Yeah. Uh, things such as the MDCs in the car, you know, because those are mobile access devices, we have to have, we have to prevent citizens from viewing that. So how do you do that when you exit <coughs> the car or even if you have a rider in the car because that computer terminal is there, I could look over and see what was on there. So unless if you're access certified, you're not even supposed to view that. So basically the certification of officers and intern the department itself, it's your, once you're accredited, you're certified to the best of the best of the best. Yes, it just means that you meet professional standards. And, in, and it's not a one-time deal, you have to get re-accredited. Yes, it, and it comes along every four years. The first year, the little, you know, they'll work with you because it's new and they realize you're going through it. Uh, after that, then they expect you better have it down. So from uh, Jeanette or Jennifer, from liability standpoint, where within the city, what departments are the biggest um, 
liabilities that the city has? I would say police. We yeah. should probably work on the two and. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, community development too, in terms of the, uh, the which was, is it the land use area? Land use, yeah. land yeah. use area is a, a big one as well. So yeah, we've got quite a few pockets, but I know certainly police is high on the list. Yeah. Constant threat, so it would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have good insurance. Yeah, we do. <laughs> that's why they audit us and make sure our policies and standards are in place. And adopting best practices is really what we're about. So that's the push for this accreditation. You'll hear about something else in another department that's you know, all about best practices. So just keep pushing it. Let's make sure that the guys that we give badges and guns and bullets to, we're doing the, the best we can to do, the guys and gals. Well, Does the accreditation buy you anything like um, Jeanette's wellness policy in, in, for, in terms of discounts or things from AWC or? I think there is a little discount from for being accredited, like maybe a thousand dollars. Yeah, that would be more. And actually, WCIA yeah. offers um, yeah. certain reimbursements on an annual basis for like the. Um, uh, the EVOC training or um, uh, myself going to certain trainings and, and such. Um, so we do get financial benefits through them for, for certain things that various departments can do over the course of a year. Is this accreditation specifically? That I don't know. That I don't know. WASPIC accreditation on that? Um, yeah, I can't recall. Is that on the list? Mm -hmm. Okay, then yes. Yep. The answer would be yes. Yeah. So EVOC is one. Yep. WASPIC accreditation mm -hmm. is another. And I think there's one other that we do. Yeah. Interesting tidbit I heard, I don't know, two or three years ago, and I think it was from somebody within WCIA. Anyway, uh, the largest liability that is experienced by municipal organizations of any type are backup accidents. Mm -hmm. The amount of money paid out and claims paid out just for backing up the i.e. our officers or our employees backing into property and or other vehicles is far and away the leading cause of claims. We've actually, uh, Sergeant Raynan is an EVOC instructor, and we've put on our own EVOC just because of that. When you, a normal EVOC for us would be done out of PIR. Uh, there's several components to it the high speed maneuvering and the backing but it's been our experience that it's the slow backing turning things that have gotten us into trouble and that's where we focus so we go about every other year out here to PIR uh, which we really don't have a area where we're going to be doing too much of a high speed, high speed pursuit type activities so for us it's more slow driving skills that where we've had our, our Incidents. I I just read actually <laughs> on the order of seventy five percent of all motor vehicle insurance claims, not just public but private, involve being in reverse. The dollar amount is not that high, but the number yeah. is. Evox. The other activity we do there is the spike strip training. Sometimes live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they got to practice every real couple weeks ago. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so uh, for code enforcement, uh, you know, we have before, or will be bringing before uh, council soon, uh, chronic nuisance ordinance, which will allow us to uh, go after certain areas or residents or businesses where we've had chronic problems. Uh, this somewhat came out of some problem houses that we've been dealing with that's been hard for us to, to do anything with now <coughs> other than try and get cooperation from the owner and but technically they're not really doing anything on the outside wrong or we can't figure out a way to get in to tie some type of criminal activity to where we could do something but this new ordinance allows us to impose penalties if it's drawing too much police attention. In other words, so many police calls within a three-month period or within a year's period 
then we can start leveling some type of a civil fine. Does that potentially turn into probable cause? It, it could. Um, As you're aware, there's a, there's a house in my neighborhood that's an ongoing problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I know that probable cause has been the limitation on being able to do much of anything there. It's hard. Uh, we, with one of the problem residents we've had, we reached out to the drug task force to help us. And they sat, and of course, the, the two or three days that they sat and monitored the property, not a lot was going on. So they said, well, there's no drug activity there. But yet we know there is. Yep. So this will at least give us some teeth. Uh, I've spoken to, uh, this ordinance came out of Yakima. Yakima got it from Seattle. And uh, Yakima said it's been very successful for them. The other thing that we have right now with code enforcement is the limited uh, commission for Sherry so that she can assist in writing parking tickets. So this will be very helpful for us. We have numerous par parking complaints throughout the city, whether maybe it's in the downtown area or certain areas in the periphery. And honestly, sometimes for the officers to get to it, it's hard. And this will give Sherry the ability to pick that piece up and, and help out with some of the parking enforcement. I think it's worth asking the city to look, city attorney to look into the possibility of expanding that commission to cover, for example, we have a new vapor devices law, uh, ordinance, but that, but also cigarettes and tobacco and smoking, especially in bars um, and other kinds of that kind of enforcement that just seems to me to fit better with code enforcement than it does police officer so I, it, it just strikes me as being worth looking into sure. whether we can go there or not I have no idea I can have that conversation with Scott And uh, one of the things we're looking at, this is something that I've been excited about, uh, is the uh, department statistics. It's been something that I, I, we're trying to deliver to council, and, and I, I know you want it, and, and every time we get close, uh, a program changes, and then all of our data is different. But uh, I was working with uh, Chief Richardson at, at Battleground, and there's software from uh, Blair Analytics that Vancouver uses that offers uh, online mapping and reporting. And we believe that we can get into this within budget, uh, fairly inexpensively. We get more partners. We're looking at Camus, Battleground, and ourselves to get into this. Uh, VPD has the server, so all we need is the software. And then we'll be able to just auto-generate this. <laughs> and post it on our web page. You'll be able to look at that page and just see where all the different criminal activity is taking place in town. So it allows us to kind of maybe focus in those areas. But at least it's, it's data that we have not been able to re reliably supply on a consistent basis that I'm excited about. So uh, Chief Richardson was working on a demo with uh, Blair. And I'll have to check with him, see when that's going to be set up. Would that be kept confidential or would that be needing to no. be open to the public? It would be open to the public. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to pinpoint it. You can go on Vancouver's website and you can see that right now. Portland oh. Police has a similar yeah. one that uh, actually shows you active, uh, active hmm. scenes at a given point or for stay out of this area or hmm. Hello, we've got 12 streets blocked, go a different direction, but if you go on there, it has active uh, stuff happening as it happens. I don't know how it gets input, but. Does it mean it's, it's active, like live, real time? Portland's is. Yeah. Wow. I would see, I yeah, think this that would be kind of dangerous. It probably be live, but it would be maybe a summary as things get posted uh, on. Statistics uh, and trends. Right. Oh, okay. 
So right now you can look, we get uh, an intel brief from VPD that comes in like on a weekly basis and they show you the mapping of certain areas in, in their uh, precincts and where vehicle prowls have taken place and robberies and daytime. So it was similar data to like that would be available to us, but nothing real time. What is the greatest crime issue you deal with in Washougal? Probably, well, there's two or three of them. I was going to say you could probably break those into different categories. Categories. Uh, and some aren't really necessarily criminal. Uh, certainly, assaults are big, theft, and dealing with uh, mentally ill. I'm sorry. Mentally ill. So you have a, a population that have a mental illness, and then you have some that are that are homeless, and and then they'll add some type of substance abuse to that that really creates some problems for us. Um, probably those areas. I mean, speeding's always been a big issue in traffic, in traffic enforcement. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking of like a prosecutable crime. Yeah, well, uh, that's a whole different bucket. <laughs> what, what crime? Prosecutable. Oh, yeah. Okay. Biggest danger to your officers, the mentals and domestic violences? Mm -hmm. Those by far. We've had some very uh, scary incidents in the last couple of weeks, just for officer safety. Uh, the <laughs> most recent one was the one that they were involved in the pursuit, that this person was actually sitting in our parking lot watching and uh, just waiting for an officer to come out. We've had... With a weapon. Yeah. Reportedly with weapons. Yeah. So we have since, well, I guess it was before that, about two months ago, if on the east and west entrances to the police department, there was clear glass that you could actually, particularly at night, make it really easy to see inside the building, see who's moving around. And we had that changed over to a frosted glass, so now you can't see in as well. We have cameras, but if someone's knocking on that door, you can't always tell who's there. Uh, there's like a little peepholes on there now. But, uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just some different people out there that are out and about that have some difficulties. And uh, anytime you have somebody that has some type of a mental illness and they're also uh, under the influence of, of drugs, it's, they're very dangerous. And certainly this last incident, uh, I was very proud of the way our officers handled that. They did an outstanding job. They, they called things off when they were supposed to call things off, and they re-engaged when they were supposed to re-engage. And uh, that easily could have had an uh, awful outcome to it. But uh, we were very lucky on that one. A lot of that's our training. I mean, they, they, uh, they do a good job. <clears throat> Do you need, or would you want, kind of airlock doors to the to the building, so you let somebody through a first door and then you've got them in a locked space where you can look at them? At some point in time, we would probably have some type of a, maybe a metal detector before we allow somebody in, inside. You know, anybody can get into the the main lobby area. Right. But for you to get into a secure environment, you know, we have signs up. There's no firearms allowed by anybody but the officers inside the inside the security area. I know some some places I've seen do that. I'm, I was thinking particularly about, about banks and jewelry stores where they will have, you go through a door, but then you're in a space that's a locked space. Somebody has to key a, a switch to let you in or out either door mm -hmm. and they can do metal detection or whatever it is they want to do to look at somebody before they let them into a secure environment. Armored cars services have been doing that for decades. And I, I just, do we need that? I don't know that we need that yet. We are looking at maybe getting some ideas on what, maybe fencing the, the parking area. And even that's not 
a complete answer to it. If someone wants to cause harm to us, uh, they're going to find a way to do it. But to keep just people from milling around the patrol cars and hiding within the perimeter or where the cars or the officers are coming <coughs> and going, because you don't think anything about it. You think of just going out to my car and then, boom, there's somebody there. Um, that would probably be maybe the first step. Well, kudos to your officers. They showed uh, extreme restraint in uh, all of that situation, and obviously that involved, in the end, involved a lot more jurisdictions than just ourselves. So thankfully it had a, as best an outcome as it could. Uh, any council members that uh, received those updates or saw the press releases, if you want to talk with the chief or commander Cook on either one on more of the particulars of what all happened and what wasn't in those press releases, feel free to do that. Um, chief, you mentioned something earlier about homelessness and that comes up and I, I you know I've been on the council now for almost three years and I have not heard much discussion of homelessness in Washougal what could you describe what the problem is or what kind of things you encounter this summer seemed like it was awful and most of the problems were with from my perspective were with uh, a half a dozen individuals or, or less that uh, were sleeping out kind of on the benches there across from City Hall or under the bridges or in the tunnel and you know we're just some of them uh, had substance abuse issues as well so we're trying to deal with that piece and we can only do so much with them um, we can't really restrict them from certain areas if they're causing problems or they're you know, impeding traffic or causing a nuisance, we can deal with it. If they're sleeping or hanging out where they shouldn't be, we can deal with it. But they just have been out there, and I don't know uh, what the answer is for that. Mm -hmm. What the good answer is? Y yes. Do we need a sit lie ordinance? You know, vagrancy ordinance, or I'm sorry, a vagrancy ordinance? Do we have a vagrancy ordinance? <clears throat> we do. It's pretty old. Is it, is yeah. it enforceable? I, they, that's, a, that's the question. Yeah. Vagrancy is difficult in court cases, but mm -hmm. the thing that ha that they have been able to uphold is it makes it a, a violation to sit or lie on a sidewalk or in an entryway or in a public park. You've got some issues with that, but, but uh, they're... I know Los Angeles now has a pretty strong sit-lie ordinance that I've been reading about. Um, it was a major topic in, on Oahu when I was there. And it, I, I You're going to be homeless. That's a place to be homeless. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> tropical climate. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but, but there's some ordinances like that. I think Portland has one. I don't know how strong it is. Um, but just just things like that would, would keep people from lying on a bus bench. I think in our case, it, from everything that I've been told from uh, various members of staff, what the officers and other staff are doing so far seems to work. It just doesn't always work with folks that forget that they were told yesterday that they can't do what they're doing today. And it's a fine line. I mean, do we want somebody sleeping outside City Hall at 2 in the afternoon? Probably not. If it's 20 degrees and freezing rain and everything else and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and that person's just trying to get out of the freezing rain to somewhere that's a little bit drier, you know, there's part of me that says, as long as they're not vandalizing the building, have at it. So it, same thing with the, the shelters up at the park, that kind of stuff. It, you know, it's all a time and circumstance and you know, that type of thing. And, especially in a smaller community because we just don't have the resources and we're so close to Vancouver that does have more resources but because of the situation we're so far away from Vancouver. You know, we've tried to reach out to with one individual with their family and had communicated with her mother who is in Texas and said you know I would love to have her home I've got a, a mobile home or on acreage she can stay here but she just didn't want the help and this is some for some, this is their choice of their lifestyle, uh, but 
you know, we can certainly look into what we can do with that. It doesn't if, hurt. If we need one, yeah. then, but if we don't, we don't. So there's um, the issues of homelessness that don't rise to the level of needing to call somebody out or staff feeling unsafe or that type of stuff are more prevalent in the community than what you would think. And I want to make sure and recognize Rose. Uh, a year and a half ago or so, we had uh, Chuck Carpenter here in town who asked for a meeting to talk about homelessness and the big problem that we have with it. And silly me, I went, what homeless problem? You know, talk to the police department, yep, we've got the frequent flyers, but we don't really know that there's a problem. We'll come to find out there is a big homeless issue mm -hmm. within the community, and the schools track it like crazy. They've always known yep. that it's been an issue. And uh, since that time, uh, Rose has done a phenomenal job keeping together a working group on a monthly basis that now, well, even from the start, was uh, also including some of the folks from Clark County and Vancouver coming this way because surprise, there just aren't a lot of working groups that are working with the uh, homeless issues, whatever those may be. And Rose has done a, a huge effort in keeping a lot of those going and keeping that group on task. So thank you, Rose. Yeah. We've even got some processes in place like emergency blankets in the, in the winter time and different things that we can initiate now that we didn't have a year or two years ago, so. The refuel Fridays it's that we're doing right through the, the winter and spring. Michelle? I have two questions. Where is the closest homeless shelter? Is there something provided by the city of Vancouver where people can be get a you know overnight stay or anything like that? I don't know of any that the city has. The cities don't provide. That is, city don't. Okay. Share. Share. Sure. Uh, BHA has a shelter. Some okay. churches. Some churches. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question was, if you're having an enforcement problem, do you call this non-emergency dispatch number or do you? dial Sherry's number that's listed on the website, you know, for parking issues and enforcement stuff like that? Uh, for parking issues, I, I would just call uh, the 911 number. I think Cress is working on a non-emergency number where you can call in for that type of thing. Hmm. But we encourage... 912 would be an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we encourage uh, city workers, when you see something, don't call our office. Just call 911 hmm. and you'll get a, a quicker response. And so, what's this non emergency dispatch number used for then? On the well, website? you could certainly use it for some. Yeah, Is that, that the be, office then? What, what's the number that's listed? 691 uh, 4461. That's, that's dispatch. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. So, you can call that. We have a lot of deer in our neighborhood. What happens if they're hit by a car or injured? Do we dial 911? Mm -hmm. That's a, okay for a 911 phone? Mm -hmm. We get those quite frequently, and generally what happens is uh, if the, the animal is deceased, then uh, Public Works has been good helping remove those. Mm -hmm. If it's injured, then uh, it comes upon either ourselves or animal control to dispatch the animal. Yeah, I wondered about that, because we have a lot of them over my neighborhood. Anything else? Other questions for Chief Mitchell? Thank you. Okay, we're falling a little bit behind, but Mitch is going to do a phenomenal job. And then once Mitch is done, I think we're going to do a little bit of a working lunch if we're ready for lunch and give everybody a break to bring stuff back and start right into the afternoon session. So, Mitch. Now for something completely different. Um, <laughs> we're moving, uh, just uh, read kind of uh, what we're going to talk about here. I'm going to, uh, for those that are familiar with my presentations in the past, on, on particularly numbers, I'm going to go through that uh, for year end on um, the building and planning and the budget wise. And then uh, briefly talk about uh, my work plan as moving forward. So. In looking at the, the numbers uh, on the building side, you'll see that uh, we did 82 single family last year, down uh, 21 from uh, the year before. Uh, so a little, we fell off a little bit there. Same on, uh, on duplex, uh, re-roofs up a bit, as well as additions and remodels were up a bit. Uh, interesting, we are at 11 uh, permit single family out the door uh, January, February this year, which is on pace with what we did in 13. So 
uh, that is uh, a little bit of encouragement. And also on the uh, land development side for, for lots, if you will, there are developments that are falling off. The besting is their plats are about to expire, so we're anticipating a, a couple of those to be running through the door, one of which is the Schmid on the uh, east side of um, 32nd that we've had some people inquiring about recently and how that they would get that moving forward, as well as everything going up LeBron, the River Walk Spyglass development uh, in there. So those are expiring pretty soon here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's where we are on building permit and looking at other permits related to building. Uh, everything, as you can see, from 13 to 14 is up with the exception of plumbing down a few, but um, again, uh, good numbers, you know, still uh, moving quite along and, and keeping busy. Uh, along those lines of keeping busy, inspections uh, continue to uptick and uh, plan reviews uh, down just a few, uh, but uh, you know, we sit with Tom is our inspector and our plans examiner, and he is uh, doing a phenomenal job uh, for us, uh, as all of the building staff are. Uh, the last part, in looking at evaluation, or, uh, uh, total valuation, you, you, well, we were down you know, the 21 permits, so we were down a little bit on the, uh, uh, from 13, uh, almost uh, just over 3 million uh, short in that uh, respect. Down a little bit on commercial, the commercial the year in 13, we had the, the food and season building, a much larger building. Really last year we had the, the auto zone, much smaller uh, type of thing, so that you'll see that uh, value down a bit. Do you, you see any, you know, I, I'm a little surprised that there was, seems to be a, have been a little dip between 13 and 14 in building. Is that it kind of runs counter to what you're hearing about what's going on nationally. Is this something that's common in the other cities around here? Or? I, I think, no, I think that what we have, um, we've had a lot of kind of uh, infill, I'll use that for lack of a better word, of little blots here and there just kind of getting picked up. Um, the, the two of the big, the, the, the river watch that I talked about that along Lebrun, that has been in, in holding with uh, a builder uh, for a while now. It actually ended up going back to the developer, and I think it was really due to the time constraints of getting that thing finaled. And so, I think you had some reservation. And those people were stretched. They were they were building in Ridgefield. They're you know they're building in Vancouver, and so they had some holdings out here. I think what I, if I if I'm reading the tea leaves right, I think what they've done is now given it back to the developer to run that through, get it done, and then that portion will be back for the builders to pick up on that. Okay. When you say a, a, a plat is expiring, what does that mean? You have to start over from zero, or yep. can you renew it? Nope. Well, you there are provisions that, um, depending on how, if you've started the final plat process or final engineering process, then you can extend, um, which is what I anticipate occurring on the, the two that I mentioned. Uh, but if you, you let your plat expire and you haven't done anything, then you start over. In the permitting process, they don't necessarily yes. have to start over the design process and all of that. No, I mean, assuming the regulations are somewhat similar and, and things like that, they, they may have all the stuff ready to go. Before, it, before it's expired, can you come in and renew or you? <clears throat> uh, we have provisions for extension, but you have to do some work. You have to have, they've had to make a good faith effort to actually move it forward. You recall that uh, at the at the state level, it, it was a five-year vesting. It, that got extended to seven years, then it went to nine years, and then it went to ten years. And so now we are back, beginning of this year, we're back to five-year. And so we have a lot of those that were, you know, that are getting towards the end of that ten-year time time frame there. So That's it on the building side. Looking planning wise, uh, we're, we're, uh, our type ones were down uh, a couple, uh, but the, you know, the type twos uh, and uh, were up quite a bit. That's our short plats and site plans. We did see a lot of that um, in, in 14, which again I think leads to you know, some of the construction and the building that uh, to come. 
I'll, I'll take this opportunity to really kind of talk about what I, you know, looking towards the future a little bit. We've, we've had a lot of tire kicking uh, within the city, uh, really relating to, to Steiger World. We've had some very good meetings with folks at the port um, and with Creta, and um, it, there is a very real possibility that phase one of Steigerwald will be locked up by the end of this year. Um, and with a lot of the um, phasing of that coming in uh, at the end of 16, by the end of 16, with some really exciting things uh, coming in there. So when they, when the, the phase two is fully done, does the port have any place else to expand to, or is that the limits for them? Oh, no. Well, uh, it, there's 120 acres out there. Mm -hmm. uh, phase one is only 40. Is it 40? Yeah. Uh, 40 acres, and so then we have two phase 2B, two 2A, two 3, 4. I mean, they, they, they say there's still room. Yeah, there's, they still have room. Okay. But it's still only 120 acres. Yeah. Right. Right. Once they and get to 100. They're, they're done with property. My understanding is that they're done with properties that they currently own in either community, notwithstanding, and it won't do us any good, notwithstanding growth. I mean, they can do developments that grow field of other types than what they necessarily have out there now on property that they own. But it won't do anything for the city of Washington. No right. currently going to anything for the city of Kansas. So yeah, right, okay. <coughs> I, I, don't, I don't believe there's any other property for them to even purchase in the industrial park itself that is immediately adjacent to it other than private properties that they've sold. Yeah, they have the... There's one piece that's outside the city, but it's, that is in their holding that they can annex in about 20 acres, I think. But that's it. And that's not where we have the well field. No, okay. that's up north of that. Good job. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I really there, there's I think there's a lot of exciting things, that, especially with that in the industrial park. I'm I'm uh, even just this last you know two three weeks of discussions uh, with that area. I'm uh, very, uh, very promising things uh, happening out there. Uh, looking, uh, pairing revenue uh, from 13 to 14, uh, you, obviously we had a little bit down. I think that that's understandable with uh, being down permit uh, <coughs> the family as well, uh, but you know, still overall meeting uh, our, our budget, uh, if you will, we were off a little bit on the license and permits. Uh, I, I would do want to mention that because when Jen gets to her part on the fees, these line items are for CD only. There are some other things that are grouped, there's business license that are get grouped in licensing and permits, and then there's right-of-way permits and other things that get grouped into the planning fees, and so I took those, those are not in these numbers, so that's when they're all in the big picture one, these numbers will be higher. Uh, but these are just uh, related to, to CD. Has there been any tire kicking in the downtown core? Um, yes, um, I, I, I've had, I had a, a very good conversation with some folks right on the doorstep down here. Um, and, um, you know, with that, um, around the old mortuary building, those that, uh, the red pa pa property through there. Um, but beyond that, and then we have, obviously we've had the Angelo uh, property that came in for pre-app um, for apartments there. Um, but that's, that's really about it right now from on the, in the downtown portion. You do have some investors that are coming in and buying up existing buildings in the downtown, which is positive. Mm -hmm. Are they investors that have already invested in downtown or are they new investors? Uh, even the ones that have invested are still new. So, uh, looking forward, uh, looking to, uh, to the work plan, uh, obviously the uh, big one that we're working on now is our update to the Growth Management Act uh, and our internal consolidation related to that. I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of talk a little bit what that has been going on at the county level. Uh, we had a work session last Wednesday with the Board of County Counselors and um, they have presented an alternative. Uh, you'll recall that we were out uh, 
split the EIS and we had alternatives one, two, and three, uh, which is standard under uh, an EIS. And the council, uh, the county council came back with a uh, alternative four is what they're calling it. Um, and it's, it's really only one counselor that's pushing that issue. Um, but uh, it, it, they basically put the brakes on the EIS. Um, they've uh, had some discussions about uh, policies that they want to develop related to urban holding and timing. They feel that people are being left in limbo. And uh, the city's voiced concern about uh, that and that our urban holding and our urban growth boundary is our 20-year plan. That's what we look at. That's, that's the timing of how we would uh, look at, how we plan for it and we look for it. Um, there is the alternative for, which in my mind is not really an alternative, it's just, it's just showing us what lots are non-conforming in the rural area, um, is uh, it'll, it's, I'm not really sure what's the driving force behind it. I've said that a couple of times at workshops. Uh, what we as the cities have been really been pushing is, look, we need to, we need to keep moving forward. We need to, we have a time constraint that we need to, to meet. And um, if this is going to add more lots to rural area, it can throw numbers off and it could mean that we need to do a full blown EIS. And so you may hear and read in the paper some of that discussion and I just want you guys to be aware that um, it, it's kind of, they've pumped the brakes. We have open houses scheduled for March 25th up in Richfield. Uh, April 1st up in Hawkinson because it's really directed at the rural folk and getting their um, uh, input. Uh, it is, it was at the count, at the Board of County Counselors, uh, their uh, meeting, it was said to be an open house, uh, although on one of the counselors Facebook page, it's stated it's a town hall. And so we don't really know what form it's going to take if there's just kind of discussion or if we're going to have a, uh, you know, a full blown, uh, we may actually have to expand our uh, venue, if you will. Um, so that's, uh, if you have any other question specifics around that, please uh, just feel free to contact me. When was that date you were talking about, the town, this town hall slide? March, uh, March 25th. In, in Richfield and uh, April 1st in Hawkinson. Okay. You should get a chance on Monday to talk about the Norway request. The yes, I did. I, uh, I did uh, thank the, the board for uh, allowing our uh, request and it is on it is on alternative what they've called alternative 3.1. So that is uh, that is the county's staff planning staffs alternatives that that's the difference is that the alternative four and four point one two three four are all county councilor stuff the planning staff hasn't even seen it it doesn't get there so we're 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 trying to f it, it is somewhat of a moving target and we fear that they're going to come back and open the door at the hearing which is april 14th i believe open the door again about population number going up, job number going up, and so, which will kind of blow everything up, yes. So, if you have any other questions, uh, uh, happy to take those offline. Shoreline master uh, plan update, uh, we the draft is with uh, the planning commission. Uh, they did extensive work moving that forward. I need to get that thing done um, and, and you folk uh, uh, and that is my uh, goal this year. Downtown uh, plan phase two, uh, you're all aware of what we did in the downtown uh, with the street improvements and uh, whatnot. We have been, uh, actually for the last couple of years, really looking at how do we in, in, you know, extend that vision down Main Street. Uh, we. Uh, put some renderings out of, or requested some renderings about how that would look and how we would continue that look. Uh, the code itself provides us with some infrastructure from some street um, work that we need to do um, through there, particularly the Addy A Street extension uh, is one that's uh, 
um, very very specific within there. So, you know, working with that group as well, uh, the downtown group. I think we'll talk about that later. But um, <coughs> and on all those all those issues related to downtown um, and parking and whatnot. But that's uh, uh, the the phase two is what we're calling it. Excuse me. When is our bond paid off? For the phase one. Still got. A, Four million dollars, I think. Twenty twenty six ish. Twenty twenty six. Oh, it's just around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, you got three million out on that. Three and a half million. Yeah, that's the one that we just refinanced. I think it's about three to three point five. Just pay down half. Uh, the other thing that. Uh, that I'm working on is uh, related to fees and fee study and, and really I think this is the start and then we'll work from to the other uh, divisions within the, the city but uh, what I have done so far is we've uh, kind of grouped all the fees together um, from county and uh, other municipalities uh, within the county we're probably going to break get some more that are out a little bit further but Really making sure that, um, I mean, I am aware of some that we may be too high on, but others that we are probably too low and maybe leaving money on the table. And so uh, starting with that to, to, to make sure that we, uh, you know, get a good cost of service um, policy and... and um, These are impact fees or... No. Oh, okay. Fees, not impact fees. I've done impact fees too, though I have that grouped together. Uh, employment Center, you're aware of uh, those regulations uh, that came to you before uh, they are going back to uh, Planning Commission, so still tracking on that. Uh, annexations, the petitions will be going to the, that those folks, the, the property-specific petitions will be going out to those folks, and we will be moving forward with annexation with moratorium on the Employment Center. Um, I will continue to monitor all train train issues and as well as marijuana issues um, as they move, especially now as moving through the legislature. And the last, this is the, the one that uh, I think probably in the 10 years that I've been here, we every time I talk about it, it's file retention and storage, really running out of it and, and working on how we're going to you know move stuff up to the state. and. Um, and where we're going to, uh, we've added more file cabinets back here behind Teresa for building permits, but we're, we're running out of room, so um, that's what I'll be working on. Questions for Mitch? You did very well. Thank you. <laughs> Rose, you've got lunch ready? Yes. Before lunch is ready. So if we want to take uh, 10 minutes or so and kind of file through the break room next door and there's sandwich makings, there's fruits, there's chips, there's cookies, there's, there's stuff. Um, and hopefully bring it back this way. We're going to try and get caught up on both David and Jennifer before we uh, get to Paul here at 1 o'clock. I got one slide. So these are just some very specific projects that Rose and I are working on um, with others. Um, beyond just the general administrative responsibilities that we have. Um, as you know, the council funded um, a little bit for enhanced communication in response to uh, what we had in the community survey. Um, we recruited for it. I believe we're in the final stages of having someone come in and help us as a social media and communications intern to help us enhance communication. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. It may not be limited just, it's you know not just social media, but communication in general. Um, I listed e-government here just because one of the things that we're pushing administratively with our departments is um, uh, enhanced communication to citizens through e-government. Some of those uh, applications that you heard about over the last couple of weeks basically not only do they improve customer service, they enhance communication because it's information that's available and we're communicating that information through those applications. We still stand ready, uh, kind of behind the scenes in terms of uh, supporting our, uh, I guess we could still call it a, the fledg fledgling 
getting getting themselves going downtown association uh, you'll recall there's a few thousand dollars in appropriation that you made and we're waiting to hear from them about some of their priorities they've got some goal setting and priority setting sessions that are upcoming so we look forward to hearing back from them and we'll be working with them uh, Rose and actually Theo uh, myself uh, and Jen and Megan all work on the tourism promotion. There's a lot of different parts and pieces to that, but we have the contract with Renee. Uh, you enhanced the funding for that uh, considerably this year. And so Rose and, and the group were working on managing that contract and, and doing things on tourism. I just want to say I think Renee is fantastic. Mm -hmm. She's hardworking. She's Incredible. I mean, she does a very good job, and we're seeing things pop up around that hadn't been here before. So, I just want to put a shout out for her here. It, it, Let me that. second that, but also say one of the huge advantages is that she's in, also engaged with the school district and all kinds of other things going on, so she can put pieces together in a way that no one can that doesn't have that overview. Right. And she's the only one that I can think of in the community who has her fingers in so many different things that she can really put together that big community piece. Right. And we fund her primarily out of tourism dollars. So we have to be we have to report on that and we're audited on that. We have to be very careful about, you know, the dollars that we uh, that fund that have to be related to increasing stays in the hotel there are some things that she does for us where there's this overlap that you're referring to and when that happens we we're very careful to find a different bucket of money like some of the general administrative money that we have for professional services we use for that um, so that we make sure we're tight on that little piece but she she kind of overlaps things but a lot of what she does really could be tied to tourism, but we every time something comes through, we, we run it through a filter. Uh, Jen is very helpful for that, and uh, Megan as well, to make sure that we're okay with all of that. And then, because it's a long session this year, le leg legislative advocacy is an important thing that we're doing, and we're in, right in the middle of that. Um, intergovernmental relations, all, all of the different agreements that we have and that we're working on. Um, <coughs> is just part of the portfolio. So that's really it for me. Um, Questions? Well, let's go. Uh, Lloyd Halverson is incredible. He's great. Mm -hmm. What he is bringing in Olympia to our community. Yeah. And that's, I think that's just so good that he's using his experience and years to go up to, da, up to Olympia and help us. Hmm. That's, and I'm very appreciative. <laughs> He's in D.C. right now. Today, yeah. We didn't. We're not paying him to be in D.C. Mm -hmm. He's there for uh, because of his role in leadership and on a board in another organization. But while he's there, um, they're gracious to allow him when he has audience to slip in some advocacy for our communities, our family of communities, Kamaswashu and the port. Well, his reputation and credibility is really so solid here in Southwest Washington. Yeah. And, and just to follow up on uh, both Lloyd and Renee, um, your <coughs> comments are very welcome. Thank you. Um, if any counselors ever have a question, though, because both of them serve multiple organizations. Mm -hmm. Renee has a contract with the school. She has a contract with ourselves. She has a contract with CUIDA. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last year she did s I think the port, port was going to look at using her for some stuff, but I think they brought somebody else in. Anyway, I don't um, remember. Lloyd is here for us, for Camus, for the port. If ever anybody has any questions about what we're being charged or is somebody being double dinged or any of that, don't hesitate to ask Jennifer to see Billings. Uh, both of those individuals are extremely, um, I think accurate and give a lot of diligence to what they put in there and make sure that they're costing things correctly and not in areas that will even begin to look like they're getting paid by two organizations for the same thing. Right. So, and, I, and, and, I, the, and the money that we're spending on both of those is so small for what we're getting right. is it's a tremendous deal. Right. And as we look at, you know, the future and 
depending on how capital facilities financing changes over time at the state level, you know, we need to look at what are we investing in the advocacy piece over time. But I just want to express my appreciation to the council, the mayor and the council for providing that support to the administrative <coughs> team. Um, I mean, it could really be a full-time job just keeping track of all of that and contacting people and emails and just all of that work and having the assistance uh, really, really helps. So I really appreciate it. All right. We had a workshop a couple weeks ago um, where we presented the eGov and the OpenGov, and those are both doing really well. Um, we've had quite a few folks, utility folks, sign up for the eGov. Um, we had a couple of glitches, but we easily worked through them with IT. And um, those are moving ahead full steam. The open gov, uh, we are still working on the press release to issue for these uh, new online services. But in the soft launch that we've done with open gov in the last 90 days, there's been 79 unique visitors um, that have stayed online for an average of four minutes and 30 seconds. And three fourths of those were from the Washougal area. And then there were some from the California area, which is where the company is based out of, so I think they're promoting our site as well. And then we had a training for folks uh, Wednesday, I believe, um, to show how to log through and look and drill down. And I have that available if anybody wants to watch it, because he taped it while he was doing it so that we could share it with others that weren't able to log on at that time. And the OpenGov is the financial transparency information. We'll be uploading that through the end of the year now that we're going to present the year-end data to everyone today. And um, it's really easy back end for Megan to upload the information. So it's pretty cool to see people utilizing it. And hopefully more and more will log on and do so. Uh, Staffing-wise, we're still down one staff member. Um, excuse me. We hired Crystal, and she has been here for roughly two weeks, I think. She's doing great. She had the rains Thursday and Friday because Pam was off and did a great job catching on really quick. Worked with payroll with Megan um, this last pay cycle. So we're very excited for, for her and are glad that she's on board. We're going to work with getting uh, probably a temporary person during the tenure of uh, Jessica's probationary period with Trevor. We're going to um, get a new temporary person in for a little bit and see how that goes and move forward down that path. So we won't stay down at one person. We do want to get another individual in there to help with the phones and all of that so that we can work on our projects for the year, financials are coming up, and all those sorts of things. Megan's currently, oh, go ahead. I, I was just, where did Crystal come from? She actually worked for uh, Killian. Mm -hmm. At the oh. Port of Vancouver oh, okay. area, she managed some of this. She actually managed the crossing building. Um, funny thing, she was referred to us by Mitchell Kelly, who was mm -hmm. a state auditor that we tried to snag from the state auditor several years ago. <laughs> and he declined and stayed with the state auditors, but he actually approached her and thought she'd be a good fit. And she's turned out really well. Um, she's very friendly, very open, and fits in with the team well. So the other day, I was in my office and I heard, I think you're pulling my chain. I'm going to go ask Jen. So she's already figured Lee out and realized <laughs> that he's kind of a jokester. Uh, the funny part was it was true. We do have panic buttons. She didn't believe him that we had the panic buttons. So <laughs> and, she's and, well versed in that. And now. then you mentioned Jessica. Jessica was promoted to Mickey's position. So she's actually <coughs> over with Trevor now. Oh, where's, where's Mickey? Retired. She retired? Oh, I didn't know that. Traveling the world. What? Traveling the world. There you go. Thank you. I was out of the loop on that. <laughs> yeah, she retired the end of January, and then there's a little bit of overlap for trading with Jessica. And Jessica's very excited for the opportunity, and from what I understand in here, is doing a great job. Yes, it's going quite well. Oh, good. So, wasn't ideal for finance to be down two people. <laughs> I was but say, I'm <laughs> the timing is what it is. Uh, I jinxed it in my review. I wrote fully staffed, going to hit 2015 running, and then bam. And three days later. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. But 
Um, we're doing really well. Crystal's doing great. Um, the team works well together, so it's always important to find that right fit with the team um, because everybody has spent so much time talking about what their department's up to and finance is integral in all of those things. So in addition to supporting all the capital projects with uh, public works and uh, police working through fire with Camus, all those things are some of the big top priorities that we're working on. We're also going to submit our budget to GFOA. Um, the 2015 budget we're going to submit for comment in hopes that we would get the award for our 2016 budget. So Megan has been working on that. And the open gov site is actually going to be a huge time saver because it produces so many graphs and the information that they want in that budget submission. So she's pretty stoked and has been working through that the past week while training. So it's been kind of nice. I would just comment, we, we were talking before about the police department's accreditation, and so we've been looking at what are the ways that we can bring best practices into our organization. We want to be uh, reasonable in the timing of that, given our staffing levels and the projects that we're working on. And in this, this program area, really the, the standard for that is the Government Finance Officers Association. Um, they do an award for budgeting and um, basically just like the Chief is looking to get that acknowledgement from the, the professional organization for best practice, that's what Jen is looking to do for this part of what she does. <clears throat> Megan was looking for examples of other submittals and she was having difficulty finding other cash basis entities and the ones that she was finding their budgets were over I think two to three hundred pages so she's gonna we're gonna interpret the checklist ourselves and submit our best package um, not necessarily what other people are doing so it'll be interesting to see what comments we receive and then be able to incorporate those changes for the 2016 budget and have more policy and those types of information in there. When we do get those two accreditations, it would be really neat to have a plaque to put up in City Hall. You do get, I don't know about with, with yours. <laughs> we'll make sure our <laughs> plaque is <laughs> 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 um, I know that the GFOA does issue plaques for those awards. We get a plaque. That's <laughs> an annual. Correct. Yeah. They also have a, a financial statement one, but it's uh, geared toward the full accrual accounting, not for their CAFR. <coughs> and again, just speaking back to the caliber of the folks that, uh, that the city employs, this is no small task for the finance department. Uh, it's been on Jen's own personal list to get this done since we hired her. Um, unfortunately, it's just staffing-wise and timing-wise, everything else, it's kind of kept going back. but. I believe we've now figured out how to successfully be one person down permanently <laughs> and still get this done. Um, don't hold me to that because you know, no, I don't want to be down one person. I understand. <laughs> We're already down one. They, they that would be down two. For the right reasons. So, I mean, <laughs> I promote people all that. That's all yes. good things. Or as people move on to other uh, bigger positions, that's a good thing. But we kind of keep taking the hit. That's because we train everyone so well in finance that they get to promote and go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one bullet that I didn't put on there, this is a year of the state audit. Um, it'll be for two years. It'll be the 13 and 14 review. Um, so I'm assuming that'll be probably in the August, September time frame. No idea what they're going to look at. Um, so I will share that when I find out. <coughs> but they do, the, we do not have to have a federal audit. So they do all of those first because there's a September 30 reporting deadline for that for the feds. So we'll be in there sometime after that, before the end of the year. That's it. And then. All right, so 2014 actual. Our revenues were a little bit above budget. Uh, property taxes came in more than budget. And our overall revenue was up 3.1% from 2013 in the general and street fund. Um, I think the anomaly with the property taxes is that I was only including 
the, the levy, I wasn't including the new construction portion in the budgeting. So, Paul, I worked with him this year, and we actually corrected that for 15. We did include new construction. So I would assume that we won't be over 100%, but you never know. Knock on wood for 15. Um, we tried to correct some of these anomalies that we were seeing. Uh, sales tax is still coming in strong. We did increase our projection for 15. Um, the first two months of 15 have been very nice. They are highest since, I think, 07. So it's coming in pretty strong so far this year. Utility taxes were right, right there a little bit higher. Um, so the bottom line is the revenues all came in a little bit better than expected, which is awesome. Um, you, know, you, you do the budget and, and set it and hope for the best, and we did better than we expected. Um, we did not do the transfer from 120, 125, which is why that other revenue source is at the bottom, the 508 budget, but only 86 actual, um, 86,000. And because the other budgets came in so well and the expenses came in a little less than budget, we were able to not do that transfer and save that for the future years. As I mentioned, expenditures came in a little less, about 98%. <coughs> and here's the breakout by department. Um, one thing to note is the economic development that is higher than budget due to the additional contract that we had with Quita for 14 that the council approved. So that's why it came in, but we were able to absorb that with the other departments coming in under. Um, finance came in under staffing. <laughs> Human resources, we had benefit savings, um, and then the tuition reimbursement wasn't fully utilized for 14. Legal came in a little under. Engineering, we budget for, that's where we budget for the um, reviews that we pass the charges through to the end user through community development. So we never know where that will land. So we usually are under budget in the engineering line item due to that amount. Uh, Parks was over budget due to the pickleball courts. Um, we did only budgeted, I think, 20000 for that, and it came in a little higher. Uh, but all in all, we came in under budget. The police department was able to absorb the radio cost in 14. So that's why they're at 100% of their budget, is we actually purchased those um, during the 14 budget. So for 15, we have a use of reserves identified that um, we're going to talk about in a few slides. But it was a good year. Jen, I have a quick question about the pickleball court. I know that the organization was raising funds or is it, are they still in the process of raising funds to I believe that, so. that shortfall mm -hmm. of the funding? I mean, we're, you know, of course, we have to pay it, but I mean, are they going to be sending yeah. money? My understanding from Mike Wolf is that they're continuing to put on events and saving money to be able to uh, hand more checks over to the city to okay. fulfill their commitment that they made. Right. We got the one check. and. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so, questions, comments? On the utility side, uh, we're tracking at budget. The stormwater revenues exceeded um, due to the storm connection charges. We budgeted kind of low for that because we weren't sure what connections were going to be like, and they they came in significantly higher than budget. Expenditures were both under budget as well. So here's the chart for that. As you can see, the connection fees were double what we expected them to be. And with um, the rate increases, you would it kind of lags a little bit on the month of when they are fully implemented. So that's why it's a little bit higher than budget. But all in all, tracking along according to plan. And you'll recall that the net revenue for the water sewer side is what we're projecting to carry forward to the capital side. That's all part of the rate plan. So <coughs> while it looks like there's a large surplus in the utility side, it's all factored into the rate plan to carry <coughs> forward to the capital expenditures. Then this is the Mambo, all of the funds for all of the year. Uh, the REIT fund is expected. We did expect to use fund balance. Um, but other than that, all of the <coughs> Funds tracked according to plan. 
the debt funds. And then I wasn't going to go into significant detail unless anyone had a question. We did finally close the garbage fund out. Hooray! <laughs> So the bottom line, I believe that's my next slide. No, it's not. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, investment updates are massive earnings in the local government investment pool. <laughs> <laughs> we did open mid-year. Um, so this is it dollar-wise what we earned in the LGIP. We opened a money market with uh, our current bank because we earned more than the, the local government investment pool and we can actually transfer it within our own account which is more convenient than than uh, having to transfer from the treasury um, which is doing pretty well so we've been putting more and more money into this because it is earning more than the local government investment pool our longer term bond holdings um, we have about five million invested here and we made about 30,000 during the year. Yeah, there we go. Excuse me, so the 2014 recap of the General and Street Fund is we ended up with a surplus of approximately $213,000. Uh, again, the police radios were purchased in 14, which we had expected to spend reserves on in 15. Um, and that conversation that we had had at the time of adopting the 15 budget was that the $210,000 for the Lookout Ridge reconstruction, um, we would try to work into the miracle, um, or the, the year end 14, perhaps the miracle of 15 before dipping into actual reserves. Um, but as we discussed earlier, there's been kind of a change in scenarios with the J Street project. And we would like to recommend using the surplus for 14 and the lack of use of reserves for the radio in 15 to shore up the difference in the J Street project and still do that full sidewalk project with the water line. Um, since we're already tearing up the area to put the new piping in, it just makes sense to do the sidewalks at the same time and finish it and not have to do it at a later date. So that would be the staff recommendation is to utilize reserves, reserves, not reserves, for that project. So our, so our commitment <clears throat> when the council was willing to appropriate <clears throat> some reserve spending for one-time capital in the 2014, or excuse me, the 2015 budget for um, that Lookout Ridge project, which was about $210,000, we said, you know, we'll see what happens at the end of 14. Maybe there'll be some savings. And so at the end of 14, you'll put some money into the reserves, and then in 15, we'll spend some money in reserves, but it would net out to something. Well, just coincidentally, the, the year-end number is within $3,000 of the estimated cost. That's an estimate, estimated cost of the Lookout Ridge project. So all else equal with no other changes, no other new information, Basically, the year-end savings in 2014 basically replenishes the reserves to cover the 210 that you appropriated for spending. Net, basically a net zero on that. You had also appropriated spending for the radios of... The reserve portion, I believe, was 147000 but then there was the additional in operational budget for a total of 170000 so we were looking at needing to dip into reserves. We thought we might need to dip into reserves in 15. Mm -hmm. So again, this projecting into 15, $170,000 to take care of the radios. But we were able to do that in 2014. So Lookout Ridge at 210 and 170 for radios are currently programmed reserve spending in 2015. We're adding 213 to the reserves, theoretically, at the end of this year, which just leaves basically that 170. But we don't have to spend that because we already got the radios. Um, we would like to 
do this project. And unfortunately, and it's good news, bad news, right? The bad news is we don't qualify for a CDBG grant for this project. That's the bad news. The good news is we don't qualify for the CDBG <laughs> grant, which means that that part of our community has income levels that are outside of the, the, the target for those funds. So that's also good, that's good news. It just hit us right in the middle of this thing. We can do this project and we will do the utility project because it needs to be done. We need to replace that water line and make the, the add the new services or correct, update the services. That's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, and fire flow. It's a problem for our utility. But boy, while we're out there digging stuff up, which is why we went for the CDBG grant, it would just make so much sense to put in the sidewalk. So. That's our ask is, what do you think? And Jen, I don't know, will it, it doesn't, re, does it require a supplemental budget? They've already appropriated. So we wouldn't have to go back and open the budget up. It would just be an understanding from you that when, that we will bring a contract, when we bring the contract forward, that you would know that some of it would be paid from that. And so probably some kind of action of the council at a future meeting to just sort of say that. Would we need that? Um, I would be more comfortable if we did that and memorialized it in some way so that we have good faith with the contractors who end up getting it in the end that it's right. one that has been specifically approved by the council. Right. So we could we could, do we could package that up. So. so is that still at least for this year going to be coming out of reserves? It's just you're basically mm -hmm. taking the reserve money that yeah. we had designated for radios and this mm -hmm. other <laughs> bridge project. And we're just putting into that instead. And it's and it's three hundred thousand. So we were at about three six three eighty in program. My counselor is shoemaker isn't here because he would have called you a big tease. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to make sure that there's an open discussion though yeah. with everybody in attendance that that's the direction we're going. But um, even the J Street project itself, notwithstanding, when you look at the other projects along Thirty Fourth Street for the Safe Routes to School and the project down on uh, Evergreen Way between Thirty Second, well, Safeway and. 34th, they all start to tie themselves together. And as long as the funding levels at the state level come in at where they've been requested, we've already been approved for those just pending uh, funding from the state. So to have all of those going and to tie in one big block of that and begin to finish off some of those other areas that go directly to two schools is, I think, in light of the schools going through and passing their bond to be able to upgrade yeah. the schools for us to be able to upgrade some of the infrastructure to safely get those kids there is a big piece and if anybody ever has any doubt about some of that go park in the middle of j street in the middle of just a normal afternoon yeah. on what happens up there traffic wise because keep in mind there's an awful lot of kids that come down from the high school that go straight through to 32nd the school buses for i don't know what reason use that as a direct route as well um and then just the normal traffic that's there it's not pretty it's a mess <clears throat> I should have thought of it before, but is there any chance of safe routes to schools for that sidewalk? Not in this cycle. Maybe in the next cycle. I don't know if it would be qualifying. You think it would qualify? Potentially it would qualify. The safe routes that's pending for 34th Street from J to tie into the TIB project at Evergreen and 34th scored exceptionally high. Um, Cycle-wise, we would have to defer at least a year, potentially two years, because the allocated amount for safe routes through DOT continues to be shrunk. I was just thinking it's right up there at Gauze and at the high school, and it, it strikes me as perfect safe routes to schools, but <coughs> I understand the timing problem. Yeah, yeah we could almost pick any of those, though, between uh, K and Evergreen really and pick Hell, up yeah. one of those and pull them off now that you're going to have 32nd and 34th with sidewalks and tie in one midway up the hill. Yeah. So we could talk about it at a workshop too. I don't know that we we're just introducing the concept this afternoon. No, it's cold. It's the first time you've heard about this new information and all of that. So we could try to carve some time out in a workshop coming up if you want to think about it and 
Yeah, this is one I'd like to bring sooner than later, only because right. we've already got staff time into it. Some of it is still fresh. Some of that design stuff is already in in the works before we started to put the brakes on because of the CDPG. So we, we could do it on the 23rd. And, and I would agree it would be good to have a public discussion and a clear decision by council. Mm -hmm. uh, and and therefore sooner rather than later. So we could do it at our very next meeting. And yeah, and you know, you don't need to guess where I'm at on this. Okay, so that ties directly into um, the long-term financial status for the general and street fund. Are, I updated it with the actual estimated for 14. You'll see the 213. Uh, the actual budget for 15, and then uh, we updated the overall growth assumptions for moving forward based on various factors, inflation, how things have come in. We've fine-tuned them slightly to 3% for revenues and 4% for expenditures, so they're still not together, but they're not as bad as they were. So the deficit projected for 16 has come down a little bit, down to 481 it was closer to 600,000 I think last time we talked and so just with the improving economy it is helping our future why do you have the revenues dipping between 15 and 16 there are factors worked in so I took out the remaining we are using fund 125 okay so at the time of putting this together we were spending them in 14 and 15 and didn't have any remaining for 16 Okay. So I have backed off that amount before doing the inflationary factor. At the end of the day, there are numbers. Um, they're real numbers and they're important. I think uh, yeah. one of the things that's always interesting is on a monthly basis, Jennifer is pretty much keeping track of updating these as well. And they do fluctuate as we find out things or large projects come in lower or whatever it happened to be. Arbitrations come in uh, favorably. There are things that, that affect it that she's tracking on a regular basis. I also pulled the one-time uses of reserves off the expense side too for the 16 because those are included in the 15 to make sure that we weren't inflating those. I think the message in this, as you can see, obviously we are required by statute to pass a balanced budget every year, and we do. Um, but you can see in a long term, even though it's no longer about one and a half percent difference between the rate of expenditure growth and the rate of revenue growth, it's a one percent difference. One percent difference is enough to be a structural deficit, and this continues the dynamic for us. And in a stepwise way, we balance the budget every year by making cuts um, where we can. Um, or being flexible where we can. Or being flexible, and so you see us, um, you know, expenditures coming in at 98.2%. The good work of, of your department head team doing everything they can to try to save off of estimated expenditures that we make. Um, <clears throat> so the overall message that municipalities in this state are still dealing with because of some of the constraints on property tax, primarily constraints on property tax revenue at 1% per year, whereas expenditures grow at more than 1% per year, this is, this continues to be a dynamic for communities in Washington and we're not alone we're unique in that regard um, this is Jen's best estimate for what will happen in 2016 it's based on different assumptions we'll see what the, the real things you know what's the arbitration say what do we bargain this year for next year as soon as the arbitration comes in we start over again with them um, 307 um, I'm pleased that that number in 2016 is significantly different than what it was showing when we were starting to do this in 2010. In fact, I think when most of you first met Paul was in 2010 working on this, and the number was much bigger in 2016 than um, that, was, that was the last year of the projection time. 
So I'm thankful for the good work of the team for that. But we still what face it. what it was. Uh, over a million. You know, I can't. We'd have to go back and look at the at the spreadsheets, but. Got them somewhere. I don't know if you remember off the top of your head. I don't, but that was also a projection based on not solving it every year. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, that one percent gap or whatever it was at that time projected. Will be analogous to the 2020. Correct. Right. We got now. Yeah. Right. So it was it was order of magnitude plus or minus a percentage there. Yeah. So of course our pledge is that we will this year, the administration and the council working together, we will deliver a budget that's balanced in 2016. Lots of different options and approaches for that, right? And uh, we'll have to have that conversation again as we move forward. Uh, At the same time, though, in 15 and 16, we're still doing significant projects all throughout the city and throughout our infrastructure, no matter where you look. You know, that to me is the epitome of a healthy community. Right. You know, yes, on paper, we still have some things that show deficits, but I think we're getting a little bit more comfortable and not necessarily crying wolf and always looking at that number because we continue to bring things in under budget. Uh, the budget's under budget. Um, thankfully, for a number of reasons, our uh, revenues coming in are not significantly, but they're over our projected amounts. Um, the sales taxes, everything else, just point to the community is doing well now. And as Mitch can tell you one-on-one, -on -one, we have um, some significant projects coming on that can only help the city improve in the, in the revenue side of the world overall. So kudos to everybody involved, not just department heads, but on down the line for everybody that is continuing to look at, at our bottom line and what it means because, quite frankly, that's where you know those miracles are happening every single year. So we hope that they all continue. We hope that you know, nothing happens in the greater world that starts spinning us back another direction. But for now, the team that you've got in place is doing a phenomenal job on the on the finance side of the community of keeping things moving and reinvesting in the community in a large way. Any questions for uh, Jen on finances or Dave on any of the initiatives that we have underway? Okay. Paul, I'm sorry, Jen took 10 minutes too long. You but know now it's your turn. I think I can make that up. <laughs> <laughs> My goal is to look you. I'm kind of strutting up here. No longer, <laughs> no longer than needed. Um, if you'll allow me, you know, just a couple of other comments on the, the forecast. I work with a, a number of different jurisdictions, and that's not uncommon in terms of the that gap. If you look at it at one percent, it's really a function of what Dave was talking about. Your revenue structure is similar to a lot of other cities. Actually, a lot of other cities have more sales tax or other tax revenues. But for your case, uh, over 40% of your revenue is property tax, right? And it's 1% growth a year plus, we're forecasting, I think, roughly 1% new construction. So that 40% grows at 2% at max a year. Your expense structure is almost 70%, I mean, depending on how you deal with fire, personnel related. And with step increases that are obligated through your contracts and cost of living adjustments that you believe the staff have earned. You know, the average for that is like 3.3% just for the salaries and then healthcare benefits, PERS increase, PERS is gonna increase. It's a, a, you know, a mandate for you. That PERS rate's gonna grow 19% next year from the, what it is today. Your healthcare costs have been stabilized somewhat over the last couple of years, but those aren't in, those. Uh, that good news isn't anticipated to continue. So if you have a growth rate that's anything more than you know two to two percent, three percent, you just create that deficit where your expense growth year to year outstrips your revenue growth because your revenue growth is tied to this one percent plus new construction on the sales tax. Your expense side is tied to the personnel expenses, uh, you know retirement healthcare, those types of costs, step increases that end up growing faster um, than the, the revenue side. So the other comment that I'd make is that if you, you know, I think Jen mentioned this, the 2016 number is really a function of use of that Fund 125 money. There's, there's this sort of one-time adjustment, but after that, it's just 115, 120,000 years. So you're meant to, this should be conservative, right? There should be a conservative nature to those forecasts. 
I think as Jen showed, that you come in under budget by one or two percent. If you come in over budget on the revenues by a half a percent, I mean, you make up that, that one percent deficit every year. So I think it's, you know, it's a reasonable uh, projection to have, but it's also reasonable to assume that management and from, from council policy and management, that it's not uh, a problem that you can't overcome. And I think, you know, as the mayor said, there's still room for these investments that you're making. You've done a lot of good things, even with this kind of, even through the recession, you made a lot of really good investments in your community. And this forecast doesn't mean that you can't do those, continue to do those in the future. So just to put a little bit of context on, on that. Uh, Paul, one other thing before you get started, and I apologize, I went right past my note on it. Uh, so we've done uh, department updates in most departments. The one that obviously is a little bit glaring is uh, fire and EMS. While we no longer have a fire and EMS department within the city of Washougal, yeah. um, Chief Swinhart has called for the uh, joint committee to come together. I believe uh, you're looking at, and I think you're the only one here, sometime into early April to mid April. So we're going to have a what? JPAC. Yeah. Um, I think Chief sent out a note for that uh, just this last week, and I don't think we've arrived on a date. Yeah, and, so and we I haven't seen what, what all is in his agenda, but immediately after that, when they have a chance to meet, uh, we'll ask Chief Swinhart to come in and do an update from fire in general in the city of Washington in particular, so that you've got that uh, information for whatever purposes as well. Great. So on the agenda, we've got this section till uh, 3.30, I think. As I mentioned, I hope we don't necessarily need that long. The real objectives, uh, as we sat down and talked through it, is to twofold. One, to get you talking about sort of what those future things, those future priorities might be. Um, just an exchange. I think you've done, uh, a lot of the work that you've done focuses on priorities within a certain area, whether it's transportation capital, parks capital, uh, public safety. But what we want to try and do in this session is get a discussion about priorities across different areas. Sort of what you think is important to the community, uh, putting all those things together. So that's one, just a, a discussion. The second is to try and get some priorities and what planning session wouldn't be complete without a dot scenario, right? So we've got that for you later on. But to try and identify potential topics to bring forward for future workshops to help you work on some of those things that you've identified as priorities, okay? So there's really two, the, the discussion element, just to start a discussion about what's important, what your priorities are across the different areas, and the second is to try and uh, seed some of the uh, topics for future council workshops, okay? So the agenda is, I've got some context, uh, want to set, hold some information from your strategic plan from the community survey and then uh, want to use that information to get you into a discussion about potential strategic priorities. Uh, we'll have a review and a discussion. We've put some things, there are some things in your packet. We've put those on the board. I uh, want to have a, just an uh, a informal conversation. Um, want to get your feedback on those things, whether there's things that should be added, deleted, things that you don't think should be up there, modifications, and then uh, go into the prioritization exercise as well. And again, I'm thinking uh, that we won't need the full two hours, but it's completely up to you in terms of, uh, in terms of the discussion. Okay, so next slide. So starting out with a strategic plan, and, and this is, I think actually came out of uh, your planning session in 2011, is really where this got its seed. Uh, it was kicked off in 2012, a lot of the work was done in 2012, and I think you ended up adopting this in February of 2013. Um, so it's, it's you know, two years old, three years if you consider when the information was being gathered and when this was being put together. So it does two things. It was, it's meant to be a 20-year strategic plan, but I think this is informative because it helps you both look at, okay, well, how well have we done the last couple of years on these <coughs> items, but also helps inform what those priorities might be uh, going forward. So there are four sort of st uh, strategic goals, pillars that came out of this process with some uh, supporting initiatives. I just want to quickly run through uh, the four. Communication, this is provide an open and accountable city government through effective communication in order to foster citizen participation. So I don't know, 
I don't think these were in any priority order, maybe alpha order, but in terms of uh, communication was, was the first one out of the gate for them. Second was community engagement. Support and promote opportunities for community engagement to build a sense of community and preserve our small town feel. Okay. And the third, core services. Provide effective leadership to ensure that Washula residents receive quality Color change on that one. Uh, quality, cost-effective municipal services, and then, and that one's got a number of different uh, subtopics that we'll get into in a second. And then economic development, build a, a solid economic foundation to ensure a strong, diverse, and sustainable local economy. And you think back to the context of when this was put together. This was probably, I didn't know it at the time. The recession was officially over, but. It, Sure didn't feel like it. Um, I think the city's revenues were still in a downward trend. I know the development side was still pretty flat in 2012, uh, and so economic development uh, got a lot of attention uh, in this process. So I want to then go on and just touch on some of the priorities that were identified in each of these areas. So under pillar number one, communication, there's enhanced citizen and business communication. It was a, a recommendation to consider adding a PIO, a public information officer. So actually a new position to help lead the communication side. And really I think that was partly a function of looking at the other things that they'd identified. Uh, they want uh, solicitation of citizen input regularly, current accurate and concise information, uh, report annually on progress, use partnerships and strategic alliances to deliver the communication, and then actively participate in other elements of the community as well. And as I was talking about, you know, you can look back at what you've done on this, and I just did from, from Dave's update, the e-government, uh, you're doing some work on uh, social media, uh, improving your communications that way, so you've actually started to take on a lot of these things and enhancing communication. The next one was community engagement, actively promote volunteerism. There was a lot of talk, or at least uh, discussion in the, in the document in the strategic plan about working with the uh, K-12 education systems. And, and one of this was the developing leaders for local service efforts. That was one where they really highlighted working with the K-12 system. Uh, expand use of the community center, some support and promote events, including quarterly meet and greet events, foster a small town feel, Emphasis on engaging seniors and youth, and promoting a healthy community. Okay. And I noticed in the, you know, one of your capital projects going forward in the community center, you've got the kitchen remodel. So again, that's trying to I think, uh, focus on getting expanded use of the community center, at least keeping that up. And then third, core services. This is the one that has multiple parts. The first up is just overall management, professional management, Develop an organizational culture focused on efficiency and continuous improvement. Adequately budget for services and recruit and retain high performing personnel. Again, I noticed a couple of things that you're working on. Obviously, you've got your uh, budget situation. You came in uh, ahead of plan, uh, but you've got a, a budget uh, for 2015 that does make some investments but adequately uh, funds services. You've also got a, a class and comp study that's related to recruiting and retraining uh, personnel. And then you've got a performance <coughs> analyst uh, you know, that I think targets uh, some of these areas where you're gonna bring on a performance analyst to, again, just take a look, make sure you've got uh, the metrics in place, give you some data, help you uh, look at how well you're managing your services. And then uh, another element under core services was transportation and public infrastructure. Focus on keeping up existing infrastructure as opposed to investing in new. Multimodal transportation, efficient movement of traffic, partner with CTRAN for public transit, public infrastructure for growing community, so that new infrastructure, and then setting development fees, understanding how the public-private share should be allocated in terms of investing in infrastructure as well. And again, just to note a couple things that are going on here. You've got um, the wastewater treatment plant upgrade, right? You've got the water, new water reservoir, I think that's in the planning stages as well. Um, you've done a lot of work on pavement management, uh, trying to uh, upgrade the uh, funding, the resources that are available for pavement management. Uh, I know that the 
the second overpass or another overpass is, is being discussed. So a lot of work, I think, being done in transportation and public infrastructure. And then uh, the last set of the core services, public safety, promote and increase community-based partnerships. This is appropriate. I think the Amos Washtegal Fire Department uh, falls under that category. Provide appropriate levels of service to ensure a safe community. Again, you added a conversation with the community on, on both the fire and EMS and police side this last year. And then strategic partnerships, intergovernmental relations to influence issues outside the city's jurisdictions but important to the community. When I read that, what came to mind is your recent discussions on the BNSF and the oil trains. You know, you're not afraid to sort of talk about policy issues that impact Washougal that you may not have control over but are important in other jurisdictions. And I think your investment in uh, your uh, Lloyd, having him represent you, uh, Get a really, I do think you get a, a great value out of that. He's representing other jurisdictions. There's sort of a fixed cost to keeping up with what's going on, and the more you can spread that across other jurisdictions, it's value to everybody. And, and I, I do think Lloyd is a, a great representative for uh, for Southwest Washington. So those are the core services. There's one other category. The last one is economic development. And again, lots of progress. I think that you've uh, you've made. Uh, on this in the last couple of years since this was done. Just to hit on the support business recruitment, expansion and retention, market the community as a desirable place to live, regional cooperation with a focus on technology and light industry, supporting downtown redevelopment and tourism promotion. Now just from the discussion that I've been hearing this afternoon, you've talked about the, the tourism side, uh, Quita, you know, the uh, the videos that you guys have put together, I think a lot of the jurisdictions have envy for those. I mean, they're really well done, really nice videos in terms of both marketing the community to residents as well as businesses. Uh, do a really good job with that. Um, and I know you've got the WISP, the new sign program, right? Um, does uh, worked with a couple of different jurisdictions that have really struggled to try and come up with something because the city essentially ends up being the funding source for that, but everybody has an idea of how they should look, where they should go. It's just really a complicated process to go through, but when you get it done, it really does enhance wayfinding in your communities, and that has all sorts of benefits, not just for the quality of life, but also for tourism and businesses, everything. There's lots of benefits. It's just really complicated to get in place. Um, see if there's anything else that I uh, identified on this one. Oh, uh, you know, another innovative area, the new market tax credit concept. Um, you know, not very many jurisdictions have tried to, to make that work. And that's, again, a, another area where you've made investments, both regionally uh, on economic development, and hopefully those will pay dividends down the road. Um, so that's it for the strategic plan. And again, just for context, it's a couple years old. I think it's still relevant. But what we're trying to do, again, is even the strategic plan identified sort of priorities in each area, economic development, transportation, infrastructure. What I want to try and challenge you to do today is think across, you know, what's really, what's most important? Is it pavement management or communication? You know, which, how do you, how do you set priorities across that? And that's what we want to get a flavor for today. Um, and I don't know. Brent attended, but I did poll, maybe some of you saw the headlines from this last week, but Vancouver went through their planning conference, and just to give you a flavor of the uh, priorities that they came up with, uh, public, st public safety, street funding, communication, economic development, <laughs> and affordable housing for them, which has gotten a little bit more important with the, uh, the issues that they've been facing. But you can see that the same kinds of issues in a growing community in southwest Washington they're really relevant regionally. They're all addressed different locally at the local level. Your needs are going to be different, but the central issues, I think, are the same. It's good to know that Vancouver's wanting to be like Washington. Yeah. It's nice <laughs> that they're following you. I, I, I make some suggestions for him. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So the next thing, any other thoughts on the strategic plan and the priorities that it has before I leave that and go into the community survey? Paul, thank you for coming back to that and doing that point on point like you did. I think that's something that we as, as staff and department heads, we could probably do a better job for the council of bringing those things back so that you 
it really is something that was meant to be and is continuing to be a guide for us as we go through all of our processes. So. And I do think, it, you know, it, again, it's developed in a context, a certain time and place, heavier recession, the environment was different, um, but it does give you a nice framework to, uh, to juxtapose your current efforts and what you should be doing in the future. So. Joyce? I'm impressed at how many I ticked off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, busy. <laughs> I, was, I was very pleased with everybody that's working here because a lot of these things are, have, we can check off or they're in, we, we've made the attempt. It's, that's, thank you. Well, there's, there's many more that Paul didn't go through. That's why right. I say, I don't put know. it to department heads to say, which efforts can you reasonably put in there? Don't stretch and, mm -hmm. you know, try and really draw nexuses, but the easy ones, the list would be easy. No, it's great. So we'll, we'll come up with those as well. Great. The other thing, and again, uh, I wish more of the clients that I work with would do this, these community surveys I think are very useful. Sometimes they get done too often, but you hadn't done one in a while, at least at this level, and I think it, it can be really helpful in terms of just gauging the perceptions primarily of the community, but also uh, their priorities. And I think this is, uh, I know you did this back in June, July of this year, um, pulled some of the slides from the uh, ETC presentation and their report. I just want to walk through these because, again, I think it's useful in terms of revealing some of the priorities that at least the community has for you. But again, a lot of these are, this is one where, where we can actually see relative. So we can see how they feel about streets versus communication. So this is uh, less uh, siloed than your strategic plan was, you know, in terms of those uh, initiatives. This gives you a sense of what the community perceives, anyways, based on their uh, knowledge when they responded to the survey. Um, and just for context, again, the respondents, I didn't do the full demographics, but 74, 75% were voters, 24% not, so I give you a little sense of, of how in tuned or how knowledgeable they might be about what's going on at the local level. Um, so this is the first slide. So this is the satisfaction with major categories of service. And you can see starting at the top, quality of fire, emergency, medical ambulance services. The blue portion is very satisfied. The light blue portion is satisfied. And the white is neutral. And the red is dissatisfied. So you can just see going from the top to the bottom, uh, very high levels of satisfaction. It was all good news items, you know, all the way uh, you down to the midpoint. When you get to maintenance of city streets, um, that's where you start to have the majority being either neutral or dissatisfied. So you've got maintenance of city streets, effectiveness of communications, the next one down, enforcement of city codes and ordinances, and effectiveness of economic development efforts. So you can see some consistencies with some of the information that came out of the strategic plan already in terms of the community, but those are the areas at least where the satisfaction was lower. The good news is the number of those where the satisfaction is, is high or very high, and a lot of those are your essential services. One of the takeaways that ETC had was that you had a very strong brand. And I think the quality of life pieces are what makes your brand strong. So you've got a lot of positive things about your community that makes it a, a good place for people to, uh, a place where people want to live. And more uh, increasingly, where people want to uh, start their businesses, have their businesses. So the next slide looks at the uh, city services that should have the most investment. Can you, should receive the most emphasis over the next two years. And they had people give three choices, first, second, and third. You can see the blue is first, the yellow is second, and the red is third. And this is has similar information to what we had uh, in the first slide. So the first up is maintenance of city streets. Uh, fairly good margin over the second and third items at 49% either ranking, 49% of those people surveyed rank it first, second, or third. Next up was economic development efforts at 42%, water utilities, 32, parks, 31, police services, 28, 
you can see the rest going down the list. But really that uh, indicates that there's a strong level of uh, high, high priority around the streets and economic development efforts, and then quite a bit of fall off to the next one of water utilities and city parks. What ETC did, and I'll show you this in this, I think the next slide of the slide after that, but it's really a context of trying to juxtapose the importance and the satisfaction. So this is what they think ought to be emphasized, but also you have to look at how satisfied they are. And so you want to look at both of those things together. And that's what the next slide does. This is too small for you to, to pull out of, but if you remember this slide, you really need to focus on those things that are in the lower right. So this, in the x-axis here, uh, identifies an importance rating. So the left side is low, important, low importance. So the community survey says these are the items that uh, the respondents thought were less important. To the right is more important. And then the y-axis is satisfaction rating. The bottom of the y-axis is less satisfaction. The top is more satisfaction. So that lower right quadrant are those services where people feel that are very important, but they're less satisfied. Okay? So those are opportunity areas for a local government to say, okay, I can target some investments or target some services, target some improvements in those services because they mean a lot to people and they're not as happy as they are with other services. So you had you know, four things, and three of them were great, mm -hmm. and one of them was low satisfaction, high importance, you'd want to put your money into improving that area that's low satisfaction, high importance. Okay, oh, there we go. And lo and behold, when you look at these, it's the maintenance of city streets and the effectiveness of economic development efforts. Those are the two. Quality of city parks is just above the line, so that one might sneak in. And then if you look over to the left, the effectiveness of communication uh, is another one that's just to the left of the midpoint on the importance rating. Okay? And again, I want to uh, should have put another caveat in this. This discussion doesn't necessarily go into the uh, enterprise funds. So I want to focus this on the discretionary funding that you have, the core services that are funded by your general and street fund revenues, your, your core revenue, your tax revenue base. So for the utilities, I'm sure that some of this information has found its way into their work plans already, uh, the priorities for their capital programs, but I really want to focus this exercise more on those services that require and rely on the discretionary funding of the city. And so in this instance, what this community survey is suggesting is that streets and economic development are really the core areas that are the highest priority. Communication, Code enforcement, over to the left there, those are two. And then you've got parks that's also in that mix. Okay? Parks was an interesting one. You know, when I went and looked at the uh, survey responses, one of the things you get by using ETC is that they have done this survey in a number of different communities and they can pull data from a, a bunch of different jurisdictions. And while parks for you had pretty good satisfaction, it was lower than the satisfaction that other residents, both in the Northwest and nationally, have attributed to parks in their communities. So while it was a positive for you, there was this gap between your community and some of the other communities. So when you think of, um, you're not really competing with other cities for residents or quality of life or anything, but the respondents in those other communities rated their parks a little bit higher than Washougal did you know, in terms of rating their parks, their satisfaction with their parks. Okay, so the last slide I have for you on context is looking at, at priorities, and these, I should have changed that second header there. These were, these were priorities within departments. So the other thing that the survey did is it, delved, it dove down deeper into each of the departments and identified, asked people questions about what are your priorities within public safety, uh, transportation, I think it was transportation parks, but otherwise, and I wanted to pull just the highest priorities that came out of each of those department level areas. Uh, the first one is uh, overall efforts to prevent crime. It was in the public safety side. Park facilities, quality of park facilities, picnic shelters, playgrounds, in-city parks, appearance and maintenance. 
communication side you can think of, public involvement in decision making, the level of public involvement, maintenance of major city streets, and enforcing the cleanup of litter, debris, and mowing and trimming of grass and weeds. So this gives you some context to the high level priorities, which were transportation, code enforcement, communication, public safety, parks. It gives you a sense of really what some of the highest priorities that at least the participants in the community survey identified when they were asked in those areas. Okay? So this is it on the context for the community survey. Any thoughts, observations on this information? Was that correct when I read that 411 households responded to this survey? Correct. Is that considered a good uh, Sampling. That's the standard. Actually, 400 is the standard size. It gives you about a plus or minus five percent on the variance, and it's a, it's it's that sweet spot where the cost and the accuracy sort of come to a point where it's affordable. And I don't know what you paid for it, but in order to get uh, higher degrees of uh, margin, a small, much smaller margin, you have to explode the number that you talk to. So you have to go up to you know. 10,000 to get that really down to something where uh, you know it's one or one percent or so, but that costs you exponentially more. So this is sort of the sweet spot. The 400 uh, is pretty standard for all these surveys. And then the second question I had: Are you able to? Um, is there any breakdown of like who's a city employee that responds to this survey or whatever? I don't whatever? think they allowed city employees to respond, but okay. there's a a fairly detailed uh, demographic analysis of what they um, a city pl employee could have responded if they received one in the mail right so you didn't know who it was getting sent out to it, it um, no this was a random sample okay. that was generated there were phone yeah. calls, okay. right there were they did they did trial of phone, call. phone calls slash mail okay. um, follow-up mail there was a letter that went out but the the design of this uh, you remember from a stats class, this the design of this was to be uh, a statistically significant, legitimate okay. uh, survey. So I did. Right. I, that's good. I, I thought it went out to everybody. It did not. Okay. No, okay. Random, no. random, it was random sampling. Random sampling. Right. And that's why the the 400 is sort of the sweet spot. I was looking through like the a, like a rows. Thanks for putting this together. Mm -hmm. and, and just so you know, one of the big issues is as to whether it's statistically significant has to do with how many people you contacted and asked them to do the survey and they didn't respond. Because if there's any systematic statistics on the people who were asked and failed to respond, that skews everything big time. So you, you need to know both of those numbers in order to talk about statistical significance. You know, okay. know they're, where they're at. There's a map. Mm -hmm. I saw the dots, yeah. So again, this gives you a sense, you know, it validates some of the priorities that came out of the strategic plan, gives you a little bit more context in terms of the relative importance, at least, uh, and the relative satisfaction through the community survey, um, again, which is, I think, helpful for a framework for you in terms of trying to set uh, broader priorities across different areas. So that's the end of the context. Any other questions in terms of uh, either the community survey or the strategic plan? So now we're going to move on to the exercise that I hope to generate some discussion. So the next slide. So we want to try and get out of this as potential strategic priorities. So the strategic plan listed some strategic priorities in each of the specific areas that it covered, the pillars, the four pillars. Um, but what I want to do is have you review the list of potential strategic priorities, which is what we've provided in your packet and then are on the board here. I want you to think of those and consider those, come back either in your conversations with other council members and staff, or come back when we come back to this session, share your observations, if you have any ideas about things that are missing, things that really didn't reflect what you thought were the important areas, things that we should add, I'd like to get those documented. And then 
I want to prioritize those, have you prioritize those, uh, and again, as I mentioned before, the objective is to have that be a setup for uh, potential candidates for future workshops or strategic investments in 2015 or 2016. So there's six categories, and we put this together uh, with the help of staff. Some of this, hopefully, uh, are things that were informed by your uh, work this morning in terms of the work plans in each of these areas. But the categories that we put together are, uh, there's the list that we use, the categories that we use to put the list together are transportation capital. And again, lots of uh, indications that transportation is a big priority. Parks and recreation, there's both capital and operations in that side. Uh, some more parks and recreation type activities, programs. Public safety, economic development, Operations and maintenance, we wanted to sort of pull this out. These would be things like the street uh, uh, pavement management program, but other just sort of maintenance uh, items. And then a uh, catch-all category for other. And again, these lists that we put together primarily came from either plans that you've adopted, things that you currently have on the plate that aren't on the current work plan, but are things that have circulated uh, either in your budget discussions or other discussions that the city council has had. Um, so what we'd like to do, next slide. As I mentioned, have you review the list that are posted on the wall, talk with each other, talk with staff, not, no members of the public here. Uh, do they reflect the priorities from the strategic plan and community survey? Do they address what you believe to be the right actions and investments? Are there any items missing? Anything should be removed, you think? Any revisions or modifications? And then after you're done contemplating those items, those questions, I'll have you come back here. We'll have a brief discussion about those. If there's anything that we need to uh, ad hoc add to these lists or modify, we'll do that. And then we'll go into the prioritization exercise. Okay? Thoughts about either what we're going to do or how we're going to do it? Objections to the outcome, objections to at least uh, trying to go through that process. I want to make this relevant to you, but really thought it'd be good to uh, both let you get up and walk around, but just to think about all these things collectively together when we're trying to discern sort of cross area priorities. The only thing I would add for the council is that. Um, when you're up and over there looking at those things, the first one's transportation capital. Everything on that list is in your currently adopted transportation capital facilities plan. There's nothing new on that list. It's all stuff that you've already identified or we've identified together on the plan. Uh, but we thought we'd throw that up there. The next one on parks and recreation, also uh, off of your parks plan. Um, you can't see them from here. We know that because you're going to get up close to them. Public safety, things that we've talked about. Economic development, things that we've talked about, but a couple things that we haven't. So when you get up there and see though, you'll notice it. Oh, we hadn't talked about that. Ops and maintenance. I think you'll everything up there will be familiar to you. And then, and similarly on the uh, other programs, it's found either in the, the strategic plan or in the survey to help you on the parks and rec one. Uh, I. We chose to do it this way. When you look at that parks and rec list, you're going to go up there and you're going to see CP3 and CP4 and NP1, community park, neighborhood park, WP, waterfront park, and just a number. And you're like, well, what is that? On, I believe it's laying on the it's actually table. right here. There's, there's the maps. But we'll, there's, move, we'll move those over. Okay. Yes. Sorry. There's, um, there's an, uh, excerpts from the parks plan that identify what those are. So we didn't have enough room to do it on that one sheet. So you'll be able to look at that and go, oh, yeah, CP3 is over here. If it's a new one, it doesn't have a name. It's a, if it's a proposed new one. But you can go over to the parks maps, and we blew them up. Those are right from your plan, and you can see that. So that gives you, that'll help you on the parks one. And that's, that's the info that you have. We recognize you don't have perfect information about these things. Really, the idea is to get just a sense of your priorities, given what you know about these areas. Uh, you know, even revealing 
priorities in terms of just topic areas uh, will they I think be useful for the administration and for you this again help set your agenda for workshop sessions for the rest of 2015 though I know you got a lot on your plate already um, and we'll have staff just kind of standing near and around what might be most relevant to them if you have a question about what you're looking at feel free to use the time to talk together while you're up there or whatever okay so next slide so we've got you know take a break you've been at this now an hour and a half of this session two hours for this session take a break but take maybe 25 minutes so about uh, a quarter after two I'll try and bring you back to the table we can talk about sort of your observations from looking at the, the different potential strategic priorities. Okay? Yep. Thanks. Trevor, you need to take a number of okay. okay. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of good information exchanged. I don't know what that will lead to necessarily, but I want to take at least a couple minutes here and uh, capture any of your observations from your reviewing the lists and your conversations with staff and with each other. Uh, regarding the potential list of strategic priorities. Um, so, just open it up. Any thoughts about what needs to be added or? The thing that occurs to me, little background, that five years ago, the total reach of the Colombian plus the post record was 28% of households in Washougal over the course of a month. Any one of the Portland television stations reaches more than that. Obviously can't afford to buy television for Washougal. So how do you reach people? And the thing that popped into my head basically is reader boards. I don't mean the big multicolor flashing thing down like down at Washougal Florist, more like what's at the high school. And you could just put up on there, there is a council meeting, there is a school board meeting, there is a this. Um, well, center has one of those when you cross the bridge. And if you yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, and, and the other thing that occurs to me is we used to have poles over here across River Road at, just before you go up on the railroad bridge with a wire you could hang a banner. And somebody looked at those poles and said, <clears throat> engineering, they could fall over in a wind. So they've been cut off. But either of those two things, if you think about it, you could reach 80% of the households in the city with three locations, 6th and E, River Road, and 32nd, um, with either reader boards or those kinds of banners. And that's the only way that I have been able to come up with to actually reach people that are not already going to your website or your Facebook page or whatever. Just then a the, comment on that, the, you know, the banners are a lot more operational yes. intensive. Just yes, the they are. The electronic reader boards are nice because you can... The, the only advantage to the banners is that you can make them available to some community organizations yep. that you might not want to put on your reader board. And they, you can customize them with logos and stuff and they're easier to... Then the other thing that, that in my mind is missing from the parks plan is a downtown park. It was on there, wasn't it? It's, there for it's, on, it's yeah. on there, but it's not in the plan necessarily. It's not on the map. but I. We put it on the list because the council's been talking about it. Yeah, so there's a new park. It's the sixth one down uh, downtown. So it's on there. But, but it good, would need to be on the plan. clarification. Yeah. And then I don't know whether it's transportation or whether it's economic development, but I keep thinking that we ought to be thinking long term about how are we going to connect port waterfront project to downtown. How can you get from one to the other, especially in January? Um, you know, it just seems to me that somehow we're missing the boat if we don't think long term on how we make that connection. Is, it, is, that a, oh, sorry, yeah. is that a pedestrian connection, or um, are you talking from Parker's Landing to downtown? 
I'm talking actually when it comes down to it from Reflection Plaza to the marina. Um, For walking or driving? Well, I think it's awfully hard to figure out a way other than, than 14 to do it in automobiles. On the other hand, if you look at some of the other cities, I mean, here we, in Ctran, we tend to think of huge buses. You go to some place like St. Petersburg, Florida, and they have jitneys that are small, lightweight vehicles that maybe carry 12 people at a time that connect pieces of the downtown. And they're, you know, I suppose you can still use those on, on, on 14 and go through the roundabouts and that whole mess to get into downtown. But if I had a magic wand, I would make that trail compatible yeah. with that. I, I mean, speaking, you know, uh, working with the, the, the port has been working on several kind of uh, groups that spawned out of the, you know, the, the PSU students. And one of the groups that I was on as uh, part of that project was the connection piece uh, downtown. Um, and, you know, we've been, we've talked about that, that group has talked about uh, obviously the, the pedestrian trail. That, that has been a big priority because the port is uh, facilitating part of that. There was also discussion about possible uh, ferry, you know, from the marina up to Steamboat, you know, just a little thing. The other I've part never, that was, never occurred to me. Yeah, the other, uh, what we also talked about was possibly a, a like a like a trolley that mm -hmm. would run from from downtown uh, down C Street. And so there was actually discussion along about C Street. Um, we've done improvements. Uh, the sidewalks have been done along there on the north side, and uh, there was also some discussion about maybe doing it on the south side or maybe making a, a, another. Uh, is it I guess it would be B Street, you know, maybe a lower impact street, you know, so maybe less traffic, more pedestrian traffic. But those have been some of the discussions that have come out of that uh, that group. But that can, C Street has been really kind of the connection, um, you know, from a uh, you know, they get on a trolley in downtown and then just take it right down to the marina. The other big one that we talked about was um, kind of you know putting our no, no dollar amount no, no is, yeah, exactly, was over 6th Street, a pedestrian over where 6th Street used to go across, that you'd have a pedestrian connection that goes up over 6th Street and then back down into the, the trail system, so. Which would make a great place for your reader board when you came into town, you know, you know so. <laughs> huh. Great, so, again, through the no constraints, there's no bad idea here, so I'm just gonna add, when we go to do the actual prioritization, I'm gonna add, I think there's two things here. One is sort of the Sixth Street overpass, and the other is the waterfront to downtown pedestrian connection. That, that yeah, that, the, the, that's a project that's where we talked about earlier this morning, uh, the pedestrian connection. I think Paul was bringing up more of the a transportation, uh, a vehicular connection. And so what you're saying, Paul, or were you talking a trail? I think some kind of people mover system. Okay. You know, one that I would not have considered uh, two months ago, <clears throat> but I've now seen two different examples of it, uh, bicycles. Four or six of them that are stationed down at the marina portion and four or six that are down here in the, pick a number, I don't care where it is, but some on either end. Seattle, they have just exploded. Mm -hmm. The put your card in, mm -hmm. rent one for an hour, rent one for a day, whatever it is. And back in Washington, D.C., they are everywhere. And they're all the same ones. Those ones, I believe, have an electronic portion to them because when you get on them and activate them, it automatically turns on lights in front and back, day or nighttime. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a get it, dock is it. Is that like the zip car it. concept or is it just a free? Kind of, but they're bicycles. Right. They're not free. Right. So you, you enroll, you sort of prepay and but you could see use your access And you card. put some information in there in case that one doesn't come back. There's a smart chip in it or something. 
Um, but in D.C., you could clearly see that there were people that were going to work on them or coming home, and there were tourists like crazy on them as well. But they, and I had seen them in Seattle before, but uh, we had a trip up there a couple months ago that was the first time I had seen them literally just explode throughout the entire Seattle metro area. And, you know, just their maps of everywhere you could redock one or do whatever was significant. And that's, the, I mean, the, the bikes, bikes is, was a big one. Uh, Seaside has the, the ones yep. they rent, and people right. can, four people and six people, mm -hmm. a family can sit on the ones. ones. was another concept that was discussed, but, you know, that would be on, maybe on the private side that someone's actually renting those things out to. Or not. Maybe it's on the public side yeah. of tourism, and mm -hmm. again, it doesn't answer everything. Right. But you could also <laughs> take those on C Street, you could take them here, or on the trail. Yeah. The little four person. The little jitney things. Yeah. Rick Shots. You have to think of a different name. <laughs> Bob Shots. And then my my last one was at least think about kind of pocket neighborhood parks. When we think about parks, we think of big parks, but. Our typical lot size these days is under 7,000 square feet, which means there really isn't much of a backyard. So where do kids go in the neighborhood to play? If we're going to have lot sizes that are that small, maybe there should be one-third acre, half-acre parks within a few blocks that kids could go maybe shoot hoops. You're obviously not going to have a baseball field there, and I think liability precludes swing sets, but something that makes it possible for neighborhood kids to have a place to go and play, Rich which if, if they have, now they have to get mom to take them to the park. Well, I think Paul hit the nail on the head with that one. I mean, you pretty much have to get in your car and, you know, age-appropriate recreational things for kids. There just really isn't a lot of that stuff in the city. I mean, we need a, a public pool, a partnered pool with the school district, you know, for seniors. I noticed there's rec centers up there, but the pool was not in there. I mean, there's kids that drown every year. You see it in the newspaper and the rivers around here, and there's just... You know, there's not a Will and Rob center like there is in Camas, which is attached to the school. There just there aren't any indoor play centers, at least that I know of, for for kids around here. And I think that, you know, just to add that pool to the rec center, and then the piggyback on his sign thing, I think that there should be some sort of sign that lets you know you're entering Washougal from the east side on Third, coming from Camas. Um, you know, uh, and maybe partner with Camus to clean that area up from more. The side? Yeah, from the east side coming in on third. Um, on the west side, yeah, sorry, west side. West There's going east. Yeah, west going east. <laughs> There's a tiny one there at the credit union entering Washington. I've never <laughs> seen it. You know, I don't know. It, you know, it, it, this is a lot of maybe because a lot of their people don't come through there, they don't take care of it or clean it up as much. But as you're entering the city there, and then as you're entering the downtown core, something, flowers, lamp posts, an overhead paint, you know, entering um, Washougal downtown, um, I think those would be. Well, there's like one, the one in Vancouver when you come off um, on the Mill Plain. There's that, you know, mon it's a monument sign for the, you know, the Angelo building there right. where Denny's used to be. Something like that would be nice. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd put Shepherd Road on that list, too. Where is Ford Street? I see six million dollars that we need to pay Ford Street. Industrial Park. And is that our responsibility? Uh, right now it's at Ford Street. I thought, yeah, I didn't think we had any streets in the port anymore. Yeah, index 37. And city right away? Okay. Yeah. Index. But Ford is not. She said Ford was not. But okay, a so question. That come off. I had about the rec center. Is 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 it possible for us to partner with a YMCA or I mean I know there's grant agencies in Southern California that for places such as ours where our socioeconomic is lower in areas where they specifically promote these youth type rec centers. Is there anything like that in Washington State or? Well, it's actually a 
Yeah, there's a lot of them, and that's what Jack Will Rob is. Yeah. Uh, the, between the city and the school and uh, the Boys and Girls Club. The Croc Foundation, McDonald's, is probably the largest nationally in terms of funding rec centers. They put a multi-million dollar one into Salem, Oregon within the past it's handful of years. It's probably the nicest building in Spokane. Um, there is a potential opportunity coming forth that um, hasn't picked up a huge amount of steam yet, but since the school bond has gone through and they will be at some point dropping Jump to Guard for all intents and purposes, um, the questions have started to be asked if there are one or two of those pods specifically like the uh, gymnasium one or the gymnasium one in the administrative and cafeteria area, if those are in good enough shape and can be rehabbed as they put the schools up above to capture those for youth activity centers. The only, well, one of the potential downsides is it's outside the city it's and it's out on the out east there. end. Oh, I would but there are existing that. buildings that are in the air that are permitted for what they are. Yeah, but that's that's in the gorge, and there's design limitations on what you can do out there. Not for the buildings that are there. That's and that's what I mean. That they're already existing. They're already permitted. There are okay. uh, a lot of jurisdictions. Not a lot. Jurisdictions have used uh, parks and recreation districts, so you can create a separate taxing district to help fund both the capital and the operations. You know, there's been some discussion in this community about that several years ago, but. Okay. That's another public, and some of those have been done in partnership with the Y, those types of things. So. Right. Um, something a little closer to town, um, Angelo Park, and we kind of talked about that, Mitch, um, at one of our last um, budget committee, was a budget committee meeting mm -hmm. that we talked about it, and I know they're looking to potentially put apartments there, but um, it's currently being used as a park for kids, and I just didn't know if the Angelos would, might consider selling it to the city to remain a park or a, a recreation center area or youth center youth <laughs> oriented Something. in perpetuity. Um, I don't know if anybody has relationships with the Angelos or if they would <laughs> consider something like that because that's close to downtown. Mixed relationships and, with the Angelos. Um, <laughs> I just know that 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 that, that piece situation. of property is to me incredibly valuable um, as open space or as something to be used for youth whether it's a community center rec center pool or whatever I mean I don't know I'm just dreaming but <laughs> how much is that piece of property worth what we were I don't know what the assessed value on it was 500 I mean, the last, so my opinion, we don't need more apartments in, in the downtown area. I mean, we've got a lot of apartments. Two acres. Sorry. But yeah. that's just my, my opinion is that it would be better served for the de yeah. for a community purpose. Especially not any low income. Well, that's not what they're looking no, for. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, we just don't, I, I mean, I think, I think we just don't need any more apartments, period. I mean, the, the current, we have apartments, and they're zoned multifamily already. And if somebody wanted to come in and buy up the, the inexpensive apartments and turn them into really nice apartments, you know, then they would be grandfathered in and have that current designation and be able to do that. Yeah, on the other side, I think you'd see a lot of businesses downtown saying, please, 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 please That's help them I develop think. it into 200, 300, 400 apartments. They need the bodies. They need the mass. Right. That's, that's Especially if it's market rate, you've still got a large amount of the population, not just in Washoe, but you've got a lot of it in Kansas. They just get priced out that can't afford homes, but they want to be in the community. We have a lot of low-income apartments in Washougal. I'm not talking about low-income. Oh. I'm not talking about low-income at all. Neither is our bothering. They're talking about market rate. Right. Okay. Well, what else? Other sort of thoughts, and this is great discussion because you're coming up with things that weren't on the list, emphasizing things that were other observations from your. Downtown parking is not on the list as I saw, and that seems to be an issue. What else? Um, well, oh, public safety didn't um, occupy a lot of 
a little bit. Two things about the Sure. The question, police chief said that you were allowed two things on each list. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a minimum of two things. <laughs> He's the only one who complied with the. A minimum of two. Uh, okay. Um, you know, last year we had the um, levy lid lift for the additional officer, which didn't pass. I was the only council member who didn't vote to put that on the ballot. And I, and one of the reasons I didn't is I wanted to see a little bit more vetting of that to see where we stand with other communities and, you know, the need. Um, so I'd like to see something on that, uh, some, so, some so. workshop on, you know, where are we as far as police staffing uh, compared levels to our service. levels of service compared to calls and, you know, compared to other communities. Because I had a conversation with the Vancouver police chief about that and we're better off than they are, I think. Uh, actually, we're, we're per officer. Uh, one of the higher uh, calls per officer in Clark County. Even more than Vancouver? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing there, which I think is really important based upon the survey, community survey, is uh, I think code enforcement issues were ranked fairly high in the list, list of concerns in the city. It was sort of in that close, but not quite into that right. bottom right quadrant. It was in the bottom left. Close to and I'd be interested thing. in seeing on some proposals to enhance our code enforcement. So that's up there, so when you prioritize, you can yeah. take that into account. This is sort of the season where those code enforcement things, too, right? The grass starts Start growing. Start picking up now. Yeah. <laughs> what else? I, I saw that we had somebody, we were thinking of somebody to promote the city, um, an information officer. My question is, do we need a, a grant writer? A, a, part-time position for somebody that specifically goes out and, you know, because all the administration seems so busy doing their other jobs, is, is that something? And I know you contract out for certain uh, Halverson and other people to look into grants, but it, would it be better in, in one spot searching for grants for the city? I don't know. Possibly. Could be, yeah. I mean, Everybody, all the jurisdictions that I work struggle with that. You know, the ones that have tried it, Get disappointed on the return. Um, you know, a lot of the places find that the relationships that they have are places where you can get the bigger money. Right. So they don't. Uh, it's but it's a struggle. Some are very successful, but others. And we straddle both sides. Suzanne on the park side is phenomenal at writing grants and getting them accepted and funded. Uh, Trevor's team, Jim. Uh, sidewalks, some of the street programs, some of our intersections, they do a phenomenal job doing that. And we do that with in-house people. You know, Lloyd, we pay, David, what is it, $7,000 a year? And he does, he does a little bit of that and some advising, but it's more delivering the messages and using his Rolodex uh, to help get those things into the system and or better refine them. Um, I think, Trevor, we don't have, do we have Wallace still writing some of our grant? applications or are they just managing them once we've got them? We have assistance intermittently depending on the capital improvement. Like uh, we leverage Brown and Caldwell in constructing the wastewater treatment plant to look at low interest loan preferred dollars with the revolving fund. Uh, other projects, um, you know, DOE consideration ecology like the fueling station and stormwater improvements. Um, we leverage the, the firm just for some, some expertise depending on exactly what the ask is inside the application. Otherwise we typically do the heavy lifting internally. So it can go both ways. Um, I think you know, to the extent that there are grant state grant sources, I mean, most jurisdictions are pretty tuned in terms of how to access those, and you guys have been really successful. I thought you were talking more about the ones Pri that, Private industry, yeah, too. You yeah. don't know about yeah. that you Foundation. just hire Foundations, to go yeah. right. comb the weeds to try and find something that yeah. you don't yeah, it's not a state program or anything. It's just there, a foundation. There are service providers that will provide that service for you, and you know we receive their solicitations pretty regularly. Um, different payment arrangements that they have for that. Yeah, if they get it, then they don't get it. I don't know if there's any. There may be some that'll, you know, front percentage of. Yeah, and the, and 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 they don't get anything unless they get a grant. Um, but if we had, if we had. Uh, a part-time professional 
in the office that was coordinating and facilitating and overseeing and tracking and organizing. I mean, we just do it with our middle managers now. Right. And then Trevor and I and Jen, we basically keep tra try to keep track of it all. It's certain, I mean, any resource like that would be helpful to us. Now, whether, you know, the ROI on it, it, it you know, it would take some time to discover that. But I certainly wouldn't say no to that help. That help would be helpful. But it would cost us. You know. mm -hmm. Jennifer, did you have a question one more time? Oh, um, I just had a few more, more things on my list. So I'll just let everybody yeah. else talk and then I can come back to me. A couple of comments. If you look at the pie chart of revenue for the city and compare it to other cities, we get a significantly larger percentage of our revenue from grants than most cities anywhere close to our size significantly more so especially Jim and Suzanne are doing great work on that that's all public money you make a good point about private money both Portland State and Clark College actually teach classes in grant writing and it may be possible to become a class project like we did with the strategic study? Well. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, under existing park improvements, um, I wanted to bring up something that the um, parks board has been talking about it's just a pump track at Hamlet Park well, go ahead, um, sorry. pump track pump track. yeah it's for bicycles it's like a I don't know like a, it's a mountain bike it's mountain course. biking kind of moguls and things you know a dirt track little mini bridges yeah yeah things that they can and where was that, that? Hamlet, Hamlet Park Ham Addy Street on Addy Street yeah, and I just, um, I know they're, they're trying to get money uh, potentially from individuals, donations and stuff like that, and maybe a potentially a grant for that, but um, I just didn't know if there was going to, they were going to need money from the city um, for that. Anything else? I would consider that a park improvement. I wouldn't consider that a new. No. And no, that's new. probably one that can be done just with volunteer efforts as well. Potentially. Which would be cool. Potentially, yep. And then I had a couple more. Do you want me to continue? Or do you Absolutely. want to just okay? Um, Schmidt Fields. Uh, Trevor, can you talk a little bit about that two point five million dollars? I have just a lot of people talking to me about why are there not any permanent bathrooms there? Um, why is there no lighting for evening games? Uh, particularly with fact that it gets dark and kids are trying to play. <laughs> Those are all easy answers. Two point five million dollars. Well I I know. I mean I just just these are unfinished, you know, hanging in the wind sort of things. Don can you stop writing for a moment? <laughs> I don't know where we're being recorded. I know. <laughs> one, one of the unfortunate parts and the reason that, that dollar amount is on there is and Trevor and Mitch jump in because we've had these discussions multiple times and it's an extremely frustrating process. Um, the city went in and did the improvements that are there, got the grants to do them and that type of stuff, knowing that all these other improvements needed to be done, including half street improvements, including sidewalks, including up to potentially a stoplight at 34th or 39th and 34th, da 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 da. And a lot of the agreements were done and the, the work was moved forward and some of those final uh, contingencies were um, allowed to be delayed until the final field went in mm. or until the school built the two schools that they were going to build on the Kerr property back there and then they'd all be rolled into one and be done and unfortunately now the school is not going to build mm. any schools there and likely won't build a third field so at this point to a large degree the number that you have there I believe includes a third field plus all the delayed we can't put the third field in we'd be breaking our own rules 
without going ahead and putting in all of the other infrastructure that should have been there mm -hmm. originally has been delayed. So that number you see there is is a compilation of a whole lot of things that we now need to, well, the days, day of reckoning has come mm -hmm. if we do something more with that. Um, the downside, it's a conversation that I've had with Superintendent Tarzian as well, is it would appear that most all of that's gonna fall onto the city's shoulders now instead of mm -hmm. the way it was. Right, because they're not gonna develop as good, yeah, okay, the curve. So, but, Interesting. Trevor, Mitch, no, I think you're, uh, well said. Yeah, I think you're <laughs> right on. <laughs> Do, do, do I, I thought there was some, and I, I probably misunderstood, I thought there was some limitation that once we had more than two ball fields, we were required by some agency or other to add restrooms or something or other. Is, so that's part of it also? That agency is us. Mm -hmm. Oh, that agency is us. Even, uh, it was even, for whatever reason, previous administrations and uh, public works directors waived the requirement for the school district to even put in the stretch of sidewalks in front of the administrative offices. Mm -hmm. If you notice, that's all inside the city. It's new construction, and none of that work was done. It just sounds like we're limiting so, ourselves. Um, I mean, is there any way we can revisit that decision to not put in the bathrooms and, and make the lighting improvements and don't before the third field is built? I mean, I don't understand why that deal was made. Um, well, yeah, it's yeah, I don't know. I mean, is there any way we can re revisit that you, decision? You can absolutely revisit it. The, the overall answer to it, though, is that we've got to come up with an ungodly amount of money in order to fix those. The, is it going to be done or is it not going to be done question isn't even in play. It has to be done mm -hmm. eventually at some point. We can't even go in and asphalt necessarily the parking lot because that starts to trigger other things as well that aren't out there. So I guess the question is would just adding, you know, just for purposes of adding a separate project, could a separate project be just adding a restrooms or just adding lighting and not doing the full third field? Yeah, I mean, well, that that probably wouldn't uh, necessitate uh, the improvements that we're talking the about. All, all the improvements for uh, were were reviewed and looked at and approved. The, the the issue was is that based on traffic for one field and then two fields, and then the analysis will have to be done for the third field was that we weren't going to hit those thresholds that we would need to do all these frontage improvements. We were still under that threshold. And the, the idea and the notion was is let's get the fields in, um, you know, let's uh, do what we can and we'll kind of kick the can down the road. We know that the school is planning on putting, you know, other buildings up there. We'll get it all at that time. That has changed. Yes. Um, and so, so there is that. still a proof, you know, there's, there's plans that show the uh, snack bar with the, with the mm -hmm. um, concession storage, concession lighting. I don't think lighting was ever on that. that. That's a new one, but I mean, we could definitely look at it. But um, it, it's, it, you know, if they came in and, and we had conversations with Little League last year about coming in and doing that work. And the yeah, and there's there's a sewer line that they'd have to run. The school district didn't want them to connect to their sewer, so there's some issues that are going on there. They'd have to get their own separate sewer connection, yeah. um, and just there was a lot of you know kind of that back and forth going on. But could it be done? Sure, but we're okay. we're gonna get some money. For purposes of this, I'm just gonna put I think we'll put a separate project on there that serves as revisit that improvement package. Yep. So just so you know, some of that may start to answer itself in the school's designs of what they've got going out of chapter guard. Obviously right. two schools out there is going to generate a whole lot more traffic than the school that's out there now and what does that start to throw yeah. into the mix yeah. on the western portion of Evergreen Definitely. Evergreen Roadway. So and if you take a look at the at the Little League program, it does bring a lot of families out to our city from other parts of Clark County and Washington State for tournaments and or whatever they call it. And so, you know, I mean, if, if we look at something like a pickleball court as an investment bringing people in from, you know, around, then, then we could also look, you know, potentially at the ball fields as bringing people in from out of town as well. If, so. if I could add one thing, I'm on the, one of the trustees of a foundation back east, mm -hmm. small local foundation. We put up $25,000 for a snack bar at four Little League fields. And that snack bar generates enough income to make 
the field self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. There may be, now $25,000 is an awfully small number to try to go to a foundation for, but that's kind of what our foundation specializes in, and there may, we do only back in that county, but there may be some local foundations or other sources of private money that would be willing to do something. And they're like willing that. to fundraise, too. However, they can't do the infrastructure. They can't run water. Right. They can't right. do electric and all of that stuff. But they're certainly okay. willing to work hard to help. We'll keep this money. moving. So I want to, okay. we've got the project. So another potential is just to revisit that set of improvements and how you get that project moving. So I think that's a valid to break up that two and a half million. Is there a way to make that number smaller? What else before we move on to the dot exercise? Yes. I would say um, I saw some stuff on economic development for the downtown, but to focus on the core, the core downtown, whether it's acquiring um, new lots, um, just to make that our city's emphasis, uh, the downtown core for businesses. So, um, trying to give a better description. Um, you know, some jurisdictions have done uh, downtown sub area plans where they try and identify some focused investments or some uh, planned action ordinances that streamline permitting in those areas or make the case for public ownership and investment in some capacity. I mean, I know, is that? I, you know, whatever way we can acquire more area or encourage okay. people to acquire business area in there to, to let the people that own businesses there now or vacant storefronts, how important uh, getting people into those stores and uh, businesses, how important it is to the city to not have vacancies and stuff. I don't, I, I don't know, just more of an awareness okay. of promoting okay. occupancy and acquiring new potential occupancy. I would second that. And the one thing that occurred to me is emphasize to Quita that we are as at least as interested in retail and office as we are in industry. Does that get at what you were thinking of? Because I think the retail emphasis, sort of a retail support plan is something different than acquiring, you know, but you're looking at people to occupy storefronts downtown, right? And expand the area if possible. Okay. Um, I was intrigued by the mayor's comment about uh, in the back and forth on the uh, apartments going in the Angelos. Um, should we revisit um, our housing issues in the downtown area? Um, the idea of having three or four hundred new housing units in downtown do a lot for the commercial businesses. Um, you know, we've worked, Paul, you and I have worked together on things like the property tax abatement for, um, in fact, recently, uh, yeah. property tax abatement for new housing. Is that something that is a tool that can be used in Washougal? I didn't, was that on the list? It's on the list. Okay. Canvas just adopted it uh, this last year. Okay. So more jurisdictions are doing it. They've changed the rules a little bit. You can either, uh, just to give you a little bit of information about that tool, you can pick an area as big or small as you want to target that incentive, uh, and you can, uh, can be for low income or not low income, the time frame is different, um, but you can. Eight or 12 years, right? Yeah, and you can choose other criteria uh, that you can apply for granting that, so you could, there has to be some other public investment, or you can, uh, you can customize it within, within some uh, reasonable range. So, it, uh, but essentially, it gives the uh, developer uh, tax abatement for a eight or a twelve-year period. Some breathing room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do know that um, long-term lone wolf development has plans for multifamily housing at some point on one or of his lots or the others. I don't know whether. Do mixed, uh, yeah, design? mixed use with a, a multi. I just think housing in general. Um, I mean, I, I, I live alone in a 3,600 square foot house. I'm going to sell it. I'd like to get like a condo here somewhere, but they're 
There, right at the moment, there's not a single condominium for sale in Washougal. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the other thing. These things can, the tax abatement can be used know. for condominiums for ownership. It is. Um, are we okay to talk about the discussions between the Little Wolf and Angelo? If you're okay to talk about <laughs> <laughs> According to the Little Wolf side, yeah. uh, when they got word of uh, what Bob and Ann were looking to do down on the Angelo Fields, they are encouraged and, I don't know if gratified is the right word, they are happy to know that there's another developer in town that is willing to do that and add some more rooftops in the downtown. Hmm. And are not afraid of it, but they also own an awful lot of retail and service uh, square footage in the downtown that they know need people as well. I think their biggest um, issue was if it was going to be low rent or subsidized housing versus market market rate. When they heard that it was market rate, what Bob's plans were for the property, they came away smiling. So, for whatever that's worth. Mm. What else? Good news is that you're having a lot of good discussion. My bad news is my promise of getting you out early might have to sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You mean to stymie the discussion? No one's going to talk now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've come up with actually a lot of things, and you know when you think of the things that are on the list, some of these are quality of life measures. Some of these get transportation. Um, it'll be interesting to see how you prioritize these versus some of the other larger um, concepts, investments, things that, that are already on the list uh, as well. Although some of these are um, intriguing, I think, um, and important. So what I'd like to do is um, enlist Rose for her handwriting. Um, Take, give us a couple of minutes and we'll add these to the list that are on the flip chart so you can take a break. And then when you come back, we'll have you um, put the dots on. And what I'd like you to do, each gets, if you gets 10 dots. And so this, I just got to get back to that. You don't want to give me dots. <laughs> you don't want to give me dots. Um, <laughs> and I'd like you to use green for your top priorities and red for other priorities. So the only distinction I want you to make is that the green ones are the ones that you feel most strongly about. And the, uh, you can move the slide for it, I think they actually have a slide on this. Oh. Um, I had yellow, but we got red instead. Uh, red, yellow, and Maybe I should go back to this, okay? Red and yellow kill a fellow. Red for the highest. Am I going to confuse you now? Mm -hmm. Red for the highest. Red for the highest. Green for all other. Okay? You can, buy, can, you can buy more than one on it. No, you can't. And you can't trade. <laughs> <laughs> you can put them all on so, one. That's why it was my question. No yeah, negotiations. You can put them all on one. You can put none. <laughs> you don't feel like any of them. I mean, it's up to you. You've got 10 to use. You can put them uh, anywhere you want. And again, the only distinction is red is your highest priority, green is the all the others. Okay? And again, as I mentioned before, when you were looking at these, I want you to at least try and be somewhat need blind. I know the dollar amounts are always important when you think about priorities, but really this is planning. So to, to start the planning process on a lot of these, some of these are probably short-term execution items, things you can do fairly readily. Others are going to take some time. The dollar amounts uh, just ought to be contextual, but you really want to want you to focus on things that you think are important to the community uh, and a priority. Okay? So take uh, five minutes or so. Let Rose and I try and uh, translate these, transfer these to the flip charts, <coughs> and then uh, come back and we'll get the priorities down and we'll see, uh, see where they lie. Start stop, well, start stop, start stop. Start stop. One o'clock, and then he, early, you know, <laughs> <laughs> four, five. So. I did. <laughs>
<laughs> There's one of them in there at one mm -hmm. point or another. <laughs> but I just set up the my husband to get. I'm gonna put all the red ones on employment Rosemary. center yeah. development. Yeah. You know, to, I put that one. You know, yeah, road yeah. to my house. They wouldn't be staying anyway. Right. She, right. Right. Have to, <laughs> to yeah. she contacted me by yeah. email. Yeah. They will. Asked her to complete it's, the it was not a big deal. You should have two now. It was if you don't think I captured <gasps> your item correctly, <gasps> let me know. We can, That's we're, really we're really a problem. It's a little bit of the noise there. Because they're sleeping. My little boy. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> red you know, is your, your highest priority. There you go. Yep. Green. Far right. Green In the tail high. on the. Oh, red is high. Red is high. Green is orange. Red is high. Like red is high. Like red is high. 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 Red Oh, on the things that you think will have a our community priority that will have an impact, positive impact on this community. I watched a few or listened. Mayor, we'll see. I'm not going to use my legislative priorities. All right. I'll put his up there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have him. <laughs> say, I'll take the dots. There's prerogatives. These two are red. Oh, you can all red. I'll not be wearing you. All right? See him red? I love Trump. Red drops. I want to use two of my dots. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely want to use one of those. Well, maybe I'll put one on. It's all in economic development. So what I'll do is put. Yeah. No, they're not for sale. They're not for sale. Okay, how much? Five minutes. Okay. For the just an update to update. Perfect. I don't know why my husband's so surprised that I'm not the first. I did. That would have been scary. Right away. You're supposed to change and adapt. Thirty-one years. Relationships are really hurtful. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Who are you talking to? I'm just scared. I had a call from Battleground the other day. Oh, okay. They were trying to get some insight. And I said, well, you know. Given the, the, um, the recent decision that hopefully that trend will continue. I didn't mean to tell you, though. But I can't. I'm not hopeful with that guy. I know. You guys are sinking. You guys are sinking. So I was afraid somebody would think I get to just carry it over by your chair. It's like, it's all good. Describing this, I'm pretty careful. Yeah, whatever. I know. He was sleeping throughout the whole thing. I was actually what I did with my own. So I asked, can we appeal on the fact that No, no, I was saying I will sell them. Thank goodness it was transcribed. Mostly, actually. Did we have to pay for him to come? Sorry, you'll be in the And because he's going to base his whole decision based on the written transcript. Yes. I think that's crazy. Do you really? Do you spend a few days? <laughs> I'm waiting. Make myself yeah. laugh. We've got them right now in our kitchen too, the house I live in. I was gonna go on that. Transporting the mold. Yeah, you can watch that. But uh, I had to reset my phone. So I don't have Netflix on there anymore. She'll take the time to do that. They added about 15 minutes. They're done for you. So all I did was my phone. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm going to see Patty. Yeah, she's going to do this. Yeah, she's going to do this. I don't see Maria. Well, it's interesting. Okay, so she threw out the decompressed. I don't think I'm getting out of my sweats. Yeah. <laughs> Basketball all day. Really? So finally, oh, yeah. Just, yes, yes. Yeah. Silence. I went. That was, yeah. Well, Senator, we're from. I love Marty Mack. Yeah. 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 Those good games. Yeah. 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 Should be. Yeah. Conference championships, right? Yeah. 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 Chemist Bikes had a friend of Zellmore in Craigslist a couple years ago. I don't know if he still has it or not. Yeah, there's a the woman thing. up in Ridgefield that rents them out for a vet. Yeah. 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 I bet for the client, it's young. I think she's difficult. I don't think it's big enough for the court to drive. It just comes over to the decision. Oh, HSU. Yeah, the little reasons. People movers, yeah. is that what they're called? For them the pods from the, because some that go along the top to OHS. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Actually, it looks like it's got the strongest recognition from council, the downtown retail strategy, pavement preservation, the one that you've been working on a lot uh, as recently as this week. Let's see others, uh, code enforcement, the Schmidt Field, revisit that capital project, that discussion you just had, see if you can't do something that wouldn't be the, the full improvement. Multifamily tax credits. Take a look at that program. City communications, another one with two. And I think 27th Street is another one with, with two. Uh, downtown Park is another one. Well, it's almost unfortunate we don't have an extra half an hour unless everybody has it or council has it afterwards to then take the, the twos and three, the upper ones and condense the list down to just those and do it again. You've got a lot of ones and twos in there. A lot of ones and twos. I think it's good to understand that some people want to talk more about this and you can get that from, from both the compilation as well as the, the ones. I'm hoping it's your, it's your retreat, it's your planning session. The other thing you can do is do that, take a workshop session. Uh, 15 minutes. And yeah, and, uh, and have a discussion. Um, uh, Crown Road, I think that got two as well. So I think this will help you sort of identify, at least across the areas, things that are more important than others, give you a chance to sort of talk about new things as well as context for some of the existing things. So hopefully it was a useful exercise. This kind of priority setting is something that I think is indicative. You, know, you talked about some best practices. 
but in terms of your planning, your budget development, uh, your just your community engagement, it's a good exercise to go through. Think about not only the framework that you have for setting past priorities, check in on the progress that you've made on things that you identified before, and then in this exercise, think to the future, things that you want to keep that pipeline full. You got to keep thinking not just what your grant applications are going for now, but things that you aren't doing that you think will have an impact. I mean, you guys have a long track record of continually to make those kinds of improvements, and this is the kind of exercise that uh, can hopefully help you to sift through those things that are really going to have the best, uh, the most impact for the community. So, Mayor, any thoughts, comments, other than feeding back? No, I think, uh, like I said, it, it will be interesting to see all these listed down on a list of what came out on top and where they are and uh, potentially to redefine it a little bit more. But again, just like the strategic plan is and what we're doing at a staff level and going into budgeting and the, the initiatives we want to pull off for the next year, I think this is going to help us get even closer to that and what's really combining this with uh, public surveys, start really so. making some concrete uh, advances on what the public's looking for as well. Council, any thoughts in terms of what you see up here? Any observations, ahas? Um, can I ask a question? The, uh, the one that has the four red dots, which one is that one? The, this one right here? That's the pavement preservation. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's high priority. Okay, good. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me be a part of this. And if you've got one, the public comment, I guess, is that? You're it, though. <laughs> <laughs> By and you're from Richfield. Don, Don, Don can Don. say something. Yeah. <laughs> the session went very quickly. She's staff today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Roll reversal. Let's, um, I know Jennifer has some uh, oh, questions or comments that you've got on. I just have a couple of things. Um, Basically, about you know potential policy or code changes we, I, I've been thinking about over the years, or the past couple of years. Um, parking space allocation for downtown. Um, how's that working out for us? And do we want to think about potentially changing that for new businesses that come in? We've talked about it and kind of batted it around. And I mean, right now our our parking space allocation is pretty low for new businesses that come in, and I'm just not sure that that's working out real well for us now that we actually have businesses <laughs> that, are that, need parking. that need parking. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so you're talking about uh, the parking, the amount parking of parking space we require when they build? For, and I don't know if that's a, a designation or a rezone. I mean, I don't think it's to require a rezone. more parking? It's a code requirement. A code requirement, right. yeah, that's correct, that we need to look at, maybe take another look. Since since we've actually got activity and businesses coming in, how is that all working for us, or do we really need to change that? Um, also, design standards for downtown. Um, I would really like the city to think about narrowing down some design standards uh, for facades, because don't put this in the paper, Don. I'm not crazy about 1887 Maine, the way it looks and how it presents itself. I think it's too industrial for our town, personally. I just i have heard a lot of people say that as well, and these are citizens coming to me saying, why would you let somebody build a concrete and steel type building in our downtown? Where's the brick? Where's the, the you know, the color. I mean, it's just a gray building with, you know, a lot of industrial look to it. Anyway, so I really think we should take a look at our design standards, and I really like the, the big building that was put down there. That the the which? Wolf. The, the original building that he put in, I think, has a lot more character and, and you know, should be potentially carried through to any new construction that happens. Mitch is making notes feverishly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So both fall in him. Awesome. And the other thing we already touched on, which was the visitor center, which is not really a policy thing. But then I'm done. That's it for now. Mm -hmm. Joyce. 
You had your hand up a moment ago. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to thank Paul. That was yes, I thank you, I wanted you, to Paul. thank you very That's much. You. I come in here. Thank you so you. much. <laughs> Uh, I'll say this is I, of the this is my third annual retreat. I think it's the best one we've had. I do too. I do Good. too. And this room works well. I, agree. I think this works just fine. Yes. This Plus is great. we're able to capture it all for everybody that wants to see it later. Maybe that's why we have no public here. Yeah. <laughs> see reruns or something. <laughs> Any other items from council members? Staff, anything that we haven't touched on? Things that are burning? It's not. It's just I need to um, just put up that long-range financial thing one more time for a quick clarification. So we've got to figure out how to do that, though. Right, right there. So um, there's a new number for 2016. And I will own this. I had not given Jennifer some feedback that she was waiting from for me, and I forgot to give it to her. Um, it has to do with uh, Fund 125, and um, uh, we budgeted to use 266 or whatever number, $267,000 of Fund 125 that set aside uh, and to transfer it to the general fund in 2014. But uh, we didn't have to do that. So we didn't do it. Uh, we didn't need it. We didn't need it, and we still were ahead. Um, so what that means is that one time, it's just one time money in 2016, we can use that and transfer it to the general fund in 2016 to partially offset fire and emergency medical services costs. And I hadn't. Uh, given her the direction that our proposal to the council would be, yeah, let's not transfer it in 2015 so that the extra money is 415 or $430,000. Hold it, hold it, and use it to balance, to help us balance 2016 because it's, it can be used operationally. It can only be used operationally for fire. I mean, you could buy a fire truck with it, but you can only, you know, use it for fire stuff. It can't be used for anything else. So. It, um, it can be used to pay our obligation to um, funds going over to Camas. Absolutely, yeah, that is our fire operation yeah. expense. So, um, typically, that's what we've been doing year over year. I had just I hadn't closed that little last part of the loop with Jen, and so she had left that out. So when you put that in, it doesn't change the future, right? It doesn't change the future. It just shows you that for 2016. The problem that we have to tackle operationally is about two hundred and fourteen thousand dollars, not four hundred and eighty-one. So, it's better news. Um, well, Dave, now you just need to work on seventeen, and that's the end of my term. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so that's the clarification. Thank you. Well, for my seat, this. Uh, Brent, I agree. This is probably more feedback and, and better qualified feedback than we've had in the last couple of years. So it, uh, I appreciate everybody taking the time out of a out of a Saturday again to be here. And it does look like we may still get out of here early, so that's an that's an awesome thing. I just want to make sure that nobody's got any other items that are on their list that they haven't had a chance to throw on the table. Not that this is the last opportunity. Okay. With that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.